Karim, do you have your keyboard near your microphone? I do. That's me doing it. Trying to piece together all sorts of things for the. I understand. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> David, what's that? Well, this is a new little uh, astronomical device I'm going to display today. I did its first light last night. It is a Jacob staff. Oh. <laughs> and I'm going to talk about it a little bit today. Fantastic. Jacob staff, huh? Yeah, I saw the picture. But I don't usually. Uh, do that at these star parties. I'm just going to test something here. Let's see. I think it's been hot everywhere today. Europe and especially England have just had it ridiculous. We were talking about it yesterday on Space Oddities. A few of them were just barely holding together for the hour and then they had to go mm -hmm. find somewhere cool. Yeah. It's hot everywhere except here in Arizona. It's pretty cool today. It's 90, it? 96 or so, so far. And uh, it's not that, not as hot as it usually is. Wow. Is it dry? Uh, there's some humidity, but certainly not as much as you guys have. And this is what we call, as Wendy says, monsoon season. So it's not dry, but it's still, right now, the humidity isn't as nearly as much as it is in Montreal. You'd be hard pressed to get it to this level. <laughs> we, had a, we had a bit of a downpour yesterday and a bit the night before. And uh, right now it's just sticky outside. Mm -hmm. Which, of course, means the mosquitoes are having fun with us. Well, that's the other thing. We do not have very many mosquitoes here. If you want some, you're happy to take some back with you. Well, yeah, maybe we might. I might talk to them this week. Black flies, mosquitoes, take them all. Take them all. Black fly season should be coming to an end. Yes. Hopefully by uh, next week when you have the retreat. Yeah, that's. I hope so. This is extraordinarily exciting. A hundred global star parties we've had. Hey, Norma. Hi. How are you? Good, you? No, oh, I'm well, Thank you. Good to see you. So am I right to assume you'll be at Stellafane in two weeks? Uh, no, I won't be. 
Not I'm this year? Overload with work and um, oh. I'm already planning to go with uh, the group with Scott Roberts at uh, in Armenia for the Starmas. Yes. I'm planning to go. So uh, my time is limited. <laughs> oh, I understand. I understand. Yeah. And I have to choose uh, where to go this year. And uh, I would love to go to Stalafane. It's my favorite place to go every year. But this year I will have to skip it. So, I was talking to Ray in Toronto at Con, and he was saying that Constantine must be, you know, he's he's having a tough time. But whenever he huh? thinks about the fact that he'll miss Stalafane, it must be just that much worse for him at this yeah, point. Yeah, must because he's been going for the last 50 years, I think, or more. Close to more, more, sixty-five. Years. Yeah. Oh wow! Oh wow! Yeah. Amazing. Yeah, Constantine is quite a number. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes. He, he's he's stable though, which is which is what's important. His oh, you yeah. know, okay. His health is what's important right now. Yes. Well, and especially in these times, oh, we've been have, we haven't. Well, uh, gentlemen, I logged on briefly to wish you all good hey, luck. That's Adrian. The very first. Uh, yep. This is uh, the Mega Global Star Party 100. Just 100, about to get started. Yes, yes it is. Yep. <laughs> and my my good friends, all of you, Kareem, I heard you talking about Stellafane. One day, maybe well, I'll get out there. You have to but go. Just, you have to go to Stellafane. Yeah. The, uh, I don't know. Well, I, that's that's what I decided did. me. That's what decided me to really pursue my my career career and as a telescope maker, is going there yeah, and be inspired by all the other people around and uh, just to the vibe there. It's unreal. It's uh, it's yeah. cellophane. Well, you <laughs> cellophane. Well, you'll yep. be happy to know I just did some solar outreach and astronomy outreach for a Girl Scout troop at um, awesome. one of our metro parks here in Michigan. Um, five different groups, girls age probably five to maybe 14, 13, 14. That's great. And then their scout leaders all got a chance to see the sun through a solar scope awesome. and have questions answered about astronomy, whether solar or otherwise. I shared with them some pictures on my phone yeah. of some of the images I'd taken, Milky Way, moon, wow. night shots. So it was a hot day, but it was a wonderful day for outreach. It's, great. it's a great experience. Yeah. Fantastic. It was. I was uh, the kids I loved it. The I was at the uh, Montreal uh, Planetarium uh, at the Astronomy Day. Yep. And they had asked me to, to over there to do a talk and, and bring a telescope over there. There were about 3,000 people all day long. Uh, starting mid-afternoon because the moon was already up mid-afternoon so we could observe the moon in, in daytime people were amazing how come we can see the moon in daytime well it it's, it happens <laughs> it's there in daytime half the yeah. month so uh, I, and then later at night to observe uh, in, in telescope so there was at least three thousand people that came and, through the telescope it was just mesmerizing you had like 150 in line at your scope constantly yeah. all day yes <laughs> Long file because <laughs> the telescope I had brought was uh, quite very special. And I built that telescope for a friend of mine about, I don't know, 15, 20, almost 20 years ago. It's one of my most beautiful one made of rosewood. And uh, it's very, and I borrowed it for him, from him uh, for that day. And it's, it's, a, it's, I mean, I mean, it's a crowd pleaser just to look at the telescope itself. And uh, to look through it, it's nice. It's a double take. I mean, <laughs> so yeah, that was fun. It was a great day. It's always great to to uh, to share uh, with people that never looked through a telescope or just to see their yes. face, the reaction they have when they they see the moon so close by and then detailed craters. And wow, I didn't know we could see that through a telescope like this. It's like it's like a, they think that only satellites or NASA can do that. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Burnett's. Yep. We had a few girls who hadn't looked through the telescope before, so we had to teach them how. Yeah. And um, all of them saw something, whether they saw a bright red orb or mm -hmm. they were able to see some of the prominences that were on okay. the sun while mm -hmm. we were looking. We mm -hmm. had the uh, telescope out, the um, HA telescope. Uh, Coronado. So it was it was great. And my tracking worked, so I didn't have to move it much to um, <laughs> get it in line for the next group yeah so it was a wonderful time it is always all right well good luck thanks, gentlemen thanks very much I, adrian 
Yeah. Yep. I will go on mute and let you all kick this thing off. Okay. Sounds Thank good. You. We will see you later tonight. All right. Yes, we will. Well, we will go ahead and. Um... Hey, Michael, you showed well, up. Hello. Showed up anyways. <laughs> I did. <laughs> <laughs> I have a few minutes a here. That's good. That's yeah, good. Michael. Yeah. Hello. Good to see all you guys. Thank you. So you said I, I thought that you wouldn't be able to come on at all because of uh, your you have a family thing, but uh, yeah, it was. Uh, we have we have like twenty five speakers or something like that uh, today. So <laughs> it's an awesome lineup. It yeah. really is. Oh, I yeah. wish I could stay for the whole thing. Yeah. Well, that's good. So um, I will, I think I will go ahead and, and kick this off. And, okay. uh, but um, so here we go. This year, the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter celebrates 13 years of orbit around our moon. And in that time, it has collected over a petabyte of data, the largest volume ever collected by a planetary science mission at NASA. Due to its success and continued operational abilities, NASA has awarded the spacecraft an additional extended mission phase so that it can continue gathering critical information on the moon and help pave the way for future lunar missions. Going forward, the LRO mission will have four main areas of focus. The first is the study of volatiles, which are chemicals that easily evaporate or vaporize, such as water. In terms of lunar exploration, volatiles will be useful for things like creating rocket fuel and making oxygen to breathe, so they are a primary resource that future astronauts will depend on having. LRO will continue to provide new data for identifying which areas are rich in volatiles and for cluing us in to how they may move around the lunar surface. Current LRO data suggests they may be frozen in permanently shadowed craters, in areas that receive some sunlight, and may be chemically locked in minerals on the moon. This is helping pave the way for future missions like Viper, which will send a robotic rover to explore an area near the lunar south pole, and ultimately, the astronaut-led Artemis missions. The second area of focus is on the moon's interior, volcanic features, and the tectonics of the moon's surface, because understanding the lunar surface requires knowledge of what's been going on underneath. Scientists want to figure out when the moon was last volcanically active, and how current geologic processes, like moonquakes, could affect the safety of future exploration. They'll do these things by studying lobate scarps, as well as deep crustal and mantle composition that are exposed at the surface. Studying the moon's history of volcanism and tectonics will also inform us about other planetary bodies in our solar system and beyond. The third area of focus is on the moon's surface, its regolith and impact craters. We want to know how impact craters break down and if different ejected materials might degrade at different rates. These studies will give us a better understanding of the mineral and chemical makeup of the lunar surface and subsurface. This information can tell us how the moon has changed over hundreds of millions or billions of years. Studying the moon's regolith and impact craters also informs scientists about space weathering, which can help similar studies looking at the Earth, as well as on places like Mars, Mercury, or even asteroids. The last focus area for LRO going forward is support for future missions. NASA has plans for numerous missions to go to the lunar surface during LRO's extended phase. Sending missions to the lunar surface requires planning, not only to build the mission, but to find safe and interesting landing sites. LRO is in a unique position to directly assist with some of those operations and science objectives. LRO can help identify landing sites by making maps that tell us what the surface is like, where there may be hazards to landers, and where there are interesting features to explore. LRO is also capable of helping landed missions get simultaneous measurements from orbit while they gather data from the surface. 
After studying the moon for 13 years, LRO has proven to be one of NASA's most valuable tools for advancing lunar science. And as it continues collecting data, the spacecraft helps lead the way for future exploration of our moon. This visualization doesn't have audio, but it's um, it's the Bennu uh, mission, and uh, it's just incredible um, the uh, visualization of the you know the spacecraft coming down, uh, you know, gathering a sample and coming back up. I just really needed to share that with you guys. Yeah, it's nice. I think it's beautiful. What really strikes me with this one is that the surface was so different than what we expected. And you can yeah. see the burner marks. You can see everything when it rises up. But if it had not given that little bit of pushback, we could have actually had Osiris Rex fall straight into Bennu's surface. Oh. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. We're getting already a nice uh, global audience at this okay. point. Okay. Hi, Thanks everyone. Hello. Chatting in. <laughs> yeah. I need to find my mouse. I've got my mouse. Well, hello everybody, this is Scott Roberts and welcome to the 100th Global Star Party. This event will happen in two parts. Uh, uh, first part, of course, starting now. The second part will start at 7 p.m. Central Time, uh, where we will, uh, you know, for all of you that can't watch this earlier part of this program, uh, you'll be at least able to capture the, uh, the second part live. Uh, we had a tremendous uh, turnout for speakers, and I just wanted to kind of um, talk about each one of them just a little bit before we get started. Uh, uh, David Levy is here uh, here doing this double star party with me. Uh, he is uh, he's uh, agreed to do the commentary and poetry that he, that he always does to kick off these programs. I'm very very indebted to him for his friendship and. Uh, his uh, mentorship and uh, all the inspiration he's given me all, all through these years. Uh, after David, we will have uh, Dr. Seth Shostak. Uh, Seth is the, um, the lead astronomer for the uh, Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence SETI program. Um, and uh, I've really enjoyed uh, following him uh, over the decades, listening to him give lectures 
enjoying his humor. Um, uh, he is just uh, such an approachable, uh, incredible guy, and we're really, really happy to have him on the 100th Global Star Party. Following Seth will be uh, uh, Bob Fugate. Um, uh, you'll, you'll find him on the internet as Robert Q. Fugate. Uh, he is uh, someone that uh, has given uh, astronomy, and I mean, he put astronomy on steroids with uh, his work on adaptive optics. And, um, uh, you know, but he puts uh, us amateur astronomers on steroids too with his incredible uh, personal work he does in astrophotography. So he'll be talking about you know, seeing beyond with ELTs and adaptive optics today. The Astronomical League joins us in this first section as well with Terry Mann. She'll be doing the door prizes. We're going to have some special door prizes instead of the regular door prizes that we that we have. Uh, we will be uh, uh, upgrading them to uh, some of them to the uh, IXOS 100 uh, mount, a, a computerized go to equatorial mount that you can put your camera on or a small telescope. It'll be perfect for the upcoming eclipses happening in 2023 and 2024. Um, Terry Mann will also uh, have her own program uh, with us as well. So uh, you'll want to uh, stick around for that. Uh, Kareem Jaffer and Lou Mayo are also joining us. Uh, Kareem is from, he's a professor of astronomy at John Abbott College and Lou Mayo is at Goddard Space Flight Center. So it's wonderful to have them both on tonight um, and they'll be talking about their own uh, perspectives on seeing beyond. Uh, Charles Ennis, uh, the president of the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada will also be uh, turning in, uh, uh, you know, and letting us all uh, know about, uh, about the RASC, which, which we all love. Uh, Marcelo Souza joins us from Brazil. Uh, Nicholas Arias, uh, uh, you know, the amazing astrophotographer who literally pushes his Dobsonian by hand, okay, and makes deep sky images that will blow your mind. So uh, Norman Fulham uh, finishes up, wraps up the first segment with us on reflections on music, stars, and the telescopes that he builds. So, but uh, I'm going to turn this over to my dear friend, uh, uh, David Levy. David, thank you so much for uh, helping us put together uh, the 100th Global Star Party. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Scotty. This is, uh, this is a, um, let me try to unmute here. I'm, uh, we can hear you just fine. Yes, we can hear you, David. No, no, I'm really unmuted. Okay. <laughs> um, I remember over a hundred star parties ago, getting a phone call late one evening from Scott. And he said that he was planning to do what is called a global star party. And would I be interested in coming to the very beginning of each one and doing a little bit of a poetical reading? And I've done that for every one of them except for one that I forgot about. But I think I'm going to make up for it today. You're making up two. for it today. That's one, right. One will be now, and I will do a second one at the second part of the star party later on today. I wanted to show you something new. I have, as you know, my telescope, Minerva, right next to me. Minerva is one of my favorite telescopes, and I use it a lot. I really love it. But yesterday I built one of these. And uh, this is not a telescope. And I'd be very surprised if it was a telescope because it was invented in the 14th century by the famous rabbi Levi Ben Gerson, Gersonides. And uh, it consists it is simplicity itself. This is a Jacob staff invented in the 14th century. Uh, there's a meter long piece of wood here and then a crossbow on the top and you hold it this way and uh, you, have, you have, you sort of point at the horizon and then you move this 
until you get to the object you're looking for. And it will measure the uh, it'll measure the um, distance in, ele in elevation above the horizon. And uh, I had its first light last night, as all my telescopes do, on Jupiter. And it was at about uh, at the um, at the six meter, six point six meter part of the uh, thing, and I had it like this. And this long-ended part went to the horizon, and Jupiter is sitting right on top of this this cross part. Anyway, I just wanted to share this with you a little bit. And uh, what, what the final thing is that this the long piece is a solid piece of wood. I was wondering if Personides would have thought to hollow out the solid piece, a hollow piece of wood, and uh, put a lens at one end, if he would have invented the telescope in the 14th century. But that was not to be. He left that for Hans Liberschi and uh, Galileo, who first looked at a telescope, and boy, did Galileo rewrite astronomy. And Galileo's global star party would have been something else to see. Mm. And maybe Scotty will be able to get Galileo and Gersonides at one of our future star parties. Anyway, for my quotation for today, uh, Wendy and I are going to do one together. It's by Ralph Hudson, and it's called The Song of Honor. And it, um, it, begin, it, it is a very long poem but we are only going to quote the final stanza of it. Are you ready, Wendy? I'm ready. <laughs> Here we go. I stood, stood and stared. The, the sky was lit. lit. The sky was stars all over it. I stood. I knew, I knew not why. why. Without a wish, without a will, I stood upon that silent hill and stared into the sky until my eyes were blind with stars, and still I stared, I stared into, into the, the sky. sky. Thank you, and back to you, Scott. Wow, thank you so much. <laughs> David, that thank was you, David. Beautiful. Beautiful. I'm gonna show, uh, just, I'm gonna show the audience, everybody that's logged in right now. Uh, we have, uh, um, of course, David Levy, uh, Bob Fugate with us, Kareem Jaffer, uh, Norman Fulham, Adrian Bradley, they're driving. I, I don't know how he does this. Okay. <laughs> Michael, uh, space artist and author, Michael Carroll, Seth Shostak's with us, and Lou Mayo, I see him back there. So, uh, and I see Bob's monitor, whoever that is. That maybe that's a lizard or some, I don't know, but uh, that, that's the deal. But um, uh, we, uh, uh, you know, we, we, we love being together. Um, and, uh, it's, it's something that, uh, um, gosh, when I look back on all these star parties and all the information that's come out of it and all the friendship and everything. It's just really been amazing to me. Um, I, uh, one of the people that I, uh, very much admire, uh, for his ability to, uh, you know, talk about, I think, a really tough subject, which is, uh, you know, uh, the search for extraterrestrials, the search for life throughout the universe. Uh, I've, I've attempted it myself. Uh, I, I went on television back in 1988, I think, on a local television show called uh, Stanley Tonight. And uh, Stanley was kind of a, uh, I think sort of a uh, nearing the, the twilight of his career. He was a he was a great talk show host in New York City, but he ends up at a little local television station in San Diego, and he would put together some, I think, pretty controversial shows. This one that he put together was uh, I was supposed to be on a panel of, U of UFO skeptics. Okay, um, and. Uh, uh, the uh, the opposite side was um, uh, uh, a, another group, a group called the Unarian Society, and the Unarians uh, 
were led by this lady who was dressed up like a princess. She drove up with a Cadillac that had a UFO with lights on top of it and all the rest of it. And I get to find, I find out <laughs> that <laughs> I am in a room of mostly what claim to be abductees, okay? <laughs> Alien abductees. There's like 30 of them in the room with me. And, uh, and I think Stanley wants to see a fight or something, you know? And so, um, but, uh, you know, I, I had to tell these people that, uh, you know, they claim to be scientists. And I said, well, you know, what you're practicing, after they sang some song, they sang some songs to um, uh, Space Brother and they had, uh, they had a book and they had all these kind of ritualistic kind of things. Uh, you know, it's not that I don't believe that there's life teeming in the universe. I do believe this, okay? I think there's life throughout the universe, like, you know, like cockroaches. I think they're everywhere, okay? Uh, but I had not yet seen irrefutable proof, okay, of, of alien life uh, or alien spacecraft or those kinds of things. And so, uh, you know, I was there as a, an amateur astronomer, am you know, an amateur UFO, uh, uh, a debunker, <laughs> and it was just a very, very strange day for me. And so I do really uh, respect what Seth probably goes through day and day out, uh, day in day out, uh, with his um, his work with SETI. Uh, but but, that's um, a fascinating story, Scott. <laughs> I wish you all could have been there with me. <laughs> it would have been a lot of fun. We, we want details eventually. <laughs> I did, I did get out with that, with my hide intact. So, uh, but you know, I always, I respect people and, and what they believe and in all the rest of it, I do. Um, so I have friends that are very kind of uh, rough and tough when they get in kind of a situation like that. But, you know, I have to, you know, keep my mind open that, uh, you know, if life happened here, it's probably happened all over the universe. And um, so, Anyways, but uh, Seth Shostak is the person that uh, I, I am uh, bringing up next. And Seth has been very, very kind to be at several events that I've been able to put together. Um, and I know that Seth, Seth recognizes that I'm an amateur astronomer. I'm not even a very polished uh, presenter. Uh, but, you know, I, I describe myself as kind of a cheerleader for uh, for astronomers and astronomy and space exploration. And uh, I think it's important that we get the word out. And when I when I ran into Seth and he told me, yeah, I mean, this goes back decades now. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll come and do a lecture. I was absolutely blown away. Uh, I felt like I'd walked up to Carl Sagan and asked him to do a lecture for me. I still feel that way. And uh so uh, Seth is here with us today. I think he's in his office at SETI. And uh, um, Seth, thank you for coming on to the 100th Global Star Party. Thanks very much, Scott. Now, how's the audio? Can anybody understand this? No, <laughs> nobody. <laughs> All right. <laughs> we've we've yeah. moved into new digs, and I still haven't set up uh, my office yet, as you can see. But uh, uh, Scott, it was very kind of Scott to give me three and a half hours here. Uh, I, I am going to. He doesn't have a topic down for what I'm going to talk about. Uh, I was going to talk about the Unarians' unfortunate experience with a car wash that they tried to get their car with the, you know, the Saturn on top through and it didn't work. So uh, they're kind of out of business. I, I, I wanted to say one thing to uh, David Levy. I, I'm not a Gersonides, but that is my first name, Gerson, believe it or not, relatives. Anyhow, all right, enough of all that. What I'm going to talk about today is something, well, Scott asked me to talk about the effect of inverse Compton scattering on the forbidden transitions of yttrium in the atmospheres of peculiar A-type stars. And he figured all of you would be interested in that, but I'm not, so I'm not gonna talk about that. I'm gonna talk about something a little more straightforward, namely, why haven't we found the aliens? All right, so let me see if I can share this screen. Maybe I can, maybe I can't. And... All right, anybody see it? It's that? working, yep. Oh, well, well, that's too bad for and you. And you're in presentation mode, it looks very nice. 
Well, I, I'm, but I'm not very presentable. Okay, why haven't we found the aliens? I mean, I don't have to remind many of you the fact that we've been looking for a long time. From um, you know that Frank Drake did his first experiment in SETI in the spring of 1960. Now, to me, 1960 seems like only yesterday. I I was already past middle age in 1960, but for a lot of people, that's a long time ago, and they may not. Uh, uh, you know, well, they may remember it or not, but in any case, that means it's been 60 years, 62 years since that first experiment, and we still haven't turned up a single little green guy. And what's the reason for that? Well, I'm just going to talk to you a little bit about that. To begin with, there are a lot of people, namely one third of all Americans, who think we already have found the aliens. Now, to begin with, there's the wow signal, and this is just some printout from the, uh, the, the telescope at Ohio State University known as the big ear. <laughs> and this thing, it sort of out, out, outlived its, uh, its usefulness to astronomy. So they just sort of parked it at a given declination and they let the, uh, the sky rotate above it. And you know they would just make observations looking for a signal, hoping to find ET that way. Every couple of days, a resident astronomer, Jerry Aidman, would come into the shack where the line printer was and look through it and see if there was anything interesting. And on this particular date in 1977, he saw a signal that was so strong, he wrote wow next to it. Now, this is the triumph of marketing over, uh, well, I, I guess you could call it, say science. There were hundreds of uh, signals that were found in these, these times, but this one had wow written next to it. And so there you go. I mean, you know, if they called it Bob or something like that, I mean, maybe nobody would have noticed but calling it now, uh, wow, is really good. Now, you see on the uh, right-hand side of the screen here, sort of a blow-up of that signal, CF, sorry, 6FQUJ5. That's just the encoding of the level, the strength of the signal, right? Otherwise, they, they would be limited from zero to nine, but then they could go to 10, they call A, and 11 was B, and, you know, and so forth. So they could get more levels encoded in here. Now, I can't tell you, I think it's on the order of 50 or 100 emails I've received over the years by people who spend their weekends and evenings trying to decode 6FQUJ5. And uh, they all succeed at some level, so they say. And, uh, you know, there, there are interesting things in there, such as uh, the cure for death or the next lotto numbers or stuff like that. The, the facts are it's just a method of encoding the strength of the signal. But when I write them back, they never say, oh, thanks for explaining that. They just get mad at me. Anyhow, there's the wow signal. Some people think it was ET. We don't know what it was. It was never seen again, never. And many people have looked. Okay, so so much for that. Uh, this is another <laughs> bit of evidence, if you consider it that, that uh, we found the aliens. Namely, they're here in our airspace, teasing our top guns. Uh, this is, uh, of course, uh, Dunsight video camera uh, footage, infrared camera, actually, from an F-18 Hornet. Uh, that was being flown by the U.S. Navy off the coast of San Diego. And you see that blob in the middle. Now, that could be Klingons come to visit. Not quite clear why they come to Earth. Maybe it's the fast food. Nobody knows. But you can see that darkness, and that means that's something hot. And it's been pointed out by many people, and in particular, Mick West has, uh, has pointed this out several times, that that could just be an airplane, you know, 50 or 100 miles in front of the Hornet, Right. This, this hornet was at, I think, like 22,000 feet. So the horizon is like 100 miles away, even more. So you could see uh, maybe a twin engine jet, you know, just sort of going away from you at that distance. And of course, you're looking up the tailpipe of the jets. So it makes a nice black infrared blob. All right, it could be that, or it could be the alien. So you take your choice. But the facts are that from the science, uh, the point of view of the scientists, we haven't found the aliens. How do you explain that? Uh, you guys probably don't ever have to answer that question. But, you know, if I'm sitting next to somebody on a 12 hour flight to Europe and they find out what I do, I try and keep that secret. But sometimes, you know, the captain comes on with a public announcement. If they find out what I do, they say, well, wait a minute. Why haven't you found the aliens yet? What the heck? You know, it's costing me all these tax dollars. Well, to begin with, it's not costing them any tax dollars because it's all privately funded. But beyond that, that means I don't get to sleep or read a cheap novel on the flight. We haven't found them, but here are some suggestions about why we have this awkward silence. At this point, you probably would welcome silence. All right, how do we explain that? Well, one possibility is that we just haven't looked at enough of the sky. 
right? I mean, if I go out tonight looking for comets, something that uh, David Levy would know all about, you know, and I don't find any, I, I might come to the conclusion there are no comets, but on the other hand, I just haven't looked at the right time at the right spot on the sky. Personally, uh, I think that this is the answer, but not everybody would. In the background, this is a photo I made of our own Allen Telescope Array. There are 42 of these antennas uh, located about 300 miles north of San Francisco. So if you happen to be in that area of the Cascades and you want to go visit, I would, I would commend this to you. You can go there and, you know, kick the pillars and make selfies and, you know, uh, utter, uh, well, anyhow, just go take a look. But that's one possibility. It's simple. We haven't found them because we haven't looked enough. All right. The total number of star systems that we've actually looked at, all of SETI, all of SETI since 1960 is only about 5,000. That isn't a huge number, right? Uh, I, I note that Breakthrough Let Listen, which has actual money, uh, they've looked at about 3,000. They're going to look at more. And in the next 10 or 15 years, the total will get close to a million. But at the moment, it's only been 5,000. So it doesn't surprise me we haven't found the aliens. Uh, you know, I already just said that. So there you go. It could be that we're just looking in all the wrong places, like a leisure suit, Larry. We're looking for love in all the wrong places. <clears throat> and that may be. We tend to look at star systems in the old days. We would look at star systems that for one reason or another, we thought had a planet sort of like the Earth. Maybe the same mass, right, at the, in the habitable zone, the Goldilocks zone, right? And, you know, where you could expect liquid water on the surface. Now, we don't really bother with that anymore, right? When planets were first discovered around other stars in 1995, you know, the SETI scientists got really excited. Oh, finally, we can point our antennas at a star system that we know has planets. But since then, uh, you know, the, 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 I don't know, the bloom is off the rose in a way, because it turns out that essentially all stars have planets, right? It's like 80% at least. And in astronomy, 80% is the same as all. <clears throat> you should not have an astronomer <clears throat> fill in your tax forms, because if they get it right within a factor of two, that's good enough. But the, the, the bottom line here is that, okay, all stars have planets. And more than that, we now know that maybe half of all stars that are you know, G-type stars, similar to the sun, have an Earth-sized planet in their habitable zone. This is a bit of an, an extrapolation from Kepler data, but you know, maybe it's wrong by 30% or 50%, but I mean, you can't argue with the result. Essentially, half of all stars might have a planet like the Earth, a cousin of the Earth. There are lots and lots of cousins of the Earth on the order of 100 billion or more. Now, that's a lot. Of course, they could all be sterile. That could be, but that would make you very, uh, very special. And I know you like to think you're special because your parents told you that for the first 20 years of your life. But, you know, anybody who studied science knows that if you think you're special, you're not going to get your paper past the referees. So, uh, you know, with all, that, with, all, with all that real estate, it would be astounding if we're the only kids on this block. All right. Now, everything I've said up to this point makes an assumption about ET. If you ask astronomers, well, what does ET look like? You know, they probably don't even have an answer for you, All right? Now I get asked that question fairly frequently because of consulting for movies, right? And they always wanna know what ET looks like as if I know, I don't know, but there is this. I mean, they always assume in the movie that ET is some sort of creature, member of a, a species that, you know, cranks out lots of little gray guys with you know, no, no eyes, whites in their eyes, and no hair and no clothes and no sense of humor. I mean, you know, that's your standard alien. And it's great for Hollywood because if, if you have an alien like that, you don't need any backstory to explain to the audience, this is an alien. Everybody recognize it. But we assume that even in SETI because we're looking in places where we think there might be an Earth-like planet. But what if the, the ETs are not actually biological, that they've gone beyond that? Here's what the... Uh, the, the plot I like to show in all such talks, this was made a long time ago, actually, uh, before 2000 by uh, a fellow at Carnegie Mellon Institute in, uh, in Pittsburgh. And he just, he was a roboticist, and he just plotted up the fastest computers as a function of time. So all those red dots are the fastest computers uh, with the dates on the bottom there. And the three of you who are still conscious will note that this is a semi-log plot. So in fact, this is that this particular uh, set of data, it's the, the number of, or sorry, the speed of computers is going up exponentially. 
it's a heavily overused and incorrectly used word in the media these days, but it is really exponential. It's, you know, you double the speed of the fastest computer approximately every two years, okay? Now, if you look at about 2022, where we are now, it depends a little bit on how you extrapolate that line, but either, you know, for a thousand dollars, you can buy a computer that has the IQ of a monkey or has the IQ of the guy sitting next to you. That's an astounding thing, right? And if there's a little doubt that by 2050, we'll have computers with maybe uh, as much compute power as all human brains put together. Now that doesn't mean we have generalized artificial intelligence, but it does suggest that it's coming down the pike. So if we're going to invent our successors, well, I think it's only reasonable to assume that the aliens have already done this. So looking for biological aliens is, you know, it, that's so old school, right? Because once you have artificial intelligence, then you don't have to stay on a planet with a lot of water that'll only rust, uh, rust out your innards, right? You can be anywhere. You can even be in, in interstellar space. Sure, starlight is pretty weak, but if you have enough space to put up tremendous you know, solar panels or whatever you're using, you can get the energy you need to survive. There's no reason why you'd wanna stick on a planet which has plate tectonics and weather and other things that are detrimental to your uh, synthetic lifestyle. There are sources of energy everywhere. I just point that out. I mean, they could be hanging around black holes. They could be hanging around the black hole in the center of the galaxies. You can get a lot of energy out of those things. And, uh, you know, you're kind of centrally located, which is always a good idea, so you don't have to commute. Now, the, uh, the third possibility is that we haven't found the aliens because we don't have enough sensitivity. This guy is a very sensitive guy. Now, let me just tell you what the sensitivity is. If you just consider your average SETI experiment, they need to have a lot of power on the order of 100 trillion watts, uh, assuming they're 200 light years away. I, I only pick 200 light years because on the order of a million star systems within that distance. But that takes a lot of power if they're just you know, trying to light up the whole galaxy or their part of the galaxy at a level that we could have picked up. In other words, unless they're deliberately beaming to us, they've got to spend a lot of money on their uh, electric bills in order to be able to make a signal that we find. And maybe that's why we haven't found them because they say, hey, look, you know, those humans, they've only had radio for, for uh, you know, a hundred years. We're gonna only talk to the people that have had it for a hundred million years or something like that. So there could be just as uh, a sensitivity problem. I, I, I'm gonna skip through this because you don't care about that. These are big telescopes. Or you have this possibility that there really are no aliens. And uh, you know, that's anathema for anybody working here at the SETI Institute. But you, know, you might consider it a good idea because it makes you the smartest things in the universe, or it could be that there's some sort of great filter that applies to all intelligent species. They get to some point in their development where they get wiped out, right? And I talk to millennials occasionally and, and they're very big on this idea because they think we're gonna wipe ourselves out. You know, whether it's going to be climate change or pandemics or nuclear war, uh, any of these things, uh, eventually when anybody gets to our level of technological development, we disappear. Now, I've done some back of the envelope calculations, and I hate to disappoint the young folk, but the facts are that this is, isn't going to happen, right? You can't get rid of everybody. The worst thing you can do in terms of getting rid of a lot of people is to let loose all the nuclear weapons, right? Just aim them all at big cities the biggest city, they're like 14,000 nuclear weapons, I believe. And it just aimed them at the 14,000 biggest cities and worked out how many people die. It's a lot, it would be a bad day, right? Mm. But it doesn't get rid of everybody. It only gets rid of about one third of the population. So there's just no way. I, I, I don't think that this can work. All right, it could be that the reason we haven't heard from ET is that intelligence is not something that's particularly favored by nature. These guys here, now this was a bad day for them, but these guys were around for 150 million years. That's a long time. Homo sapiens has been around for 300,000 years. So these guys were here for far longer than we are and they never got smart. Go to your local library and look up the uh, dino literature and you won't find much. So it could be that intelligence, you know, as attractive as you may find it in a mate or, or somebody sitting across from you at Denny's is not in fact favored by nature and we just happened to luck out. 
So the bottom line of all those arguments is indeed that you are the smartest things in the galaxy, that you're some sort of miracle. There you go. The smartest thing in the universe is just your average Joe. Okay. Uh, the final thing is that indeed, as I've said before, maybe we're just looking for the wrong kind of alien. This is again, a similar plot as what you uh, saw before, although this one's by you know, Ray Kurzweil. But in any case, it's the same thing. The fastest computers are now incredibly fast and they're, they're, their computer's big enough that they have um, more compute power, you know, operations per second than your brain does. So I, I think that, that that kind of argument leads to this inevitably. The conclusion is that ET is not a little gray guy with big eyeballs. ET is some sort of machine. Sure, they're, you know, little guys with big eyeballs, but they eventually lead to the machines. And the machines have most of the intelligence in the universe. And we may be just looking for the wrong kind of thing. So what do we do? Well, I don't know. We could just keep on trucking. Another suggestion is to look for artifacts, something big that a really smart machine might build. Maybe it has tremendous energy requirements and it builds something like a Dyson Swarm, Dyson Sphere, if you will. Uh, and and we, we might find that by just doing astronomy. So uh, it, it's a little unclear, but the bottom line is the fact that we haven't found them may be simply due to the fact that we've been looking for the wrong things. Okay, I'm gonna shut this down. And if any of you are conscious and have a question, I think we have a few <laughs> minutes, so. Well, the people uh, wanted to say congratulations uh, to you from Colombia. Uh, that's Carlos Galeano oh. uh, on Facebook. Um, and uh, there's a question here, uh, and this is coming from Connor Bradley. Uh, he says, is it possible a war of the world scenario could happen if extraterrestrials develop interstellar travel to reach the Earth? Well, I, I, I don't know. The war of the world scenario is that they come to Earth and flatten Los Angeles. Now, honestly, I live in Northern California, and if they want to flatten Los Angeles, OK, by me. But uh, sure, I, I think the real question is, would there be aggression, right? Could they, right. in fact, take, you know, just decide to wipe us out? I mean, I, I don't know what the motivations of the aliens are, but it's hard to think of a reason why they'd go to the expense, and it would be quite expensive, to wipe us out. What's in it for them? Uh, you know, and I was on a panel many years ago, a British uh, Royal Society, actually, panel, where we were trying to discuss why would the aliens even come to Earth? Why are they here, as so many people think, right? Mm. What brings them to Earth? And in the movies, it's often things like water. But there's water all over the universe. You don't need to come to Earth. There's a lot, twice as much water on one of the moons of Jupiter than you'll find here. So go there. You know, don't 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 bother us here. Uh, it's very unclear why they would come here. There's nothing here that they don't have except for our culture. I mean, they might come for the rock and roll, but I don't know that they flatten Los Angeles in order to get it. Right. Right. Um, Can I, have a I, I go ahead? Well, go ahead. No, I, I, I agree with, uh, with uh, Seth on, um, on the uh, uh, aspect of, uh, you know, that if we have extraterrestrials, that they're machines, you know, they could, I, I personally think, you know, we also, we have artificial intelligence, but we also have nanotechnology. Things are getting very, very small that can do some pretty amazing things. You know, I think it would be uh, fairly inexpensive to send out uh, stuff the size of a dust moat, okay, that may have like super intelligence out to uh, gather information. Um, uh, and, I, and I think that that would be very interesting. You know, uh, you put it on, on a solar sail, send it out, you know, and uh, and see what, what comes back eventually, you know. Uh, um, but, uh, you know, to send a fleshy, to go on that trip in a in a you know something the size of a camper van uh you know is is going to be tough you know on anyone that that wants to have generations of uh you know life cycles to get get to uh someplace like earth you know so um but uh you know i i do hope that uh that seti is successful in uh uh you know receiving a signal that you know, far exceeds the wow signal and that it's it's repeatable. And uh, I think it would be amazing, you know, uh, 
you know, just just to know that there is the, someone else is out there, you know. So I, I think it, it would be a, a cognitive shift moment for us, you know, for sure. To know that something else is out there. Did Norman so have a question? Are we, yes, I had a question. Uh, what about uh, the relics that we already have on Earth here that we just can't explain, like the pyramids, like the Easter Island, all these relics that we don't know how it was made by these people four or 5,000 years ago. Would it be well, some kind of a sign that someone already been there and just left? <laughs> well, Norman, I hate to disagree with you here in a public forum, but yeah. I, I think we do know how East, I've been to Easter Island. I've yeah. been to the pyramid several times. Yeah. And uh, somebody asked me actually, I was a talk in Australia years ago. And at the end of the talk, this guy raises his hand and he says, all right, my question is, who do you think built the pyramids? And, you know, I said, well, I, personally, I think it was Egyptians, right? But he didn't like that idea as if the Egyptians were too stupid to have built pointy structures. But there's all sorts of evidence in, uh, about how they built these things, right? And in fact, you can find other pyramids they built before the, the famous ones at Giza where they didn't get the angle right and they had to start over, right? If they were, if they, if they were using alien help, don't you think they would get it right? It turns out if you just take a bunch of limestone and stack it up, right? And there's plenty of limestone well, there. I, uh, I, it's just yeah. a question. Yeah, don't, don't underestimate the Egyptians. They were not stupid. Okay. Thank you. So, right. so what I heard was that it's more likely that the Transformers from Michael Bay would be a more realistic scenario than E.T., given that they are robots. Although... Yeah, they're not necessarily robots. Yeah, True. they're not necessarily robots. There's a difference between robots and AI, right? AI could be a machine that yeah. just sits in the corner of your office. It can't serve you coffee or make the bed. I mean, robots would have AI, I suppose, you know, very sophisticated robots. But the aliens might or might not require, you know, being able to walk across the living room. Hmm. Unlike the Daleks. Or, tra right. or transform into cars. Yes. <laughs> Makes great entertainment, though. Seth, yes, thank you so uh, much for coming on to Global Star Party. And uh, I'll uh, look forward to the next time we can do a uh, program together. It's wonderful. Thanks. Thank you so much. Man, excellent, excellent presentation. I loved it. And I did not go comatose. <laughs> no. It was a great presentation, Seth. Thank the you. The speaker went comatose. Okay, so um, our next speaker is none other than Bob Fugate. Uh, uh, Bob has been on several Global Star Parties uh, so far, and uh, he has progressed to uh, talk about um, uh, not only his amazing uh, experiences in astrophotography, but, uh, um, uh, you know, I think the last time he was on, we were, he had imaged a galaxy that was several billion light years away, and and, and that was from extremely dark skies. And then he gets into closer to the city where he lives, shooting through light pollution and still able to record it. So it's just, you know, the ingenuity of amateur astronomers uh, and the process of, of amateur astronomy are, are incredible to me. They're just as amazing to me as some of the most advanced science and technical abilities of uh, the professional world. And uh, I, I think that, um, Bob might agree with that um, as well. So, uh, Bob, thanks for coming on to the hundredth Global Star Party. It's uh, it's awesome to have you. <clears throat> okay, thanks, Scott. Uh, the first thing I think is um, I'd really like to congratulate you on one hundred Global Star Parties. That's just an incredible achievement, and it's um, also a testament to all the people that have participated in all those yes. star parties so yeah, I'm, a, I'm a late comer but uh i've i've learned so much um in the attending that i've that i've done so far and so i'm very appreciative of everybody's efforts in doing this so today uh, let me try to share my screen here um Today, I want to talk about uh, extremely large telescopes and um, their potential and their 
synergy with the Webb telescope. But first, I want to uh, I want to get started with the little story. Let's see if I can uh, get this full screen here. Uh, <clears throat> Every other year, SPIE sponsors a very large conference on telescopes and instrumentation. And about a decade ago, they had the, the meet, and, and every other year they have the meeting in North America or in Europe. This year, it's actually going on this week in Montreal. Yes, it is. <laughs> yes, and it's, it's a, uh, I, you know, I wish I were at it. It's it's just become an incredible meeting for adaptive optics and large telescopes. But um, when I was at the meeting in Orlando in about a decade ago, they had a full-scale mock-up of JWST in the parking lot. And um, there were two fellows out there from ESO who were working on, at the time, a 100-meter telescope they called the OWL overwhelmingly large telescope. So they were walking around. I, I didn't want to get them in the picture. I, in hindsight, it would have been a great thing because it would show the scale better. But um, I waited till they were gone before I took my picture, the one I'm showing here. But they were walking around, uh, looking at the placards and reading it and looking up at it. And finally, one of them said to the other one, but it's so small. I mean, okay, folks, that's supposed to be a joke. Um, you know, they were working on a telescope that's 100 meters in diameter. And here is a six and a half meter one that they consider to be a really small telescope. So the question arises, why, why are astronomers wanting bigger and bigger telescopes? And the answer is sensitivity. Uh, when we're looking back to the edge of the universe, things are very dim because they're far away and getting further away as we speak. So if we look at uh, sensitivity, and by sensitivity, I mean sort of the inverse of the time it takes to reach a certain signal to noise in your image or in your spectra. Um, so as you as you build a bigger telescope, of course, there are two, there are two conditions, seeing limited or um, diffraction limited. And if we look at an unresolved source like a star, for seeing limited conditions, limited by the atmosphere, the sensitivity increases as the square of the aperture diameter because it goes as the area. But if we have a diffraction limited telescope, it increases as the fourth power because the image gets also smaller as the square of the diameter, as the diameter increases. So if I compare the sensitivity of a 10 meter telescope with the six and a half meter telescope, you can see you can see it's you know better, but not significant. But as I build bigger and bigger telescopes, especially if I can maintain diffraction limited. It's, it's an enormous gain. So what this means is I have less integration time to get to the same, same level of quality in my image. And as it turns out, if we didn't have adaptive optics and in particular laser guide stars, it would not be worthwhile to build larger and larger telescopes. So I think adaptive optics is the key enabler for you know, what, what's going on now with extremely large telescopes. So there are four on the horizon. I'm not, I've included Keck here because they're revamping their adaptive optics. They have 10 meter telescopes, so that's nothing to sneeze at. But coming online soon will be a 24 or 25 meter telescope, the uh, Giant Magellan Telescope in Northern Chile. And then probably the next will be the European Extremely Large Telescope, also in Chile. It's 39 meters. And eventually, we hope to see the 30-meter telescope, and hopefully on the island of Hawaii. And we're not sure what the schedule is there. 
So I'd like to say a few words first about those, and then I'd like to say something about some, some advanced adaptive optics methods that are being used to make these telescopes near diffraction limited. So the Giant Magellan Telescope uses um, a technique where they're building seven 8.4 meter apertures. These are the ones on the outside are all off axis, very difficult to make. These are being made at the University of Arizona, spun cast, originally invented by Roger Angel. And um, all of the instruments are below the mirrors. This is kind of a cross section of the observatory. They're, they're making good progress on the construction. This photograph is a few years old. And, you know, they're hoping to see first light um, in a few years. Bob, I think that you're still on the J-West model. What's that? Yeah, I think the image that you're showing is still the J-West model. Oh, uh, oh, really? Oh mm -hmm. my gosh, why is it not changing? <laughs> Yeah, I'm seeing, all of us. I'm seeing it too. Yeah. Oh boy. Okay. Why is this so hard? Uh, do I need to stop sharing? Maybe. Yeah. Stop sharing and then go back in and. Okay. Let's see. I have to find Zoom. Okay. Maybe I'm sharing the wrong screen, but I don't. I have definitely done that before. Okay, let's try. There we oh. go. That's it. That's it. Okay, I'm sorry. I no problem. The reason I put the reason I put the monitor up was to make sure I was working properly, and then I didn't. I failed to look at it. <laughs> okay, so here is uh, the Giant Magellan Telescope. As I said, it has seven 8.4 meter mirrors. These are being made at the University of Arizona. It will, of course, use laser guide stars. And all of the instruments are located below the mirrors uh, in the base of the telescope. This is a, okay, now why didn't it change? I don't know what's going on. Oh dear. Uh, Maybe I can show it okay. this way. Um, yeah, if all else fails, that you can really take see you. It looks like the ELT right there. Okay, so this is um, this is the European ELT. This is the 39 meter telescope in in uh, northern Chile. And yeah. um, let's see if I can just. I'll try to minimize this by slide only here and see if this works. And here is a uh, rendering yep, of that work. primary primary parts. Uh, the primary consists of 700, almost 800 1.4 meter segments. And um, the secondary is up here, it's four meters in diameter. And the tertiary is down near the primary. And the fourth mirror is actually a deformable mirror. And then there's the relay that gets light into the instrument packages on the platforms on either side. So this is a different configuration than GMT in that the instruments are up on Naismith type platforms. Now, what I found interesting was this is a rendition of the secondary, I'm uh, sorry, of the deformable mirror. The deformable mirror on this telescope is 2.4 meters in diameter. So if you have a person standing next to it, this is sort of what it's going to look like. Um, the face sheet of the mirror is in six segments. I don't know if you can see the lines between these segments. Yes. And it has 5,000 actuators that are voice coils, each one able to move the surface 50 microns and it operates at one kilohertz. So this, will, this is what will be used along with the laser guide stars to correct for atmospheric turbulence. Uh, this is the Keck, this is an old drawing. 
But you see it's very similar to the European ELT in that it has two very large Naismith platforms and its primary is a measly 492 1.4 meter segments. I thought it was interesting that um, the 30 meter telescope and the EELT both used the same size segments. Maybe they're planning to interchange them. Although all these segments are not the same because this is not a sphere, this is a paraboloid. So they, they have different shapes and different figures. And here's a drawing of the um, structure of the 30 meter telescope. Uh, this is uh, the laser guide star facility for the 30 meter telescope. It has nine lasers and they mount on the structure down below here and they're plumbed up to the center of the telescope um, where they come out of a central aperture to form asterisms in the sky. The instrument on the side is called Nefarios. Um, a fellow that used to work with me, Brent Ellerbrook, is the one that came up with the name. He, he was the principal for the adaptive optics for TMT until he retired. Uh, but TMT uses uh, two deformable mirrors in what's called multi-conjugate multi adaptive optics. One of these mirrors is imaged at 11 kilometers above the telescope, the other one at the ground. And all of these optics are in a minus 30 degree C container in a near vacuum. And there's a, a mirror over here on the side that feeds um, instruments that are attached below uh, the adaptive optics component. So they use for the different instruments, they use different asterisms in the sky for the laser guide stars. And I thought this chart was very interesting. This, this was put together by Brent actually, and it shows how the 30 meter telescope has a strong synergistic effect with space telescopes, JWST here, and ALMA over here. So you'll see in general, if things work as they are planned, um, the, 30 meter telescope will have uh, additional capability in terms of angular resolution and a lot more capability in terms of spectral resolution. But they're complementary in that they kind of fill out these charts for, for the science cases. So what I wanted to do briefly then was describe some of the techniques that astronomers have invented with laser guide star adaptive optics to cover various situations. Um, at the heart of most of what they're going to do with these extremely large telescopes is tomography. The idea is to put up an array of laser guide stars and view the turbulence through different directions. So it's just like MRI or CT scan. When you, when you collect data with diff from different directions, you can reconstruct a three-dimensional model of the turbulence. And this is this will be done at like a thousand times a second. So you need multiple sensors and a very strong computer to do this, but we have the computing power. That's generally the thing that um, is the least limiting is our is our ability to do the computations. So uh, this has already been shown to work. Uh, back in 2013 at the um, Large Binocular Telescope in Arizona where they used six Rayleigh laser guide stars. They were only trying to correct the ground turbulence layer because the Rayleigh has a limited altitude, but uh, all the simulations and so forth for the EL ELT show that sodium laser guide stars uh, are going to do the job when they're employed uh, for narrow field of view systems that are trying to achieve a high strel. Uh, <clears throat> the next concept that's being worked is multi-conjugate adaptive optics. And this is, as I mentioned, for the case of the 30 meter telescope, this has already also been demonstrated 
on Gemini South in Chile on the eight meter telescope there, where they have three deformable mirrors, each of which is re-imaged at a different altitude because the turbulence over Paranal or, or the turbulence in Chile is typically, this is not at Paranal, the, but the turbulence in Chile has typically been, been known to work in three layers. And so they've picked those layers and the optics to image the DEMs there. And that produces a wider field of view. And in fact, they've, they're getting really good correction over two arc minutes. And here's an image that I think is 0.9 arc minutes of a globular cr cluster. And it's essentially diffraction limited at high strel throughout the field. So this is, this is complicated. All of this stuff is complicated, but people are willing to sign up for it because they want large aperture diffraction limited telescopes. So another aspect of AO on big telescopes is extreme adaptive optics. And the, the primary uh, targets here are looking at exoplanets and in fact doing specter of their atmospheres. And the typical arrangement is to have two deformable mirrors that act like a woofer and a tweeter. So the coarse mirror corrects all of the large spatial frequency aberrations caused by turbulence and the fine deformable mirror, which in the case of, of the GPI or the Gemini planet imager has 4,096 actuators. It's a MEMS type device. Um, it operates on you know very small uh, throw of the actuators because the coarse mirror has taken most of the big aberrations out. And so they're achieving strels of 95 to 97% over a very small field of view, you know, big enough to see the exoplanet. And in this case, for instance, here is HR 8799, a very famous uh, star that has many uh, planets. They've looked at the atmospheres of two of those shown here. And even more, more exciting is um, They've looked at this star um, shown. This, this is a uh, Keck image here. It has lower strel. You'll notice the higher quality of the, of the GPI image. And they basically are seeing uh, methane and water vapor. And uh, this is in uh, H and J bands. So in the near IR, in the mid IR. And you know, what I'd like to point out is this was done in 2015, actually was done before that. And uh, you don't hear a lot about some of this stuff, but it's, it's going on. So uh, another aspect that uh, the next generation AO at Keck is working on is multi-object AO. And the idea is to put up an array of guide stars in different formats. And in one of them, this one, um, where these blue dots are targets, um, they want to do simultaneous measurements on these like spectra and so forth. And so their plan is to get the light from each of these onto a deformable mirror. And so here they show, uh, you know, a, another target that has multiple objects in it. They pick the light off with an arm, send it to a MEMS device, but in order to do that, they, they have an array of guide stars that does the tomography. So they know in any given direction to this, uh, to this target, to this galaxy, for instance, what the distortion is every millisecond. And so they can open loop command the deformable mirror looking at that target. And that allows them to do simultaneous corrections on a half a dozen or a dozen targets uh, at one time. And so this, this whole uh, system that will allow them to do that is in the works and under construction now. This just shows how they pick off the guide stars, the sodium guide star images. They have these articulated arms that move about in the pupil and sample the guide stars. 
So again, all very complicated, but worth the effort. So finally, I'd like to talk about uh, a, a new project at NASA. I don't know how many of you have heard about this. This is at Goddard. And um, the principals are uh, Eliad Peretz and John Mather. John Mather and I worked way back. Uh, I was actually on some of the early review committees for the Webb Telescope. And John Mather and I are longtime friends. But uh, the idea here is to put a, a low-powered laser in a very high elliptical orbit and use it as a guide star for Keck. Um, what this does is it enables Keck to operate more toward the visible at very high strel. So, uh, for instance, um, Oh, this, this just shows angular resolution. Here's the Webb telescope. You know, this was a sales chart, right? This was a chart John Mather put together. He's trying to sell his program, so he's making it look really good. Um, here's Keck with Orca, Orca's adaptive optics. This is $10 billion. This is $35 million. Now, if you put a 15-meter space telescope up, he says it would be $15 billion. Who knows? But... Um, if you use ORCAs with uh, TMT, GMT, and e ELT, uh, it's off the chart down toward the bottom. And this is the improvement they expect using this uh, laser-borne satellite uh, with the AO at, at Keck, which only requires some minor modifications. Okay, so um, the other... The other point here is if you can get working in the visible, uh, you can actually get better sensitivity than you might get in space. This is a very interesting chart because it shows the great advantage of Webb being out at L2 in terms of background. You know, if you're on the ground, you have all this to deal with mm -hmm. in the near IR. But in the visible, uh, they're more comparable. Mm -hmm. And the argument goes that you can actually beat the space telescope in terms of sensitivity if with a 10 meter telescope on the ground, if you have this orbiting laser. Now it's, um, it's at about, uh, it's way beyond geo. It's in like a two day orbit. And um, you get about 3000 seconds of observing time while it's still in the isoplanetic patch of the turbulence. And it really acts like a, um, you know, a, a natural guide star in terms of the AO performance. Mm. It gets rid of all the issues associated with laser guide stars from the atmosphere or from the mesosphere. Okay, uh, so that's how I see us seeing beyond with ELTs and AO. In the coming years, in, the, in this coming decade, I think it's going to be an exciting ride. I think so. I think so. That's amazing. You know, these giant telescopes. Uh, I I wonder what what the field of view will be like uh, with with um, uh, the ad adaptive optics uh, as compared to like the field of view of J West. Could you comment on that? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know the exact field of view with all the instruments of the web, but it's got to be larger than what, you know, an AO corrected uh, telescope on the ground is. The AO telescopes, mm -hmm. I think, um, thirty meter telescope is like ten arc minutes. Oh wow, very small field. Excellent. Uh, you know, every time that we dive into adaptive optics, it makes me want to. Uh, put one on my telescopes. <laughs> well, we should, we should talk about that sometime and what, uh, you know, what would make sense for amateur sized telescopes. Right. Yeah. Fantastic. All right. Well, thank you so much, Bob. That's, that's, uh, that's fascinating. I love this stuff. Okay. Um, thank you for having me. And again, congratulations to everybody. Thank you so much. Thanks for coming on again. That's great. Well, we are going to uh, go to um, uh, Terry Mann, uh, who is here from the Astronomical League. Uh, she, uh, 
you know, she helps me organize so much of the, or helps keep everybody, I think, in the league on the same page. Uh, she's a former two-term president of the Astronomical League. Uh, she's devoted so much to uh, outreach and astronomy uh, and, uh, you know, helping the league uh, reach new heights and membership and, uh, and, and uh, you know, the, they are the world's largest federation of astronomy clubs, but uh, she doesn't, she doesn't uh, exclude other organizations or, you know, she's not, she's not competing with them, but, uh, um, but she is, uh, uh, I think, include, you know, she adopts a philosophy of inclusiveness, which I think is wonderful. And, um, you know, I think that that is the, the secret to the success of the league, which is largely a volunteer effort. And um, uh, so, uh, but Terry's uh, passion also is uh, Aurora, and um, uh, she'll talk about that in some of our future presentations that we do. Um, but for now, she's going to do the door prizes, and I mentioned that we will be upping the, uh, the uh, you know, upgrading the, the prizes themselves. Uh, we're not changing it, the way that we uh, do the, the door prizes, um, but for this particular 100th anniversary, we're going to include a uh, IXOS 100. This is a uh, this is a computer controlled equatorial mount that's wonderful uh, in its precision uh, and also its uh, its compactness. This will be, I think, one of the uh, the uh, most desired pieces of equipment for those of you that aren't don't already have a portable equatorial mount, but uh, want to have something to prepare for these eclipses that are coming up, and for, also for those of you who want to do nightscape photography and that type of thing or if you have uh, what are called grab and go telescopes uh, everything from about a four inch refractor on down works on these mounts and so we're happy to offer that in this particular go around we will also be offering a couple of hundred degree um, uh, you know uh, explore scientific waterproof eyepieces uh, that will be part of this deal so if you have not participated in answering the questions from the Astronomical League, you're going to want to do it this time, okay? Um, Terry Nan will explain how it all works, but uh, she is uh, she's with us, and um, uh, you know I'm really happy to have Terry on with me here on the hundredth Global Star Party. Terry, thank you for coming on. Well, thank you, Scott. It's always a pleasure to be here. And congratulations. I can't believe it's been a hundred. It's been a hundred. That's right. Yeah, it's hard to believe. Yeah. Maybe that technically this would actually be a hundred and one, but being that it's happening on the same day, we're having it, we're calling it part one <laughs> and part two. We had so go. many people that wanted to talk on the hundredth global star party. I'm very mm -hmm. grateful to all of them. And uh, so it's uh, it's it's been a huge honor for me to uh, interact with all the people that have been on Global Star Party from our meager beginnings, uh, you know, uh, and, and the forgiving audience. I mean, we had, <laughs> oh my goodness, the mistakes I made in learning how to broadcast uh, were, were numerous and huge, and uh, including one that where I just had to like throw the towel in and say, okay, guys, we're not doing it tonight, but, um, <laughs> But we didn't even count that one. So it was called Virtual Star Party when it started. Uh, I quickly changed its name to Global Star Party as I realized that we could have amateur astronomers and professional astronomers, some of them, uh, logging in from anywhere in the world. And, uh, and the audience also was uh, watching from around the world. So that's, that's how it got the name Global Star Party. But uh, uh, we will... Um, uh, have lots of uh, great talks to come uh, today, and um, uh, you know, the least not the least of which will be Terry Mann after she gives this <laughs> door prize segment. So I'm going to turn right. it over to you, Terry. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Yeah, you know, going global though, there's been so much, so many people that we have met around the world, and it has really been amazing just to kind of see what it's like somewhere else, or when it's dark there, we can look at their views. So it has all been amazing. 
I was going to email Kareem and tell him how much I enjoyed his talk the last time on the last Global Star Party. I just sit there in amazement, in amazement. So you're too kind, Terry. No, you were great. I really enjoyed that. So thank you very much for that. All right, let's go ahead. Uh, as we always start, we have the warning about if you just bought a telescope, be aware, never look at the sun without a filter. That is so, so important because damage can happen so quick. Please go to your local astronomy club or to somebody that is familiar with viewing the sun before you ever try to look at the sun. So what I want to start with are the answers from July 12th. The answers were, we were talking, we're all about James Webb Space Telescope. Mm -hmm. So the first question on the 12th was, in what constellation in tonight's sky is a James Webb Space Telescope? And the answer is Sagittarius. It's always opposite the sun in the sky. Second question. What is the true field of view for the James Webb Space Telescope primary instrument, the near infrared spectrograph? And that is three arc minutes by three arc minutes. Last question. The JWST has 18 4.3 foot diameter hexagon shaped mirrors. How much does each beryllium mirror weigh on Earth? And the answer, was about 20 pounds. Wow. So what we do is we mm -hmm. award prizes once a month. And so we put everybody's name on a list that has answered that question. And that is what this is. Uh, the next, what would be the next global star party, we will all be at Alcon. So uh, for July, this, this will be the last star party in July. So it will be, I believe August 2nd will be the mm -hmm. first Tuesday. So that will be when we will award all of these prizes, plus the ones that Scott has mentioned today. So here's the questions for July 19th for today for the 100th Global Star Party. Asteroid Vesta is going to be at opposition on what date and time in August? So I'm going to slow down for this one because there's some good door prizes and people say we go too fast with the questions. I want time to look at it. So what asked, I mean, asteroid Vesta is going to be at opposition on what date and time in August. Second question, what's important <clears throat> about M31-V1? So what is so important about that? And please send your answers to secretary at astroleague.org. Secretary at astroleague.org. Third question, what supernova is the oldest recorded supernova and how long was it visible? Hmm. So what supernova is the oldest recorded supernova and how long was it visible? <clears throat> Please send your answers to secretary at astroleague.org. And as I just mentioned, we're all going to be at Astro or Alcon in uh, Albuquerque, New Mexico. For Alcon, July 28th through the 30th, please come and join us if you can. You're going to find a lot of the people from the league there, and hopefully we'll meet some new friends too. So for that, Scott, I'm going to stop that session. Okay, all right. And if it's okay with you, I will just kind of continue right on to my next session. Perfect. Perfect. As soon as I can, there we go. Now you'll have to bear with me because for me, when I read what, what the theme was tonight, it was seeing beyond. And you know, for me, when I think of seeing beyond, so many things came to my mind. I mean, we had heard some about the James Webb Space Telescope, and that is so incredible. I really loved it. Um, and then I thought back, you know, seeing beyond means a whole lot of things to me. And it means to me, when we see beyond, we reach for possibilities. You know, everything that I think as amateur astronomers we do, we all understand this. 
But so many people in the general public, when you're talking to them, don't understand what astronomy can really be all about, what we can learn, how it changes, and how exciting it gets, and how much there is an astronomical community. And we all sit together and we watch what NASA does. We watch the rovers bounce on Mars or we waited until we heard everything was okay. Think of the first time you ever, heard, uh, one of the Apollo astronauts landed on the moon. Mm. Think of a space shuttle launch. I mean, there's so many things that are so incredible that happen in astronomy and in amateur astronomy that we all enjoy so much. And every time we watch that, we're reaching for a new height. You know, we're reaching for something new or something to explore because I really do believe we are made as adventurers. You know, we want to go on that adventure. We want to explore what's going on, but we want to learn. It's a real learning hobby. And so, you know, something kind of catches our eyes sometimes. And once it does, oops, sorry, once it does, it kind of stays in your mind. Walking up on a view like this, this was uh, in the UP, up in the Boundary Waters. Yeah, Minnesota Boundary Waters. There was something so special about that sunset. And it kind of, it makes you begin to wonder. You know, I saw the reflection, the canoe sitting there. I don't know. It just puts you in the mood for a night where discovery you know, excitement of what is ahead. Maybe I'll have Aurora that night, which I did. You know, it it catches your eye and it really makes you think. And then in that moment, I don't know about you, but for me, it freezes time. I look at that and I think about, wow, you know, wh why is this happening? Or, or what can I see here that normally people don't see? A lot of times, I think we as astronomers or amateur astronomers, we see that elusive light that so many people really don't understand. I love elusive light. And mm. to me, that means I see something because I take the time to take an image or I take the time to really look deeply at something. I am an observer. So I look and for that moment, I can freeze it in my mind. And then I'm going to go back and I'm going to want to know the science. What made this happen? Why is this? Uh, how did that aurora happen? Even better, how did that moving rock happen? Now, how can this be that this rock has moved and there's a path here, you know, or the Milky Way and some of the old ruins? To me, knowing the science and learning about it is so much a part of our astronomy. And then I want to share it. You know, I've seen something incredible and it is fantastic if one of you maybe on a bucket list or you ever wondered about this, maybe you can go to some of these places and look at the possibilities. So I just came back from StarQuest where I was a speaker at Green Bank and we had a great time there sharing stories and think that's what Alcon will be like. We're gonna be talking to so many people and sharing so many things that we have done. And I think that's one of the most incredible things about our astronomical community. I would not have known all of you guys and so many more that I have that I do feel like I know without Scott's Global Star Party. And that's what's so important about Scott doing this. He has really built up the astronomical community. And then we all reach for, you know, those possibilities. Every time I go to Alaska, it's like, OK, now I need to be here. I don't care if it's 30 below. I got to go out and I've got to see if that aurora is going to happen. And when you get a view that starts in like this and you're sitting behind a camera, in this case, a <clears throat> video camera, I literally, once I adjusted things around, fell to the ground and watched this aurora fire up. And just, just to watch the motion, then all the questions come to mind. Then all the science comes to mind. I like to understand as much as I can of what is happening here. Look at the speed it moves. Watch how fast it fades out. Look at the detail, look at the structure. All of this goes in my mind. And I think that's what is so great about everything we do with astronomy because we get into so many fields, so many different ways of looking at things. And our community understands this. But when you're doing public outreach, it's a little bit tougher sometimes. Um, I get a lot of questions, you know, about why and hows, and I'm sure you guys do too. 
So it's something that it just exercises the mind. Or like this, you know, we are explorers and it makes you wonder. I was, this was in May when uh, I was up at Carolyn's Gathering for Carolyn Shoemaker. I had went to Canyonlands and I could not believe what I saw in Canyonlands. I had never seen the air glow like wow. this. And I was shooting the Milky Way. That's what I went after. I wanted, this is 16 segments that I have stitched together. And I wanted to get the Milky Way. And I took the first shot and this green came up in here. And I said, oh my gosh. And as I stood there, I could really see a white haze kind of with this shot. But then all of this air glow came out and it was just, you, you stand there in awe. I did. I mean, to me, it, I've never seen anything like this. So and it, yeah, I've never seen it like that. I've seen it in the sky and around, but I've never seen an arch like that, just like the Milky Way. Mm. Um, so I, I immediately just, I stood, I bet I was there for two hours just watching this because it was so incredible. But again, I think as observers, we learn to see beyond. I granted now I did not see, I saw the Milky Way, but when I took this image, I knew something else was there. And then your eyes begin to adjust and you can see what is going on. And it was amazing. And again, that's what is so amazing about this hobby. You never have time to be bored unless that's your choice, I think. And then when I, this one, I was giving a talk and I had used one of these slides as a background and uh, at a break, kind of in between, you know, some of the slides, somebody yelled out, where did you take that? And how did you do that? I had never seen the zodiacal light before. This was an incredible again a night for me. I had never seen it. And I remember looking at the person next to me and saying, do you know what that is? I was just blown away. And you've got the Northern Milky Way and the Northern Arch. So it, there is so much that we can learn and so many questions. The times that I've worked with the scouts, they really, they've not seen stuff like this. So to see something like this, it makes them wa want to learn. They're excited about it. Why is that? And they'd like to go see it themselves. They're probably telling their parents where they want to go on vacation by now. But it's an incredible thing to see. And I sh I'm sure every one of you can stop and think about this. Now, this is a Hubble shot, granted. But I was probably eight years old when my dad took me to a college observatory. And they had a nice refractor in that observatory. And I looked at Saturn. And I remember looking at my dad saying, it's hanging on velvet. And I was hooked. Mm. That's what it took. You know, a grant, I took my first astro photo shortly after that when I stole my dad's camera and went out and took a picture of the moon and he caught me. But this to me was what it was all about. In my mind, this is how I saw this as a child because it was so inky black behind it and the rings just glowed. And it got me wondering and wanting. Everything I did in school and science fairs was always astronomy. And how about the total eclipse? I don't know about you guys, but wow, last year was, or 2017 was great. I mean, and I'm, I love the diamond ring. That is something that always intrigued me. Uh, but the questions, when people see this image or any image about you know, a total solar eclipse, the questions, the kids' excitement. Uh, we're gearing up around Ohio because the center line is going to go right over my house, but I'm not going to be here. <laughs> I'm going to be in Texas, I do believe. Um, and so, so many questions. And that's great because I think it really encourages the science and the science programs and the teachers and the kids and what can be seen. And I'm sure you guys can all, all remember back to what you first saw that got you excited about astronomy because it's it's a big thing or it was to me but then i started the adventure i started saying every thursday night i was at that observatory that that college was, had open every thursday night my dad would take me to learn the constellations to learn everything that i could in that short time about astronomy and it is a great adventure and it doesn't matter if you've got a telescope microscope camera whatever it is you use whatever has drawn you to your hobby or your career and you learn so much and you share. And I think that's a big part of it, learning to share. 
and learning so much because my dad was a rock hound. So when Dave Iker does his talks about the rocks, you know, I'm sitting there because my dad made beautiful jewelry and he would go out rock he'd go about rock hounding and bring back tons of rocks and i mean he would saw them up everything he did just amazed me so i think you know the adventure or the curiosity that you feel or the passion that you feel for what it is you do really reflects uh how about the mercury transit can you find mercury can you tell i had clouds <laughs> This was a Mercury transit from, ah, I don't remember, the one before last. Here's little Mercury right here behind the clouds. Oh. Um, yeah, at least I got it a little bit. Or, you know, the belt of Venus. I mean, all of this, just the first time I, I saw I like it, the clouds on it, though. I think it, it gives some drama to it. You know, it, And it filters. It helps filter a little bit. And, uh, you know, and look, at, we have a sunspot, at least. We had one, and I'm hoping we have a whole lot of sunspots for our 2023 annular and 2024 total. Uh, I think that makes it a little bit more exciting, but I don't know the eclipse itself is pretty exciting. Yeah. So it doesn't matter, whatever you do, whether it's during the daytime, nighttime or in between, if you're like me, you're always searching the skies. And I gotta tell you, this year in Alaska was incredible. I have never seen purples and blues like this. I know the purples and blues will come out in around sunset sunrise that's when they're more prevalent but this is beautiful and this is light polluted fairbanks right here underneath it but the i just fell in love with the purples and the blues i got so excited shooting the stills i had the video camera but i didn't even start it up because i was running everywhere with my camera trying to get different shots and you know the more you see the more you want to know or at least that's the way it is with me. And the deeper you go into the sky, the more you learn. Um, wow. I remember, yeah, I was standing here taking this shot and a dad and his daughter walked up beside me and he, they're both looking at me and I just smiled and said, hi. And she pulls out her dad's coat and says, what's she doing? And mm. he said, she's taking a picture. And she said, doesn't she know it does, it sleeps at night? <laughs> he had no idea that it would still do its eruption during the night and I died I just laughed you know he looked at me and shook his head and he explained how that geyser worked and it, it was just amazing just you know out of the mouth of babes and you hear that so many times kids come up with the most amazing questions and you know hey it keeps going every day. We learn more. We reach farther. We see beyond every day. And this, um, in December, I went to Death Valley National Park. Never been there before. It was kind of on my bucket list. I love the desert. And that was one of the most incredible places I'd ever been to. Just as you saw the racetrack, uh, the moving rocks on the racetrack. Scott, remember the Global Star Party I was on when I said, Scott, I yeah. spent Saturday night at the racetrack. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you better right. explain that. <laughs> Hopefully not gambling, right? Yeah, so. not gambling, watching the rocks. Yeah. So, yeah, I spent a night out at the racetrack energy, but it was beautiful. And the first time I saw the green flash, um, that's where I, I was lucky enough to catch it, just the little green flash of it. But people that have never seen that are amazed that you can see something like that. Mm. You know, they didn't even know it would exist. And you never know what you're going to get. I took this picture. To me, I see the Indian. I see the headdress. I see the eyes, the nose, the mouth. And I call him the North Wind because it's like he's blowing the North Wind to the north. And what you see down here is huge. So you get oh, an idea man. of scale. This is ski land. If you're ever familiar with Clary Summit and ski land, this is ski land. And, you know, when you take the picture, the aurora is moving so fast, you have no idea what shape you might see in it. And this was one of the shapes that just jumped out at me. And I got to admit, I love a good storm. I love, I, you know, I've got respect for Mother Nature. But again, I think it's maybe it's just the sky, maybe it's nature in general. Something draws me to all of this. And so, you know, you never know what interest you will find, but when you find it, you're going to know it. Hmm. And this, Stefan's Quintet. I remember the first time I saw it, but 
Kareem, when you brought this up and started talking about it, you know, you just feel your insides going, holy cow, we have, we have reached another, another hurdle and we're going farther and we're seeing so much beyond. And it is just so incredible. So I would just like to say thank you for letting me be part of this. And thank you for bringing the league into this, Scott. And thank all you. of you that we see all of you every week, different ones of us are here. But this adventure is amazing. And I think we're all enjoying being on it. And I would just like to say thank you for allowing me to be part. Well, we are very, very thankful that you are uh, participating in the way that you do. I'm really, I'm pumped right now. I'm, I'm ready to go. I want to <laughs> forget too. this. I'm going to go outside and look at the sun or something, <laughs> actually. So. That and was anyway. just incredible. <laughs> it was like, it was, it was breathtaking. All the, the story and the way you wow, wove together all of those images. Ah, <laughs> I gotta go, I gotta go aurora hunting with you. This is now my bucket list. Hey, yeah. <laughs> Yes, definitely. I'd love to. You guys have got some good Aurora up there. I need to come up your way. Well, Lou just brought to my attention that the KP number is really nice and high tonight. And I'm looking out and I'm seeing clouds. I'm like, no. I, yeah, that's the one thing I think all of us have sat around a campfire or sat outside looking at clouds, waiting to observe, going, oh, man, you know, bring on the s'mores, <laughs> get order a pizza, do something. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I, the Aurora is something that's always attracted me, but I really, I think like a lot of the sciences, but yeah, I definitely want to head to Canada sometime. Anytime. You're welcome. Thank you. I'll Terry, take time off of Terry, work. We'll go a, out. Yeah. And I'll probably be with you both, Terry. <laughs> I, that's on my bucket list too. Um, <laughs> I love the way, I love the way that you wove your stories together as someone who does that sort of imaging myself. Um, I think the one thing when you said point it, point the camera north and take a picture because you never know what you're going to get. Yeah, uh, I have an Aurora picture from that. I pointed it, didn't see anything, was getting bit by mosquitoes. I was there to shoot the Milky Way and I said, why not? And the Aurora showed up. So you know, thank yeah. you. That presentation reminds me why I love to do it. And yeah. when you're out there immersed in the sky, you're just bringing some of it home with you to, to remember it by. And, and yeah. you want to go out and do it again. Always. So, uh, I'm always ready to go do this again. Yeah, it's great. Yeah. So, thank you, thank Terry. You. Thank you. Okay. Well, um, so we are going to... Um, transition here. Our next speaker, Terry, again, thanks so, so much for getting us so pumped up here. <laughs> sure. uh, <laughs> it was awesome. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Lou Mayo. He is a professor of astronomy at Marymount University. Uh, I have met uh, Lou at various events. I think um, maybe the first time I met Lou was at an Astronomical League convention. Uh, and in, um, I think it was in uh, uh, possibly St. Louis, Missouri seems, seems to. That's uh, right. Yeah. Is that right? So, right. yeah. Yeah. And so, um, uh, but I, I had a question for you, Lou. I, I saw someone, I mean, of course I can only see in the back, but, uh, you know, when Joe Biden was presenting the first image of uh, the James Webb space telescope, I saw someone taking pictures and I go, is that Lou Mayo? in the corner taking pictures hmm. not you uh no <laughs> no <laughs> you have a doppelganger okay so <laughs> anyways but being a uh yeah i think that some of that was shot from uh live from goddard um not still not sure of even that but um but wow what an amazing time and uh it, it definitely i was thinking of, about uh I was thinking that you were there. So maybe you were in spirit. Oh, in spirit, yes. Yes. Definitely in spirit. Great. Well, that's a beautiful image that you have behind you, uh, Lou. And um, thanks for coming on to the 100th Global Star Party. Uh, it's really wonderful. So thanks so much. You bet, Scott. Yep. Well, let's see. Um, now let me share my screen here.
Okay. And Terry, I wanted to tell you um, those pictures of Aurora were stunning, absolutely stunning. Yeah. And reminded me of my trip, I think, uh, gosh, 10 years ago to Barrow, Alaska for first polar sunrise. We got a van. It was 30 degrees, degrees below, just like you quoted, Terry. And um, uh, we went out looking for polar bears at night where you scan the uh, Arctic Ocean, the frozen Arctic Ocean with a searchlight looking for the reflectivity in their eyes. We didn't see any polar bears, but we saw the most incredible aurora. So I got to check that off my bucket list. Um, today, I'm gonna talk to you all about uh, a favorite topic of mine, and that is Titan, Saturn's moon Titan. I've spent a good portion of my life um, studying Titan. Uh, from spacecraft observations. And I found it to be the most interesting place in the solar system, uh, perhaps beyond Earth. Titan doesn't get much attention uh, as some of the other planets do. Saturn has its rings, Jupiter is the largest, Venus is the closest. In fact, Venus is often called our sister planet, right? It comes the closest to Earth. It's 95% uh, the size of Earth. It has a, an atmosphere like Earth does. But I, I'm gonna to try to make a case today that uh, Titan should be our sister planet and that the potential for finding life kind of, to kind of tie all this together on Titan is, um, is, is significant, uh, which is why we have some new missions uh, planned to go there. So, uh, here's a beautiful image from Cassini, from the wow. Cassini um, uh, imager of Titan. They caught it just on the edge on view of Saturn's rings. You can see the shadow of the rings on the cloud tops of Saturn. And you can see Titan and even kind of get a sense of its little bit of its orangish hue, which is due to the photochemistry. Uh, it's a kind of long chain polymer smog. That, in, uh, that envelops the entire moon. In a sense of uh, you know, size, uh, Titan is actually bigger than, uh, than Mercury. If it wasn't orbiting Saturn, it would definitely be a planet. Uh, it has an atmosphere, a nitrogen atmosphere, pr primarily nitrogen. It has um, a tropopause where the temperature turns over just like on Earth. It has seasons, it has rain, it has clouds, it has lakes, it has rivers. It even has what we will call today prebiotic uh, chemistry. So it is an incredible uh, place, a um, little over a billion kilometers from the sun, but you know who's counting that? Um, and I think it would be, um, widely acknowledged as Earth's sister planet for all the reasons I just gave, except that the surface temperature is about 94 Kelvin, day in, day out. Not much variability between um, the equator and pole because its atmosphere is so thick and extensive. Its surface pressure is 50% larger than Earth's. It is the only moon in the solar system with um, a substantial atmosphere. So it's really quite an amazing place. So amazing that uh, we've sent a number of spacecraft and have some planned um, to go to Titan. Uh, it's been known since I think the 1940s. Uh, Gerard Kuiper discovered methane in the spectra of Titan. So we knew that there was methane in the atmosphere, which can often be a biomarker. Um, and so Pioneer 11 uh, to Saturn uh, took some initial images of, of Titan. Uh, the two Voyager spacecraft uh, took images of Titan. And in fact, Titan was such a high priority item for the Voyager mission that Voyager 1 was redirected to fly as close as it could to Titan to get very high spatial resolution images, uh, which, um, which meant that it couldn't go on to Uranus and Neptune but it got some of the most incredible high resolution images that were uh, only superseded uh, 20 years later uh, by Cassini. 
and of course Cassini with its Huygens probe uh, built by the Europeans that uh, parachuted down onto the surface of Titan, which I can't even fathom how you would how you would um, thread that needle over a billion kilometers away, and they pinpointed uh, the landing. So from those missions, here's a little bit of a, an idea of what we got. Uh, Pioneer 11 had a fairly fuzzy image of Titan. Remember, we're not seeing the surface here. The surface is um, clouded in visible wavelengths uh, from us by uh, um, uh, an atmospheric haze that is built up through the photochemistry, uh, the photo disassociation of uh, nitrogen and methane in the upper atmosphere. And so we don't see the surface there. Um, uh, HST through their wide field planetary camera took images of Titan. I remember the, I remember the age before we, before Cassini, where nobody had seen a very good image of the surface of Titan. Um, but we figured out that uh, in the one to two micron range in the infrared, there are four methane windows where the methane absorption is, is minimal. And you can actually see to the surface of Titan. And that is the case with the Cassini VIMS instrument, visual and infrared mapping spectrometer in, uh, down below in the middle. And there we are seeing through one of those um, methane windows to the surface. And what we're seeing are uh, lakes uh, in the dark, uh, dark regions, um, uh, probably a methane cloud in the lower left there. Uh, I remember when we didn't know if there were methane clouds and we were having a debate at Cornell University when Bob Samuelson and I were making our presentation and uh, Carl Sagan and his team were making their presentation and a group from Canada who uh, his name escapes me now and we were kind of arguing over methane clouds, methane supersaturation. Um, and of course, now we know the answers to all of this. Um, in the lower right, we see uh, a Huygens image from their downward pointing imager as it parachuted to the surface of Titan. And this image we see, well, we call them, we, we used to call them fluvial channels. I think we can call them rivers now. Um, clear evidence of that. Uh, the, the darkish area on the bottom of the image um, uh, covers about half of the three images that are stitched together there. That's a, that's a hydrocarbon lake. We now know that's hydrocarbons. And the whitish features we see over the lake are in fact methane clouds. Um, going right up from there back to Voyager, you notice that the top portion of that image is different than the bottom portion. The top portion is darker than the bottom portion, right? Northern hemisphere is darker in that image than the Southern hemisphere. That is not uh, a sun angle effect. That is real. Um, on on uh, Jupiter, we see um, uh, six Had Hadley cell circulation centers from equator to pole, which result in the beautiful uh, banded structure of Jupiter. On Earth, we have three Hadley cells from equator to pole because our rotation rate is some of it slower than Jupiter's. Titan's rotation rate is very slow. And so depending on the season, you have uh, uh, half of the Titan year, you have simple transport of material from the Southern hemisphere to the North and back again. So it's a fascinating object. Well, um, here is the closest up image we have of Titan at this point. This was taken by the Huygens uh, uh, lander as it par parachuted to the ground. You saw it, uh, an image from above the surface just a few moments ago. This is now on the ground looking at the surface of Titan. And we anticipated that uh, because we understood the, we, we, were, we had been able to model the atmosphere before Cassini, and we understood that it was raining on Titan, that the hydrocarbons and the nitriles uh, were precipitating out and probably making it to the ground. And so uh, the Huygens probe was designed so that it could float if it landed in a hydrocarbon lake, or it could um, survive on the ground. And 
um, on the bottom of the probe, there was a spring. And as the probe landed, that spring compressed. And if it hadn't compressed any, we would say, okay, it's in liquid. If it had compressed hard and complete and rapidly, we'd say, okay, it landed on a very solid surface. Turns out it handed, landed in something of a marshy surface. And what you're seeing in this image here, you can see some of the flatter areas um, that are um, uh, liquid on the surface. And some of these rocks here, which we believe are a water ice frozen solid. Remember the surface mm. is 95 Kelvin. Uh, so water is not flowing on the surface, covered with tholins, covered with, with prebiotic material, nitriles and hydrocarbons that have the potential as the building blocks uh, of life. So um, I think the thing that makes Titan most interesting is its, is its atmosphere. It is a soup. It is a soup of prebiotic chemicals. Some of them that in fact we know are building blocks of life, such as hydrogen cyanide. But we, and we have a nitrogen um, chemistry. Remember this is ultraviolet light, striking nitrogen and striking methane and forming new chemicals that, are, that form new chemicals that form new chem chemicals and so on. So we have methane, we have acetylene, we have hydrogen cyanide, we have disyanoacetylene. I mean, the most incredible um, soup of chemicals. And that is one of the things that you need to form life, right? You need heat, you, we, we believe you need water, and you need chemistry. So Titan certainly fits the bill with the chemistry. Here's a model of the um, atmosphere of Titan that uh, we had made. Um, H nu coming in on the top there, that's just ultraviolet light, uh, providing the energy for uh, auto disassociation of uh, nitrogen and methane. You see methane and ethane, C2H6, ethane being formed, methane clouds in the troposphere, and then uh, rain and uh, some sort of um, of acquisition of the of this hydrocarbon rain on the surface. The methane then, by the way, uh, evaporates back up to create clouds. And so there's a methane cycle on Titan as opposed to a water cycle that we have on Earth. So I mentioned water. Uh, when we fly by Titan, um, we can watch how our spacecraft trajectory is changed. And that tells us about the bulk uh, density of Titan, of any body that, that, that you fly by. And so it turns out that the bulk density of uh, Titan is less than two grams per cubic centimeter. And what that means is that there's an awful lot of water, either water ice or liquid water on that planet. Earth's by, Earth, by the way, which is a fairly rocky planet, <clears throat> has a uh, mean density of a about five and a half grams per cubic centimeter. So Titan is less rocky with more water. And the models that we have suggest that somewhere below the surface, it is quite likely that there's a liquid ocean. Perhaps it is liquid water mixed with hydrocarbons. Perhaps at some point is, is just liquid water, but there is a possibility. There is a possibility that life exists below the surface in, aqu in, in aquifers uh, on Titan, which I think just adds to the, you know, the interest in this amazing body. Absolutely. Well, why am I talking about Voyager and Cassini? My goodness, the, the entire world is abuzz with J James Webb Space Telescope. Um, and what we, generally think of James Webb as is a, an, an instrument that's going to show us the beginning of the universe, or very, very soon after the beginning of the universe, the first galaxies that have formed and how galaxy evolution happened and what is dark matter and all of these big, big questions. But in fact, uh, there are um, uh, scientific objectives for James Webb in our own solar system. Uh, we recently saw, I think it was an engineering um, uh, instrument that uh, took a picture of um, uh, Jupiter in the uh, 
what was it, maybe two to three micron range. So um, uh, what about Titan? And it turns out that uh, here are the four instruments that um, uh, James Webb will use. Uh, near cam uh, camera, which also has uh, spectroscopy capabilities, the near spec, near, uh, near infrared spectrometer and a mid infrared spectrometer and then the, then the um, engineering or, or, or um, navigation camera. And uh, if you looked at the graph down below here, you can see uh, each one of these little squares is a pixel on, the, on James Webb. And so we can get at least eight, depending upon uh, how you define the surface, maybe 10 or so pixels across the disk of Titan, which means we're going to have spatial resolution. Uh, Titan moves less than six milli arc seconds per second across the sky. James Webb can slew at 30 milli arc seconds uh, per second, so no problem there. With a pointing stability of 0.05 arc seconds and uh, Titan's diameter is uh, 0.7 arc seconds. And so um, we can get some very nice data from James Webb looking at Titan. And I'm so excited to see some of the first uh, images and spectra uh, to see what James Webb can do. I, I don't know when that's going to occur. I haven't heard about tar Titan being targeted yet, but I, I know that that will be in the, um, in the solar system package. Well, looking a little further into the future, uh, Dragonfly, the um, uh, Johns Hopkins University Applied Physics Laboratory, uh, won the contract to send Dragonfly to Titan. This is a drone that they're going to land on the surface of Titan. That's cool. They're, they'll use um, uh, parachutes here. Remember, the atmosphere of Titan is very thick. It's not only denser at the surface, it's much more extended than Earth's atmosphere. So parachutes make a lot of sense. And once it, you get to the surface there, um, this drone will actually fly around and sample the atmosphere, fly to different places, sample the surface, be able to sample some of the liquid hydrocarbons on the surface, give us a lot more information about that. Dragonfly is going to launch in 2007, and uh, it's gonna take uh, about um, seven years, uh, cruise, cruise phase until it reaches Titan in 2034. So um, yeah, we have to be patient, but that's gonna be an exciting time. Um, and finally, I just wanna make the point that uh, even though Titan is very cold right now with, with an atmospheric haze that obscures the surface and uh, uh, obscures a lot of the sunlight that does, the little bit of sunlight that does reach the surface, um, at some point in the not too distant future, well, six billion years from now, uh, our sun will become a red giant after it uses up all of its hydrogen fuel and, and has um, uh, started converting helium to carbon in its core. And as it does that, it will expand. You, I'm sure many of you all know this and engulf the, um, uh, the orbits of uh, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and possibly Mars. So it's gonna be a bad day for us but the ultraviolet flux from the sun will, will uh, drop significantly, which means the atmosphere of Titan will, will clear up. The sun will be much larger, pumping out uh, photons from a much larger surface area, hmm. which means that it's going to be much warmer in the outer solar system. And I'm thinking, uh, and here's a, this is a paper by um, Ralph Lorenz, uh, Jonathan Lunin and Chris McKay back in 1997, Titan under a red giant sun, perhaps all of that frozen water on Titan will become liquid water at that time. The hydrocarbons and nitriles, which exist, um, can exist in liquid form on, under the cold temperatures we have now, they will go back into the atmosphere and maybe ocean front property is where you wanna be on Titan in 6 billion years. If you're interested, mm -hmm. see me after the talk. So in summary, um, wait, I thought I had a, here we go. Okay, Earth has poles and polar processes, right? Seasons, lakes, rivers, lots of water, clouds and precipitation, smog and biotic chemistry. Titan has poles and polar processes, 
Uh, in fact, you can see on this image here, it's slightly darker at about the, about, about the one o'clock uh, position. That's called the North Polar Hood on Titan. Um, it has seasons, lakes, rivers, lots of water, clouds and precipitation, smog, biotic in parentheses, perhaps prebiotic chemistry. So I think I can, I think, I hope I've made the case that um, Titan is not only a fascinating world with um, uh, real opportunities to find life, at least um, microbial life, um, and, is, and is a better sister planet for Earth than uh, Venus. And I'll stop there. Absolutely. Yeah, it sounds like uh, it's the logical next, uh, next great leap, you know, for us. Titan, Europa, Mars, very high ticket items, which is why we're, NASA is spending millions of your tax dollars to go there. Right. I'm trying to figure out how I can't, I can't plan a vacation in two weeks and lose planning a vacation in several billion years. <laughs> trying to think ahead. That's right. Well, Lou, thank, thank goodness there's people like you who are thinking ahead. And, uh, you know, I think that, uh, you know, a, a, a life search mission to Titan is, is certainly where I would spend some of my tax dollars if I could just choose where it goes. So. Thank you, Scott. I, I, Scott, I forgot to say I'm very much looking forward. I've, I've got a, a an observatory, a backyard observatory. It's going to be delivered in a month or so. Oh, great! And I'm very much looking forward to putting my five-inch Explore Scientific EDM. Oh, thank you, Lou. Out to, uh, <laughs> thank you. To, uh, look at the sky. That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, thank you. I, I hope to see a photo of it soon. So that, that's great. I think that every telescope deserves its own. Uh, uh, home. It's a little observatory, whether it's your, you know, your balcony, or if you are lucky enough to have a backyard where you can build something, uh, you know, it definitely makes uh, all astronomers uh, much more productive because the scopes are ready to go, you know, so, right? That's, that's the whole idea. Go out, push a button and observe the universe. And away it goes. Lou, thanks again. Thanks for coming on uh, once again to Global Star Party. My pleasure, Scott. All right. Okay. So um, we are going to uh, transition to uh, Professor Kareem Jaff Jaffer from uh, John Abbott College and the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada Montreal Centre. Um, uh, I do not know how many Global Star Parties you've been on. I should probably start keeping track. But, I'm over um, 40 now. Over 40. Wow. Okay. Yep. So that's, that's great. That's great. So that's that's quite a few. I would say that uh, you're definitely more than a regular at this point. So, but um, I am turning it over to you. And uh, thanks for coming on to the hundredth Global Star Party. Thanks, Scott. It's a pleasure to be here. And uh, as usual, I'm going to try to stick to something some close to the theme. But I'm going to start off with a few little bits that I wanted to chat about. Uh, I'm really happy to be here to celebrate the hundredth. Wow, it, it's been it's been quite the journey. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the journey and a little bit about a few of the activities going on. But I do want to start with a land and sky acknowledgement. Uh, we haven't had one yet today. So I wanted to take a few moments to mention that here from Montreal, I'm on unceded lands from the traditional territories of the Mohawk and the Algonquin peoples. And most of the GSP audience has heard me in the past talk about some of these two-eyed seeing stories from Indigenous peoples. And right now, we are in the waning part of the thunder moon and i know in a lot of parts of uh, the northern hemisphere especially here in the western world we are craving that uh, thunder uh, we need it right now to give us some respite from the heat wave that we've got in but we are at the waning gibbous this is a picture from roger hyman from space oddities from yesterday in the uk and we are at the third quarter moon tomorrow and so it's a wonderful moon to watch, but it also gives us the dark skies early in the evening. The other thing for us to keep an eye out for, of course, is the sun. And Roger imaged the sun yesterday. And the reason why I want to share this with you is to share with you some awesome news that I've been putting on Facebook, which is that my son, Ilyas, is currently at Mount Wilson Observatory. He was one of the nine students chosen for the SOAR program, the Summer Observational Astrophysics Retreat. And yesterday he sent me his first observation, which was from the Snow Solar Telescope 
of the sunspots, and they match so well with a slightly rotated version of what Roger had posted earlier in the day. So I was just really happy to see that, that he was starting to do that type of observational note taking. And he wrote to me last night saying that he finally understands RA and DEX. So I asked him to explain it to me when he gets back. Um, but it's a lot of fun to hear these experiences that youth get to have. And we got to do a lot of that over these last couple of days. Uh, Adrian gave us a talk this past Saturday, and several of my students actually watched the YouTube afterwards and sent me questions about wide field astrophotography. And one of them has already gone into the college today and borrowed a DSLR camera for a week so that they can go out and try a few exposures and a few different time settings without a tracker but just to see what they can get when they go out to dark skies. And that's the type of thing we really love to see. And these last few days, one of the big things that we've been doing here in Canada is we've been supporting Shad Canada with outreach from the RASC. So the McGill campus of Shad Canada opened up in 2018 and our Montreal Centre has been supporting them since day one with one type of an observational outing with some informational presentations at the start of the evening. And we got out on the field and we set up telescopes and unfortunately the clouds won. Uh, but towards the end of the night, just as they were heading back to the bus, they got to see the ISS pass over top. They got to see the Summer Triangle. They got to see a little bit of the Big Dipper. And then the waning, oh, almost full moon, rose just as their bus was leaving the campus. And last night, I was reached out by uh, Shad New Brunswick, where they had a speaker cancel, and they asked if I could do a talk on Indigenous astronomy. So I did a two-eyed scene talk for them. And it was a lot of fun to hear a little bit of the perspective from the students. But one of the things that we talked about was the role of light pollution in limiting what we can see of the night sky. And I was, I, I was enjoying today, I got an email from the organizer there, Ian, that on their walk back to the campus, a lot of the students were looking at the lights on campus and analyzing which ones were friendly to the observing of the night sky and to the migration of birds and which ones were not. And so it really does start to show you the impact that our outreach can have. And a lot of that outreach that we've been able to do has come from these global star parties. Now, my own history with the global star party started in December 2020 when I helped my daughter put together her presentation. Tara gave a presentation on observing the Great Conjunction from home. And she talked a little bit about using her telescope in the driveway and what she would see. And Jenna had recruited her as a youth speaker. And since then, I've kind of been really enamored with this this venue of reaching out to a global audience and when i pitched the international astronomy day for gsp 45 scott was absolutely gung-ho and even kind of gave the reins to myself and russell to just go with it and we ended up with this amazing eight-hour program wow. that was just wonderful it, it really just I mean, it, it let us showcase a little bit of what makes the Montreal Center special, but it also let us bring in people from all over the world and even meet so many new friends in the GSP regulars. We followed that up. I stayed online from then and I, I've stayed a regular participant. But as a center, we also hosted the 45 degree star party with Dunedin in New Zealand. And we had such a wonderful time sharing the 45 degree north and the 45 degree south uh, skies. But at the same time, the youth movement was really taking off in the GSPs as well. We had so many youth presenters coming in. Tara came back on to do the Creation Station presentation. And then herself, along with Nicolina, along with Bella and Nathan, they started the Cosmic Generation, which now has the support of the RASC, of the Astronomical League, and especially of Explore Scientific and the Explore Alliance. And so when the next Skies Up issue comes out, you're going to see an entire section by the Cosmic Generation. And so I love seeing that type of a connection with uh, the Global Star Parties. And as Terry mentioned, last week in the Global Star Parties, I talked about these first five images from the James Webb. And we talked a little bit about the science of them. And I know in the second section tonight, there's going to be a little bit more on a couple of these targets. And I'm looking forward as an observer, as a viewer to watching those. But the thing that uh, really struck me is what came out the next day 
Tuesday, they presented these five pictures. On Wednesday morning, they shared infrared images of Jupiter. And when they shared the infrared images of Jupiter, there were a couple of things that really stuck out to me. The first was how bright Europa was with its reflection of the heat, of the light, using that ice surface. And that brightness is really kind of counterimposed by the shadow of Europa being visible there beside the great red spot. And then you can see those rings and those really thin rings around Jupiter are really visible in this mid in, in this mid infrared, mid to low infrared. But this brought back a memory and it's a memory that's rather timely. And I'm a little bit sad that David had to log off right now, but I know he'll be on later. So I'm hoping we can talk to him about this in the next section because it reminded me that we've seen Jupiter in the infrared before, including the rings from the infrared telescope facility for Mauna Kea. But we also saw Jupiter in infrared when Shoemaker-Levy 9 hit. And we saw the infrared heat signatures of those collisions of the many pieces of Shoemaker-Levy 9 hitting Jupiter. And that reminded me that we are at the 28th anniversary of Shoemaker-Levy 9. It struck starting on July 16th, 1994, all the way through to the 22nd. So right now we are right in the window of that anniversary. and We're not going to have another Global Star Party until afterwards. So I just wanted to remind people that not only did we get to watch from the comet discovery to the understanding that the comet had broken up during its previous pass by Jupiter, and then the realization that the trajectory of the comet was going to bring it back to collide with Jupiter the following year. But we were able to then watch the impacts from Earth, even on the night side of Jupiter. And using Hubble, we could identify the plumes as they happen and then follow them over months as the actual motion of the clouds and the storms on Jupiter caused those plumes to dissipate and stretch out. This was incredible. This was one of the first examples to me of just how incredibly useful it was to look at dynamic behavior with these space telescopes. So what I want to talk to you a little bit about today is this idea, oh, sorry, I also wanted to remind everyone that uh, we did, we'd lost June, Jean Shoemaker before, but we lost Carolyn Shoemaker this year. And I was remembered because I'm going to Stellafane this year that up until the early 2000s, the three of them were staples at Stellafane, sharing their love of astronomy with all of the, not just the telescope makers, but also the families and the enthusiasts that would come out there. Uh, so what I wanted to mention to you is realizing what Hubble allows us to do in real time. And now with James Webb up there and all the attention that it's been getting, I wanted to talk about seeing beyond, but look at it in terms of seeing beyond what we can see here on Earth, but then also the importance of using your own instrumentation and your own naked eyes here on Earth. So I thought I'd start off with what my devices are, how I do astronomy here at John Abbott College and in my driveway. And I have a couple of daubs that I use, both a tabletop as well as a base daub, a nice truss one that's a 10 inch mirror. And then at home, I have an eight inch and a six inch. I have a Nexstar that I can use, including for solar photography, like we did for the 2017 partial eclipse. Mm -hmm. And then I have access to a Coronado. I have a DSLR camera and I have binoculars. And bringing all of those things together, I can just get out there and enjoy a little bit of what makes the night sky special. And one of the things I love sharing with students is just watching the moons of Jupiter and Jupiter itself over the span of a few minutes or a few hours or an entire night and watch that orientation of the different moons and see it change over time. And then when you start to access larger and better devices and the institutional knowledge of some of the amateur astronomers who've been doing this for a long period of time, you get better and better at it. When Mars was in opposition using our telescope there, we were able to actually get this view of Mars where you can see structure on the surface of Mars over a long period of time. And we can do that for Saturn and we can pull out the actual gaps in the rings. We can pull out stripes on the surface and we can watch it and stabilize it, learn image processing techniques to get a nice picture out of this. And this is one of the things that I love being able to share with the students, that even though it's a small target, 
And even when you're tracking that small target, just because of the wind, the vibrations on the ground, it will move around in your field of view. There's processing software that can pick out the best frames to use to try to get an image out of this. But it's also just fun to watch and to look at them, whether it's through the IP, so whether it's through electronically assisted astronomy. So you teach them image processing and you learn a little bit of the techniques you can use and the different instrumentation you can use. And then if you want to go one step further, you start to use robotic telescopes. And the RASC has for us a robotic telescope that our classrooms can use that's based out of California. And I've shared with the GSP audience before the wonder in the students when they take that single image and they process the photons and they pull out all the nebulosity, all the gas, even if they blow out the trapezium, they still see such a spread for the Orion Nebula and other targets. And seeing their wonder when they start to realize that you can process these same photons in different ways to pull out different features. And then they get access to some of the wonderful data that's available. And you can see these students start to shine and pull out just what they're looking for. And that's one of the things we were able to do this year with astrophotography techniques in our posters that the students presented at the RASC General Assembly. And then you can start to do science. You can take images of stars and measure the, pho the photometric data and determine the transit of exoplanets. You can also reach out into solar system probes and using those solar system probes, you can identify not just the cloud structures on Jupiter, but also zoom in on single storms. You can use other probes and start to examine other objects like Mars or Saturn or even Pluto using the New Horizons mission data. So you can really start to see beyond the limitations of what you couldn't otherwise capture with a small telescope in your driveway. And then this year, I've been able to go into the National Schools Observatory, as well as the LCO, and I've been able to reach out to telescopes all across the world, which enables my students to even look at Southern Hemisphere targets, which otherwise, you know, we only get to see on the GSPs when Cesar comes on or when Nico shares or Maxi shares or Machado shares, and we get to see their processing of this data. Now, my students get to access those files and image them and process them themselves. And finally, this year, I got to do a project to use satellite data and really look down at the Earth and see the Earth in a whole other light. So this is the Gaspe Peninsula, where my family and I actually vacationed last year for a couple of nights. And we made it all the way out to the coast out here. And this is Per Se Rock. And it's just incredibly gorgeous to go out and look. But then you get to see the topography and you get to see soil uh, um, uh, moisture levels and you get to see vegetation and all of that. And you get to see all of that through the lens of these different satellites orbiting the Earth. That is so cool. Now bring all of that together to seeing beyond and you ask the students, what's your takeaway? And for a lot of them, it's still those moments, showing the equipment and talking about the moon and sharing it with people, setting up a single telescope yourself, just borrowing it, taking it to a community center, setting it up, and you have people coming out in suits after a wedding and showing them the moon, showing them Jupiter and Saturn, and seeing the kids line up, jaws dropped, ignoring the ice cream in their hands because they're getting to see something wonderful and then setting up in the parks with other astronomers and sharing with an entire community or even just setting up on your own driveway and looking at the moon yourself and just taking a moment to enjoy astronomy and seeing beyond what your naked eye can see. Mm. And that's what really, for me, the GSPs is sharing this type of feeling, this type of experience, and this type of, of images that we get to see with the world when you can't be with them in a park together, we do it virtually online. And this is what the students walk away with, that moment under the sky with a telescope, knowing that there's so much out there to see and experience. So from behalf of the Montreal Centre, I want to thank you for a hundred awesome global star parties, and I hope we'll have more than a hundred more, Scott. Yeah, well, thank you. So I'm looking forward to getting to our 200th uh, global star party as well. So um, we uh, uh, will um, 
uh, transition uh, to uh, Charles Ennis. Uh, Charles, do I have this right? He is the current president of the RESC? Yes, he's a longtime board member. He was vice president for the last couple of years. And this year mm -hmm. at the uh, just after the General Assembly, he was voted in as president of our board. Oh, wonderful. And he is uh, apparently an author of like over 20 books. Is that correct? I'll let Charles speak to that. Charles? OK. All right. yeah, well, Charles, okay. we're going to let gonna... you come on. And uh, uh, but uh, thank you for uh, coming on board and uh, talking to us. Um, you're on the 100th Global Star Party. And Charles, I just briefly want to say um, I've enjoyed being a part of the RASC since I joined maybe a few seconds ago, I think. You know, it was a uh, month <laughs> or two and already hitting the ground running, giving talks. So um, awesome. it's, a, it, it's been enjoyable just to be a part of the RASC and I recommend it for anyone who well, I, can join, whether you're from you the States that, or uh, Canada. Very, Glad that you're with us to, to share that uh, with everybody. And uh, I'd like to thank everybody for uh, the opportunity to be here tonight. And I also want to congratulate you all on the 100 TSP. What an amazing accomplishment. Uh, thank you. Along with all the members of the RESC, we wish you the best uh, of fortune with the next 100. It's, uh, it's very exciting. Thank you very uh, much. I have been asked tonight to speak specifically by, by Karima about something that we are doing at the RESC, and I want to share this with you. Come on. I'm trying to get this thing to cooperate. There we go. Okay, so. It's a project of the Inclusivity and Diversity Committee, and it's the World Asterisms Project, which we started just a little over a year ago. And I wanna start first by gratefully acknowledging that I observe and live on the unceded lands of the Seashell First Nation. So what we've done is we've gone out there to look at all the sky cultures of the world. How many so far? 400. And how many asterisms have we collected in the last year with the help of ethnoastronomers all over the world and various other astronomers out there, 9,039, including 311 names of the Milky Way. And this is about whatever is down here is mirrored in the sky. This is a great picture by Mi'kmaq artist, Gerald Glode. And it's about perspectives. It's about showing people that there's ancient science out there and it's about inspiration and we're using the concept of two-eyed seeing that was created by Mi'kmaq elder Albert Marshall back in 2004 which is all about sharing the perspectives of the two cultures it's a reconciliation progress process that or Halifax that are used with the Mi'kmaq and we're using it in our project this isn't just about stick figures in the sky some early civilizations did create these kinds of asterisms but it isn't just stick figures, it's about single star asterisms. In Africa, that's a very common thing where you have each star as a character and a group of stars as an asterism. You've got you know, characters all over the sky who are involved in the story. It's about dark asterisms, which is very common for cultures in the Southern Hemisphere where you have them looking into the Milky Way and looking towards the middle of the galaxy instead of out of it like we are in the Northern Hemisphere and you see all of these dust clouds which become various different things in their sky. And so basically now it's live on the World Asterisms page of the Royal Astronomical Society. It is a handbook with all of those asterisms in it with descriptions of the cultures and the stars involved. It is lists including a PDF and an Excel spreadsheet, which gives you the precise location and notes for finding it yourself along with that list of names in the Milky Way. And it is a cultures resource list that lists all of the cultures, tells you where they are from, and then lists all of the written and online and other resources you can use to learn more about those cultures. That's the link, or you can just go to the RESC website, search box for the World Asterisms Project, enter, and it'll take you to the list, free download. If you're a researcher, get a hold of me because we have a Google Drive where we share this stuff live, where we can work on this project together. And this is a living project because we are constantly making partnerships with First Nations and other groups to help them recover their skies. And 
the, the process of naming skies is, is ongoing. People are still naming stuff up there. This is why inbox looks like just about now. And if you have an asterism you'd like to share, so since I started this project, I've had a number of people get a hold of me and say, well, you know, I would say, I found this asterism. Would you be interested? Absolutely, yes. Because there's a, all, there's a whole big list of telescopic asterisms. It's about 5% of the project. From organizations like the Astronomical League, we're, we're grateful for them sharing their uh, stuff, but people all over the world sharing their views of the sky. And if you'd like to be on that list, we'd like to put you there. So if you want to contact us, World Asterisms Project at RESC, and that's my email there. And I'm just going to stop right there. This has been a very exciting year for, for a whole lot of reasons for the RESC. I, I, I like to, you know, think that we're, we're doing everything that we can to try to get as many people out there involved, um, no matter what their, their situation is. And this is this project that I just mentioned is about celebrating the cultures of the world and inviting people to, to be part of it. And this year's board, the RESC, is the most diverse in all ways that we've ever had. And so mm -hmm. we're, we're very excited about the direction that we're going and uh, we're looking forward to, to working with any of you out there that would like to work with us on projects like this. Wonderful. Fantastic. Fantastic. How many members does the RASC have at this time? We have about 5,430 centers right now spread wow. across Canada. And um, we're all very uh, active with our, with our outreach. Many of our centers have observatories. My center is the Sunshine Coast, um, which is uh, on the west coast of British Columbia. But we're, we're, we're spread from coast to coast. And Kareem mentioned our robotic telescope earlier, which we have down in California, which allows people all over to view the skies. Uh, we're actively working on getting some more as well, because you know, we've got a lot of people lining up for the eyes sure. using the camera. But we're, we're uh, very, very uh, excited about uh, the direction we're going. We have a new Dorner Telescope Museum that's going to be opening in the next year, which features uh, optics from uh, Canadian observers. Okay. History. And um, we've got all kinds of publications that that will make it easy for amateur astronomers to view the sky, like our Observer's Handbook, which uh, which sells thousands of copies. So if, if you're interested in, in uh, becoming a member or you're interested in our project, do uh, give us a shout. We'd be happy to help you. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. And I guess that they would have to know, look no further than the RESC website, which I think is RESC.ca. RES yep. I'll just put that. There. there we go. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Charles. Thank you very much, Scott, for letting me uh, come here today. Yeah, please come back on sometime. I will certainly Anytime. do that. All right, so we're going to go from Canada all the way down to Brazil uh, to uh, Marcello Souza. Marcello is uh, the uh, editor of Skies Up Magazine. He's a powerhouse of uh, astronomy education and astronomy awareness in, in the Americas. Uh, he's based in Brazil, um, and he's a very creative guy. I mean, he's, he's done everything from help create uh, Brazil's first dark Sky Park to uh, putting on astronomy events at malls uh, that look like you're driving into like an astronomy drive-in, you know? So I think that is so cool. Um, but he inspires uh, people young and old um, and uh, very, very pleased, very honored to have Marcello Souza on the 100th Global Star Party. Marcello, it's thank all up to you. Thank you very much for the invitation, Scott. Thank you for the kind words. and. Uh, 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 I received to next uh, last week uh, information that was fantastic for us because the experience we have with a drive-in of astronomy in a shopping center here in Brazil was received a prize as the second best experience in shopping centers in all the country. Oh, then wow. something fantastic, you know, that science can win a prize. Uh, 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 with uh, outreach activities 
in shopping centers. Né? The other prizes were associated with shoppings and the activities that help to, to sell more things. And we received the, the prize to, because we developed a, a project. We not, the shopping center that received the prize. That's so awesome. That's <laughs> for this project, that is something fantastic for us. Yes. I, I, as it is, and the congratulations, Scott, for the uh, same 100. Uh, yeah, Marcello, everybody keeps program. congratulating me, but it's it's really all the people that pull together to make Global Star Party happen, you know, so I'm just the guy that connects the wires together, so. But, but you are the responsible for that. Thank you so much. Thank and you. and uh, I, I have, today I wrote a script <laughs> to uh, not to be a, a long presentation and uh, I have a script here okay. to help me. Uh, I will share my screen. Okay. Only to illustrate what I'm saying. Yeah. This is the links for our astronomy group here in Brazil. Yeah. And the, since ancient times, humans being have been trying to develop ways to obtain images that accurately reveal their observations of the sky. Images of the sky of the observed phenomenon stars recorded for posterity. In ancient Greece, there are already reports of knowledge of the technique for produce, producing images by directing the passage of light through a small hole. Jurifis camera obscura. However, they were images only to be observed when observing the landscape. Here is the only illustration that I have for this Arab, that is Al Hazen. His full name is Abu Ali Al Hassan Ibn Al Haytam. Uh, he lived in the 10th century and presented a way of observing eclipses using a camera obscura. In this case, the camera obscura consists of a room with a small hole in the window. The amazing form of the world. wall. This method allowed the magnification of the image of the sun and a comfortable and safe observation of the solar eclipse. The records of the observed image, however, were still made through drawings and paintings. Here is Galileo. And Galileo Galilei released the image of his observation through uh, drawings. That way, it was possible to get an idea of his observations. In the drawings he made, he showed the position of the Jupiter moons, the phase of Venus, the tails of the moon, and Saturn. He couldn't get enough resolution to observe Saturn's rings. And something that's fantastic for me were the ancient maps, the sky maps. Right? The sky map with representation of how different civilizations saw the constellations, a record that were left by many people. In the West, during a long period, great artists were responsible for representing, representing the constellations. Be beautiful maps of yes. the sky were produced, works of art, with creative and beautiful designs for each of the constellations. These are some of these ancient sky maps that uh, were made by fantastic artists. I can see here some of them. And the dream persisted of one day being able to accurately record the observed celestial image. In 1826, the French Joseph Nicephor Nippes obtained the first photography, that is this one that I'm showing here. It was an image from his window the beginning of a revolution. It was supposed to make accurate records of the moments lived, image for posterity without depending on the precision, technique, and talent of drawing of a human being. In 1840, the American chemist and photographer, John William Drape, obtained what is considered the first as photography. That is this one here. He recorded for the first time in a photography the image of the moon. In 1880, his son, Henry Drape, first obtained a photography of the Orion Nebula. Since that time, 
the record of image of the sky has been improved to obtain images with details that you cannot, you can't perceive with the direct observation of the universe. Techniques with well developed that allow the recording of images of very tenuous stars. In order to obtain good images of these stars, it was necessary to have a, photograph or a photographic film of excellent quality and with special characteristics. I, I am the time that we use this kind of cameras. I use many times these manual cameras to take pictures, and I lost many pictures because of the lights when I opened the camera. Then it was uh, for many people, young people, they don't know what was the beginning of the photography. And a long exposure time was necessary for the photographic film to be sensitized by the faint light captured. Due to the rotation of the Earth, it was necessary at all times to move the telescope so that it continued to face the star being observed. Those motors were developed to be coupled to telescopes in order to allow tracking of the star for a long period, compensating for the Earth's rotation movement. Nowadays, it is used digital cameras to obtain images of the universe. This is what you have in our daily life. Yeah? And digital astrophotography is a new way of obtaining beautiful images of the sky. And the, this is uh, something fantastic for the amateur astronomers that they do, that are making a, a fantastic contribution in this area. Now, everything that I said until now is because I have Brazilian poetry here that I, 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 I translate to English and I will try to read. Uh, then nowadays, geez, uh, every day, we are surprised with new and wonderful images of the universe obtained with the use of large and modern telescopes. We now have a newer and more powerful, powerful set device for observing the sky, the James Webb Space Telescope. We now observe the sky in almost the entire electromagnetic spectrum, where we even heard the stars. And the Brazilian poet, Olavo Bilac, who wrote one of the most beautiful and famous poems in the Portuguese language. The name of the poem is Via Láctea, that means Milky Way. I, I translate it to, to English, and as it is a a special program, I will try to read because it uh, is fantastic. Then uh, this is poem. Now you say, hear the stars, right? You have lost your sense. And I will tell you, however, that to hear them, I often wake up mm. and I open the windows pale with astonishment. And we talked all night while the Milky Way, like an open canopy, twinkles. And when the sun came, longing and weeping, I still look for them in the desert sky. You will now say, foolish friends, what conversations with them? What sense do you have what they say? when they are with you, and I will say to you, love to understand them. Only those who love can have ear, able to hear and understand the stars. This is something that uh, I don't know if in English uh, sounds like in Portuguese, but it's a fantastic poem. Mm. And now we hear the, the stars. Huh? And Love Bilac wrote this before the radio astronomy. That's something fantastic. Yeah? And every day we observe more distant stars located tens, hundreds, thousands, and millions of light years from Earth. Photons traveling on a long journey to reach us. The famous Brazilian poet, Mario Quintana, who wrote in one of his poems, And the wind passes outside with your memory blank. What he saw, he does not even remember. And I saw nothing, 
I can only guess. Then we just guess what's happening to the universe and we formulate theories to unravel its mysteries. Well, is I hope one day you have more information about the universe. And each day we know more about the universe and we have models, more accurate models that help us to understand what you see, what's happening. Thank you, Scott. Oh, thank you. Thank you for sharing all the poetry with us. It was wonderful. Very nice. Thank you. Very and nice. congratulations for the... Yeah, the oh, congratulations to all the presenters here. This is really wonderful. So, And thank you so much yeah. for all that you do, Marcello. You're a real, yeah. real inspiration. Thank you yeah. so much. Okay. And it's my pleasure to be here. Yeah. <laughs> Always a pleasure to have you. All right. So um, we are going to keep uh, moving right along here. Um, uh, Marcello... Uh, 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 is, um, you know, you need to watch, watch Marcello's websites and also, uh, his Facebook page, uh, which is, um, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, uh, club de astronomia and, um, or the, excuse me, the club, um, uh, remind me Marcello, which one it is. It's the, uh, uh astronomy club, Louis Cruz. Right. Okay. Louis Cruz. Okay. That is a Louis a, Cruz. Yeah. A Belgian astronomer that he came to Brazil and he was one of the first director of the National Observatory in Brazil. Yeah. Louis Cruz. C R U Z. Yes. Okay. So, anyways, thank you so much again. Um, uh, we are moving on uh, from Brazil over down to Argentina. Uh, we have uh, uh, Nicolas Arias with us. Uh, he is a uh, musician, a drummer. Um, and uh, so we like to call his show Hammer Time with Nico, but because he is known as Nico the Hammer. But he is an amazing, <laughs> amazing astrophotographer and astronomer. And um, it's great to have you on uh, Global Star Party, our 100th edition. Thanks, Nico. Hi, Scott. Thank you so much. Uh, happy 100 CSP yeah, for, you. for everyone. For everyone. It's, a, it's a really nice to be here with you. And uh, uh, this was, a, a, from the beginning to now, a really nice CSP. And I think that all the presentations uh, converging that the, the the, the main thing that brings us here that is to share the experience to to show uh, about our equipments uh, or the humanity equipments and, and and share this patient and show how we do the, the photograph the observations and the studies everything and and this is really really nice uh, let me share my screen Okay, here we go. Can you see it? Yes, we can. Okay, okay. Well, uh, I think that there was a, a lot of things to, to share in these past weeks. I I wasn't in the GSP, but the shame web telescope. Let's uh, move on, guys. Here I am. <laughs> So I, I I will try to, to share some personal things and and to talk about the, the change web. Uh, at first I, I want to share with you that uh, my patio, still of the Banfield, uh, finally gets the observatory code from the Minor Planet Center. I am really happy with this. Uh, a few weeks ago I get the, the confirmation. Uh, so we have a new observatory here in Argentina. Uh, so this is a really a, a really nice uh, thing for me. And uh, as I say, I uh, with with the James Webb Telescope images, uh, one in particular is about a Dian star that is the Planetary Nebula NGC three one three two. 
that it's a, a beautiful planetary nebula that here in the southern hemisphere, uh, we, we, we have this particular nebula really high in the sky uh, uh, for the, I think the from beginning from the winter here. And uh, this is an observation that I made from my house. Uh, I have a Bortle 9 sky here. But with the Dobson and using a filter, uh, the oxygen tree filter, uh, you can see this nebula. It's, it's stunning to watch this nebula because, as you see, this is a sketch, an observa observational sketch I made. You can see that you can watch uh, not only the, the main star and the, the ring, but you can see some some ring uh, at behind, uh, like uh, another nebula behind. It's, it's, really, it's really nice to, to spend time observing these kind of objects and this nebula in particular. And uh, this is a picture that I take uh, with my Dobson, uh, with my hand like a Dobson and making LRGB composition. Uh, I, I mean, I make the, the four uh, captures moving my dub, uh, the, the light with no filter and the RG and B uh, filters with the mono camera. And you can see that you can watch something like the sketch, but obviously with a better uh, definition and, and the colors. And this is uh, with, with the dub shown. And uh, this is a comparison about the same nebula with the Hubble. Uh, I mean, this is this image is, is stunning. When I watch the nebula, I, I always remember this Hubble, this Hubble image. Uh, but now uh, we we reach a new glasses and <laughs> and we can watch and observe this amazing image from the James Webb Telescope. And it's, uh, when I when I saw this picture the other day in the live transmission of NASA, I was shocked because it's it's amazing not only the the details on the nebula, the the galaxies around the image is is stunning, and it's really nice that uh, they pick uh, objects that you can observe and you can capture from your house with your small telescope. And, and the comparison, it, I, I love to, to do that comparison. I said, okay, this is the stunning image of the James Webb telescope, the Hubble image telescope, and this is our image of the same object. It's really there, it's, it's amazing. And of course, uh, the, the Saturday night, I, I get my, my Saturn bonus track for the GSP. And I, I want to show, this is a, a video that I captured from Saturn that you can watch the hand tracked <laughs> uh, movement. And uh, for every planetary capture, I need to do uh, these videos that one and a half minutes, four times, because I have a monoc monochromatic camera so I take uh, this shot with no filter, and then I make the four extra videos with the R, G, and B filter to get uh, these four images. It was a, a, a nice night. It wasn't the better night, but it was really nice. You can see some details in every channel. And uh, this is the result when I shine every channel, you can see even the, a few moons there. And we are about 20 days out the Saturn's opposition. So it's Saturn night uh, from here. So, well, Scott, this was my, my little presentation. I know- Nico, thank you so much. Thank there you. is a, a lot of people. To... <laughs> yes, it's great to have you on and uh get your perspective on astronomy. Wonderful. Okay. Yes, Thank you so much. 
All right, so our next speaker is, we go from Argentina back up to Canada, uh, to uh, uh, Quebec, uh, to Mr. Norman Fulham, who makes the world's largest uh, telescopes for amateur astronomy uh, with the, uh, the famous uh, uh, Fulham folded Newtonian reflector telescopes. And, uh, but I think what's even more amazing is just uh, Norman's own life journey and the way that, uh, he found his path through music and then by gazing at the stars and finally through making his own incredible instruments. Norman um, is, uh, uh, you know, honored. Uh, yeah, it was an honor for me to work with him uh, in establishing Explore Scientific as the um, distributor for uh, the Optique Fulham uh, product line here in, in the Americas and with the exception of Canada, of course, but, but uh, uh, really, I, I admire Norman. I think that he is uh, uh, one of the most amazing telescope builders in the world today. And uh, he's a great friend, very friendly and extremely talented, uh, both uh, with his skills at making uh, telescopes, uh, making optics and solving problems, but uh, he does beautiful music too. So Norman, thanks for coming on Global Star Party. Well, thank you very much, Scott, for inviting me for the 100 uh, G GSP. Uh, I've been part of the GSP uh, a few times in the past and I always enjoyed the presentation that uh, all the great uh, speakers are coming and sharing their experience and they're sharing their, their passion about astronomy. Uh, it's it's a, a very large family around the world that share that, that love of the universe and uh, the passion of uh, whatever is out there. So the, the theme of today's GSP is seeing beyond. And this is kind of an open open uh, subject for uh, that can include any, anything in life, uh, seeing beyond yourself, seeing beyond your possibility, your capability, seeing uh, past the, uh, the view that we have. And um, we saw James Webb's telescope possibility, seeing beyond what we, we thought was possible. But I would like to come back to myself. Uh, Apply, uh, seeing beyond myself, that's what brought me to what I'm doing right now today. Um, before I will start my, it's not a presentation, it's just a talk that I will do about me and uh, what got me to where I am right now. Um, I have to think about my father uh, mm. that taught me to see beyond what I, what I can do, what, what's possible to do with my two hands. Uh, he mm. was a very, very handy man. Uh, doing all kinds of stuff by himself. Uh, he was not a, a mechanic, he was not a, a woodworker, but he was able to do all those things that we just looked at him and said, how did he know what to do in that situation or this part of the uh, of a mechanical part of a, of a car or whatever? So he always amazed me when, I, and uh, he passed away many, many years ago. I was still in my 20s, very early 20s, but when I was very young, like uh, from 10 years old up to 20, uh, that's the part that we was building a new house and I really got to, to see uh, how intense it can be, it could be, and how uh, his imagination got him to do crazy things very amazing thing that you wouldn't think that was possible at those days. So when I think about that, I think my inspiration, my, my, the way I see beyond when I first started to make uh, telescopes was, I was thinking about my father. Uh, he said, nothing is impossible. You got two hands like everybody else. And if someone makes something, he's got two hands too. So he can do the same thing. Uh, before I will, I will go any further, I would like to, well, you, everybody knows pretty much that I'm a, I'm a music maker, I, I play guitar and I sing. I would like to sing a song uh, for my father, for that. Oh, uh, pretty nice. Sure everybody knows that song. It's a Cat Stevens song called Father and Son. So I brought my old 12 strings here today and um, just wanted to know if the sound is good, it's not too loud. The guitar sound is okay. 
Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. So here it goes. It's not time to make a change. Just relax, take it easy. You're still young, not your fault. There's so much you have to go through. Find a girl, settle down. And if you want, you can marry. But look at me, I am old, but I'm happy. I was once like you are now, and I know that it's not easy to stay calm when you find something's going on. Take your time, think a lot, think of everything you've got, for you will still be here tomorrow, but your dreams may not. How could I try to explain? Cause when I do it turns away again It's always in the same, same old story From the moment I could talk I was ordered to listen now There's a way And I know But I have to go away I know I have to go It's not time to make a change. Just relax, take it slowly. You're still young, that's your fault. There's so much you have to go through. Find a girl, settle down. And if you want, you can marry. Look at me, I am old, but I'm happy. All the time that I've cried, keeping all the things I knew inside it's hard but it's harder to ignore it if they were right I'd agree but it's them they know not me now there's a way and I know but I have to go away I know <laughs> so, yeah, so uh, my father was a big, big influence in my youth, and he still is uh, because uh, uh, you know, uh, Scott, uh, since I started, everything I have made so far in mm. terms of making in my business here, I had to do it myself. Yes. Build the machine, build my, my Foucault tester, build my tunnel, build everything. Your coding machine, your polishing machines. Polishing everything, everything. done. And people <laughs> come here and said, man, you're crazy. You, 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 <laughs> how do you think about those things, how to do this? I mean, it's, it's just, I think, seeing beyond our possibility. Okay. It's, uh, I yes. see myself doing stuff that uh, right now that 20, 10 years ago, I wouldn't even dream about doing, doing. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Everything is possible. And, um, and astronomy, the same thing, the, the universe is so immense. So there's so many possibility in the, up there and down here on earth, uh, we have everything that we can work with to, to make it, uh, to make it happen also. So when we just look at the at the uh, the advancement in the technology that in the last 10 20 years 30 years it's amazing and what 
if you think in 100 years from now, 200 years from now, where will be, where we, we will be? Oh, where, where will we of, be? What exactly. kind of, a, what kind of a science would we will develop? What kind of, of a rocket or satellite we will be able to build yeah. then in 200, 300 years from now? So seeing yeah. beyond, it's not just seeing beyond what's there, it's seeing beyond in, in the future. And my mm -hmm. approach, or like, like Scott now, and my approach on astronomy, I'm a visual observer. I have the most respect for the astrophotograph, for the people that do all the astrophoto. I, I bow my head to them. It's unbelievable what they can do now. But my thing, it's always been visual observing. Uh, to see it with my eyes, what's out there through an eyepiece, and uh, and the more the more that I want to see, the bigger the telescope has to be. So that's that's yeah. how I got to to so large telescope that I built, and those large telescopes are mainly built for visual observing. The folded Newtonian was meant to be an instrument for large aperture, but to be safe first to, to the observer, instead of being at 20, 20, 25 uh, feet off the ground to observe at the eyepiece, uh, the folded system makes it much safer to be about eight feet from the ground and uh, you still have the same aperture telescope. Okay, you, you, you're not doing astrophoto, you're not a stacking image to get all the colors and deep uh, texture that you would have in the picture. But your imagination, when you look at the IP, yeah. let's say, look at M45, M42 in a 42, in a 50 inch telescope by eye. Okay. Oh. I yeah. it, uh, and it's like, I still have the image here. I close my eyes that I can see it because I was so mesmerized by the depth of the image that I was seeing, the detail that I could, if I kept looking and looking, looking in area of the, of the image, I could go see details and details and the 3D effect. And the, it's amazing what the eyes and the, the brain can do, uh, not just looking to it and then next object, next object. No, if you take time to look at an object visually and you can detect details that you, you wouldn't think that would be, would be visible by your naked eye, but it is. So uh, my, vis my experience at telescope is visual. Uh, I wish I was able to uh, share my experience more, uh, but lately in the last, last five, 10 years, I've been so busy developing those big telescopes that I, my, uh, my presence in uh, star parties and uh, gathering or even outreach uh, was, was a little less because I have not time. I, there's only 24 hour, hours in a day. And, uh, but I wish I could eventually slow down a bit and then take more time and observe more than, than, than I'm doing right now. Uh, and I would like to thank Scott to make it, uh, to make my telescope more visible, uh, to present my, my work uh, through his website, through his company, uh, to make people know that it's, it's feasible, it's there, it's available on the market. Yes. In the past, in the, ten years ago, looking for a forty or fifty inches telescope for and that was yeah. <laughs> not possible. Very, well, impossible, but you know, but not not exactly. very easily obtainable. That's exactly. Right. So now it's there, and uh, being uh, I know Scott that you are uh, passionate about astronomy as much as I am. Yes, you love to observe visually also. Yes, uh, it's very heartwarming for me to know that you accepted to be uh, my representative. It's, uh, I, don't, I don't have to explain it, but it's very- Yeah, yeah, but thank you, thank you. Thank you very thank much. You. you could have chosen anyone, so thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. It's an honor, um, yeah. I don't have any presentation of, of Facebook or anything uh, to show you guys, only uh, I want to explain that music and astronomy for me are just like this, they're both together. Uh, music is by is sound waves, uh, light wave and sound waves are similar. Uh, I think uh, every where I go in Star Party, I always bring my guitar and I try to I make music because it's part of me, and I think people enjoy it because it's so soothing and oh, yeah. goes well with uh, observing the, the universe. So I I will like to play a second song. Okay.
before I go because uh, I told Scott I have a meeting with a Zoom meeting with Australia right after. So okay. I cannot stay it very long. Uh, Australia yes. at nine o'clock tomorrow morning. That's right. That's right. So, uh, Wonderful. I had to postpone for about an hour the meeting, but uh, to be able to be here. Oh, uh, thank you so much. Thank you for inviting me for the 100th uh, winter star, uh, not a winter star, but a global star party. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you so um, much, Norman. That's a it's song wonderful. that I think um, Star Must would like to hear uh, in a few months, in a month and a half, I think. Yeah, that's right. You packed my bag last night, pre flight. Zero hour, ninety am I'm gonna be high, 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 high as a guide by then. I miss the earth so much. I miss my wife. It's lonely out in space. Such a time, let's fly. I think it's gonna be a long, long time. A long dream here and get through time. I'm not the man they think I am at home. Oh, no, no, no. I'm a rocket man. Rocket man burning all the fuse out there. Alone. Ain't the kind of place to raise your kids. In fact, it's cold as hell, and there's no one there to raise them. If you did, and all that science, I don't understand. Five days a week, Rocket Man. I think it's gonna be a long, long time. Don't come bring me around, get you fine. Not the man they think I am. Oh, no, no. I'm a Rocket Man. Rocket man burning all the fuse out there alone. And I think it's gonna be a long, long time. And I think it's gonna be a long, long time. And I think it's gonna be a long, long time. With that, thank you. guys, thank you. I'm observing, and uh, hopefully, uh, we'll see each other live eventually. Yes, and yes, we will. Observing together. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you so much. Thank you, Norman. That was great. What a wonderful way to end uh, <laughs> the first part one of the Global Star Party. Um, we are going to stay on the air here with you. Uh, we, uh, you'll see an extended uh, intermission period, about 45 minutes, and then we come back on at seven o'clock and we have um, uh, come back on with David Levy. Uh, David Eicher from Astronomy Magazine will be on with us, Molly Wakeling, um, uh, Daniel Higgins, Jason Genzel, the vast reaches, uh, Daniel Barth from How Do You Know uh, will be on with us, and young Connell Richards will be on. John Briggs, uh, the uh, it, it, with the Alliance of Historic Observatories, will be with us. Cesar Brello from Argentina, uh, uh, young Navin uh, Sentil Kumar, uh, Karina Lutelier from Ch from Chile will be with us. Deep Tea from Nepal, uh, Adrian Bradley. And, um, and that we may have some surprises at the very end, but uh, um, do we want to uh, 
Maxie, how are we with um, uh, with uh, uh, images? You want to show an image before we go? Hi, everyone. Well, first of all, uh, good night. And well, it's a pleasure to be here in the 100 events. And I really enjoy that kind of music, Norman. It was <laughs> very, very, very I was good. singing with him right at the very end there. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I played the guitar too, but not like you. <laughs> uh, I, I, it's more like a, a like I do astrophotography too, but I think in the astro is going me well. But uh, you know, I I really love that sound of that guitar, particularly, and of course those songs, those, those uh, yeah songs that you played. Uh, uh, I know, and I also. Uh, when you you play the, the first one, uh, I and what? Well, uh, well what deep, I I deep actually song. the deep song. <laughs> yes, it's a really deep song. Yeah, uh, here in Argentina we have another two. Uh, the last month we have the the Parents' Day, and I I don't sing. I play the guitar, but I ask to my father that I uh, song, uh, sing with me. A, a particular song is is a particular song here in Argentina uh, because it's dedicated to your old man, your tu viejo, for example. But well, it was like a, I, I always wanted to do that, and well, uh, it was very emotional. Right on. So well, I'm struggling with my network connection. I have my Wi-Fi going on, then goes off, and. Well, I was pointing to. Let me share my screen for, okay. for a moment. I think now the connection is stabilized. So let me. Okay. Do you see it? Hello? Hello. Ah, okay. No, I think <laughs> because I was sharing the screen, the connection goes off. Well, uh, here in this case, I was pointing to the the, the Southern Ring ne uh, Nebula, and I think I have the, the, the focus because, well, it's going down right now, but let me see if I can go focus right now because I, I have my, my motor and I can do here inside. So let me show you how I do it. You can see here is the is very bubble the star. So here in the option of the focuser, I do some steps, and then it will go into to get more pointless, I think. And let's put it more fast. Let's see. Oh, there you go. And a little bit more, I think now. Yeah, uh, I was configuring and I set up and then the connection goes really bad. But let's see in there. I think now it's OK at 0.5 seconds. It's OK. So let's stop this. And now we're going to take a, a, a one minute picture of the Southern Ring Nebula before it goes off in the horizon here. So, well, basically, uh, now I have my setup uh, in, in my bike yard in Chivilgo, in Argentina, uh, but I'm controlling in this software plus tax uh, um, to, to do everything. Uh, except the polar alignment because I had to be outside, but then to the the, the go to the guiding the focus and the the the, the, the here. So uh, well, uh, like I told you more early, Scott. It's a pleasure mm -hmm. to be here. You know, thank you. It's, it's a long very long 
Tuesdays that we passed and it's like it was the last month. And seeing that, you know, 100 events, of course, I, I think I started in the 30 events. I, I, I don't remember as well, but, oh, sorry. Well, here we have, but I think the, no, the, I don't know what happened. Let's go to another picture. But I think this was the the fall the yeah the motors maybe my dog passed through the one leg of the tripod <laughs> I have three outside so maybe that happened and well like I say it was it's it's really an honor to to be here for a couple of minutes uh, I want to do some. Uh, live views of uh, some objects that the James Webb Telescope take or took, sorry, and to compare of that pictures and what we see here uh, in the natural and uh, normal level of an astrophotographer, uh, particularly. But anyway, you know, I did this particularly Nebula with uh, with myself and I remember and my, my Maxuto it was I don't remember the date well, I don't know what's happening let me see oh, or maybe the, the the guiding is not working very well Now you know it's the the guidance system. Something is wrong. Could, could be wind. Stop. Oh, maybe yeah. Uh, it was it, it wasn't really too windy. I I didn't went in a half an hour, but maybe it's the wind. Here's the the guidance system. Uh, is a uh, base in PhD two, and. Of course, it does the multiple stars following and the principal star that select from them. And here we have the, the graph. You know, uh, maybe maybe it's too low, and now the, the telescope is pushing down. Maybe that's also too. Let's take a, a thirty seconds picture. Here in, in the five seconds, you know, it's a lot of field of view for that single star and the shape of the ring nebula, but. Do you remember the picture of the James Webb Telescope and also the picture that Nico showed you yes. a, a minute ago? So yes. it's really stunning to even watch that picture that has that particular galaxy that remembers the needle galaxy, but it's maybe in there, I think, in, and, I, and I couldn't even see it. So here we go. Now that, that's not now it's getting very good. So well, uh, and also if the if the audience is watching and want to see some southern objects right now, let me know it and let's see if I can find it and let's see what we can do. Okay. So Scott, I I come back to you again. Okay, okay. Well, we will take a break. Um, so for those of you who are watching, uh, please, um, uh, you know, get some, some uh, dinner. Uh, we've got a whole night ahead of us of, uh, of Global Star Party, our 100th event. Uh, uh, you know, as I mentioned earlier, we're coming up on part two. So we've got about uh, a little over half an hour uh, and we'll be back at 7 p.m. Central, but we will still be on the air uh, here with this intermission. So hang in there. Maxi, did you already look at 47 Tucani? Um, sorry. I op open the. Uh, do you hear me, Adrian? 
Yes, I just unmuted. Yes, I can hear. Okay, now I have the, this issue in, in the internet. Uh, if I can point to 47 to Canada, let me see, but I don't think so because it's really low at the east right now. But let me show, let me see if, if I can find it. Uh, uh, no problem. Uh, So what's up, man? How how are you going? How you doing? I am hanging in there. Uh, did a little outreach today. It was fun. We had a young Girl Scout troop. Um, we had five different groups, and we pointed the uh, solar scope at the sun. They all got to see it. Some of them were able to see the prominences and the uh, the uh, sunspots that were on there. So it was a really good day. Oh, excellent. Man. That's that's really cool because you know also uh, the sun right now is having a, a activity that two years ago it was nothing. Of course, if you have this uh, H alpha telescope, it's great. But <laughs> yeah, it, yeah, it doesn't it doesn't see much if you are using a battery filter only. Um, I'm searching 47 to Canada, but I think it's really low. Now it's it's pointing to the south, and maybe it's uh, almost uh, 50 degrees above the horizon. So maybe let's see more more later. Uh, no, yeah, that's okay clear. if we at, can't see it. It'll at at mid at midnight maybe. Okay. Um, I and and I can't even point to the this particular gal galaxy cluster. I I cannot uh, point to that area, but okay. because it, it's also it's very low. Um, maybe I can go to the Carina and. And you will see this region of the um, Gabriela Mistral Nebula that also show in the, the James Webb Telescope. But, but that sounds um, good. Yeah, maybe I, I think I'm going to there to to see, or maybe some galaxies. You know, I have Omega Centauri also too, uh, to 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 points right now um the m83 well i have this ngc 5367 i don't know i i couldn't open the um, the youtube i don't know if the audience asks so for some objects too mm -hmm. what's up um uh, let's Check it out. Oh, yeah. there he is, the man. Ah, the, Daniel. The legend. <laughs> What's going on, fellas? Coming from New York City. <laughs> How you doing? Astro yeah, from that TV. How's it Coming going? Coming from Arizona. Just as important, we have the return of the noble David. There he is. <laughs> Hola, David. Chat Hola, with us. Adrian. Hi, everybody. What's going Happy on? anniversary of the the the, the comet that was the a couple of days ago for Jupiter. You know, I I remember that, and I, I say, oh, I had to to say uh, my greetings to David in the next GSP. Yeah, <laughs> and it's uh, yesterday was the 25th anniversary of Gene's tragic death, Gene Shoemaker, in a car accident in Australia. So it's 27, 28 years since SO9, since the major impact took place oh. on July 18, 1994. Wow. Okay, so, so I, I remember that. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's two. Yeah, so a little, little bit of tragedy, but also um, fond memories, I'm sure, of uh discovering the comet 
and realizing what it was going to do before the rest of us would see it uh, covered. And if I'm not mistaken, was Hubble the telescope that covered or that was used to see the impact site? Hubble, or the impact was, the, sites? Hubble was one of the first telescopes to see the impacts. And it was certainly as the best telescope we had at the time, the fact that it was concentrating on Jupiter during that entire week was really, really something. And we owe, I owe a debt of gratitude to NASA for collecting all of this wonderful information about what a comet can do when it hits a planet. Awesome. So we, we should say to Wade Prunty, who uh, chatted in from Facebook, how are you doing, Wade? We see you, we see you out there. Yeah, it looks like only the Facebook is getting me uh, the messages tonight. Yeah. We'll probably get more later on. I'm yeah. actually going to step away for a bit because my my presentation is much, <laughs> much later in the night. So I'll be joining <laughs> in. I'll be joining in remote, watching all the uh, presentations, enjoying the poetry and eating something. <laughs> I hear you. Preparing for preparing for the evening, finding a few images to share for the uh, 100th, uh, this 100th double winged global star party. Got We're it. Giving it to him in two shifts. Che, Daniel. Si, loco. Que pasa? You know, I. <laughs> Todo bien. Uh, listen, I, I upload the, a picture in in the Astro TV website. Yeah, I saw it. Uh, uh, Two fifty three. Yeah, but I didn't see it in the the last week. I I, I didn't enter right now. But uh, really, yeah, uh, really? you know, I. <laughs> I, I, I was going to write him, but I think, you know, that maybe he's really busy, so... No, not really. I, I, I know I put it up there. Um, let me see. I'll go in there right now and look. Because mm -hmm. we switched them today uh, to the, to the <coughs> other ones. We had so many... Pay we had 22 submissions. Oh. For, um, for last great. week. That's great. I mean, it was, it was crazy. My, my website's going to explode. Because <laughs> it just takes like an hour for the, let me see. Um, let me see Astro World, uh, let's see live site. Let's see. Uh, pictures of the week. Hey, David, do you want to see the, the comment uh, story? Uh, you know, it's up there now, Max. I put it on for this. Okay, so you were in the second group. Oh, okay. So you're up there now. Great. So yeah, because it was so it was so many pictures. I I couldn't do them all once, or else the web page would never <laughs> load. So uh, so th this round we have so we're picking we're we're picking two pictures of the of the week in this set because. There were just so many entries. <laughs> so so you got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Oh, five, yeah, I 10, see it. 11, 12, 13. I got 13 in this round. <laughs> so, <laughs> so so right now we have nine votes in. And for this round, you can have people vote until Friday. So get as yes. many votes as you can. So, so everybody enter now to astroworldweb.com. And go to the picture of the week and vote for and vote, vote for any Maxie. picture that you like. But of course, <laughs> yeah, vote for me. Uh, there's a lot of good photos. There's your 253, which is, by the way, is is I voted for it, so it's freaking awesome. So, um, oh, th thank you, Dan. <laughs> um, and uh, the uh, we have a we have a witch's head nebula, we have a spaghetti nebula, we have a veil complex, we have a, a couple of uh, a couple of um uh terrestrial i don't know if one of these is yours adrian um but uh because there was there were a couple of pictures in there without descriptions 
and uh, let's see there's one with the tree and uh and the, the the milky way going into the tree with the uh, there, there's a bunch of good pictures so yeah that there's a lot of i i'm yeah. watching right now as a, ma as a matter yeah. of fact i think i have a double in there um mm -hmm. i think i do have a double with the beach yeah the beach is a double i gotta take that down which does one of them have no votes yeah good okay <laughs> so one of them has no votes so i can take that one down without hurting anything but um, but yeah, so we had a, we had a lot of pictures, so that was nice to see. Right, right. Now we just got to get a lot of people to vote. So yeah, it's it's a uh, for that. Well, we are publishing right now, so the audience that come to vote for any picture that they like, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I got to figure out one way to make it just one vote. I got to figure out how to way to do I, that because some people are voting twice for their picture. <laughs> yeah, I was going to ask how many times Maxi has voted for his. <laughs> yeah. uh, I, so what I've been doing is I've been going through the IP addresses. So if there's any doubles, I kick them out. <laughs> <laughs> so, hey. what, about, what about family members that share the same IP address? Uh, well, use your phone. <laughs> <laughs> so daniel i want i want to get a little bit more yeah. into this uh tag team wrestling that you're doing with uh are, 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 with you and sean are you guys uh taking on all takers because uh i hear there's a really good tag team there in uh, the uh, michigan, michigan lowbrows adrian uh Ad adrian's got uh got it covered there yeah yeah so uh you know me and Sean, uh, Sean's a good friend of mine. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we've actually come on uh, the show together um, as a group, kind of, uh, him promoting his uh, yeah. visible, visible Dark and uh, me promoting Astroworld. It's been, it's, been, it's been fun. So, uh, you know, I keep on inviting him. It's a good on. dynamic between you guys. It's, it's a lot of fun to see. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Me and him, have, you know, it's, it's nice when you have kind of two people with the same kind of sense of humor, I guess, is, is what you call it, especially from from two different parts of the continent, you know? <laughs> so, yeah. so it's kind of odd that that worked out, but uh, it works out pretty well. And as a matter of fact, in October, um, or maybe not in October, the fourth quarter, um, I'm putting together something called Astropalooza. Ooh. Up and and um, so far I have slated Sean Nielsen, um, um, uh, Molly Wakelin, um uh amy astro amy little yeah and nico carver from nebula photos right so nice. i got i got one more person i'm waiting on an answer to before i start getting together on how to kind of put everything together for a date but th those are the those are the four i have so far so far nobody has said no that i've asked so that's a good thing <laughs> so you're gonna have to bring them all on to the gsps for like the weeks leading up to it to showcase each of them in turn Absolutely. Absolutely. So. Hey, David. Hey, guys. How are hey, you? Hey, David. How's it going? Good to see you. Yeah. You we we ran just a little bit over time in the first part. <laughs> I'm not totally shocked. <laughs> <laughs> well, what, was it? what was it last week? I think it was like an hour. I think something like that. Over. <laughs> so I, I, was, I, I was, I looked at it. I was like, oh my God. One, two, three weeks ago, I think we were like 40 minutes early. And then, and then last week we were an hour late, so I guess we're making up for it. So I was giving the over under for today's total program at eight and a half hours. Wow, eight yeah, and a half hours. <laughs> we're already almost at four. Yeah, yeah, you and we've got it. the largest part of the segment coming up. Yep, yes, sir. <laughs> it's gonna be uh, fun. David, you missed uh, you missed the part of my presentation I dedicated to you and uh, the shoemakers because it's the 28th anniversary of SL9 Impact. So I wanted to I wanted to uh, mention that, and I showed a few pictures. Thank you, Kareem. I'm really sorry that I had another obligation to go to for a while. Completely understandable. But I'm I'm back. I even and showed a picture of uh, of you with uh, Jean and Carolyn at Stellafane 2002. Mm. I, I thought I, I you know I've just the whole seeing Jupiter in IR just brought back the memories right away. Mm. 
Yeah. I know the, these latest pictures are really stunning. Hi, they David. Are. It's good to see you. How you doing, David? Pretty good. Good. Pretty good. good. The 100th anniversary, 100th Global Star Party. Excellent. Excellent. How's Wendy? Wendy's doing okay. She's uh, holding her own. Good. Some days are worse than others. and mm. uh, But Wendy's doing, holding her own. I love her very, very much. Yeah. Yeah. Well, give her our best, obviously, as, as always. Yeah. Thank you. I will. Yeah. yeah. So, Kareem, what you're saying is don't feel compelled to cut things short with each talk here. Huh? <laughs> That's not for me to say. That's for Scott. And I think he's happily having some dinner at the moment. <laughs> he's whooping down a slice of pizza or something. <laughs> but it was really beautiful. The, so the last segment ended uh, with Maxi showing some images. And before him, Normand played a couple of songs and uh, hmm. talked a little bit about Starmus as well, just to mention that he's going to be there. Nice. That's awesome. I can tell you there will be some announcements of more musicians being there soon as well. Great. Any so, word on Brian May yet, uh, now that he's had his birthday celebration? Well, he is a musician, and he did turn 75 yesterday. And, yes, and a little bird tells me that uh, we're going to hear some rock and roll in Armenia. Oh, nice. You're <laughs> going to rock, literally. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Nice. He's on tour right now, right? He is, yeah, yeah, yeah. So things are crazy at the moment, but uh, and then there's a Taylor Hawkins tribute concert they need to do as well, Brian and wow. Roger and friends. So, but I think uh, we'll have a good time in Armenia. That's very good. You know, I actually, I actually sent it. I, I attempted to send an email to Brian May just to see <laughs> if he would come on the show, on my show. And uh, I got a message back from uh, from I guess his soapbox. I guess uh, that, yeah. Uh, that is, uh, oh, he's on tour. Try fourth quarter. <laughs> yeah, this so. is I, it. It is it's it's a rolling you know multi million dollar insane asylum with hundreds of people involved. This, this yeah. is a rough time to get him. Yeah. No, I, I I didn't even expect a response. I don't know who. Yeah. He is. <laughs> you know. I think. I mean, yeah. I mean, I know who he is, but he doesn't know who I am. You know. You know, but. But, uh, uh, you might be surprised. From what I hear, he actually does watch some of the uh, some of the content for outreach that comes on the web, and he watches some of the shows. And I don't know if he watches the GSPs, but I know he watches some shows and tries out some new ones. And they were saying in the UK that he's reached out to a few of them individually to say that he's liked some of the things that they've done. The the but, thing that he's closest to is Instagram. Oh, yeah. Okay. If he like, there's a there's like, a hint, he like that comment that I want to try to get his eye. Yeah. No, there you go. Thank you. <laughs> it'd be, it'd be you, know. you know, and I'll try I'll try very much not to bring up Queen. So I mean it's a <laughs> photography. So he, it's he's all, not <laughs> one of the you know, you know, many, many years ago, um uh Neil Young came to sure. our company and and he's a our company publishes a bunch of trains magazines, believe it or not, as well for real trains and model trains. And Neil Young is a huge model train guy. Oh, wow. And there, there was sort of a, there was a seminar beforehand of his people who came in and said, don't say anything at all about his music at all. He'll yeah. walk out. <laughs> yeah. Brian is not that way at all. Brian loves talking about music, um, you know, and, and stories and Freddie and everything. It's, it's just that it's an overwhelming time right now. I'm for, sure. for I am sure. I'm sure. Yeah. So I looked at his schedule. I was like, oh, my God. Yeah. <laughs> You're in the mid 70s, too. I'm like, oh, my goodness. I mean, uh, and to go out. I mean, they're almost them. almost every night they've got a yeah. show. You know, and that that's, you know, two and a half hours of running around. It's it's I hope I'm doing that when I'm 75. You me as well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah you know, but uh, if you got the energy, keep on going. Yeah. Yeah. You know. I don't know. By seventy-five, uh, you you missed it earlier, but Lou was talking about what Titan will be like in a few billion years, and I think mm. a property like that, if I could find it, you know, just sit and enjoy the sky and yeah, come onto a GSP every Tuesday to share a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Scott will still be doing those, right? 
Yep. <laughs> yes, you will. <laughs> as, as long as my man can talk, he's going to be on in front of his camera. So, <laughs> you know. Excellent. So right now I'm pointing to the K2 Comet Pan Stars. So oh, nice. I I don't know if how close is it to M10 right now. Let's see if, if I actually uh, a, uh, a how person... close is it to Messier 10? It's it was it just had, had its conjunction a couple of days ago, right? Yeah, a few days ago. Yeah. yeah, yeah, M10. Yes, I I missed that. I. Yeah. It's a little bit away now. Clean skies that the weather says, no. yeah, it's really far. Uh, with my field of view, I couldn't, I couldn't take it. But well, you know, maybe next time to so another one. Let's see if it's centered. What do you mean? Let's see if it's centered. Plates off, man. Come on, let's go. <laughs> Okay, that there it is. Let me Let's share my got. screen. I don't know if I can. Yeah. Oh, there you go. And there it is. Mm. It's a five seconds. Uh, let's do. Well, I was taking one minute picture because it doesn't move really fast, but the. The light pollution here is really bad. I have my lead, lead lights from my neighborhoods, and you know, it's yeah. really tough. I but, hear you, man. <laughs> and anyway, to do some animations and and do some stacking only with stars is good, but this kind of uh, object is you have to do it in really clear skies. Let's see in thirty seconds, maybe. Is going to see the tail. Well, the, here's the coma. Yeah, the, the tail is almost there. Yeah. Let's stretch. Oh, I, I went too, too rough. Let's do some 60 seconds. The last yeah, time yeah. I saw that comet was uh, a couple of months ago. It was a lot fainter and it was traveling through a field of sky next to NGC 6709. And that is the field in which I discovered my first comet in 1984. Oh, oh man. Wow. I think this comet was a particularly really, it has an orbita uh, a more per periodic, but I think it doesn't. It's now and then it's goes really far away. I, I didn't find some too much info for this. Let's see, 10 seconds. <clears throat> and here we go, slow down. I can see the tail. Yeah, it's there. <laughs> <laughs> zoom in. Maybe zoom in. in a three, mi <laughs> three minutes picture. Is this live? This is live. This is right now. And I'm taking a three minutes picture. Uh -huh. and let's see what we can see it. Uh, you know, Last week I captured the, also the comet, but it was those tiny little galaxies. Yeah, really far away. You no, know? and... but this is K two. This is the K two. Yeah. Um, what constellation are we in right now? Um, Ophiuchus, probably. Is it Ophiuchus, I think, but well, maybe pass away from Ophiuchus. Um, Let's figure it out. Go here in the in the map. I can not. No, sorry, it doesn't show. This is show me another place that mm -hmm. wasn't. Uh, because here I have this Stellarium app in the in the software of the CWO, and you can search the object, or maybe if you want to see it, 
uh, here in the in the, the the map you can tap in there and then put go go to but i can go i can not zoom out here in the computer in the in, the, in the cell phone yes sure. it's sure let's go that's okay right. but that's all right i don't so the general idea that's good I prefer to see it. Look at that. The you can see the tail going down. It looks like um, actually it looks like a kind of a wide tail, doesn't it? Mm. Yeah, and, and also I it's so two, it's some picture that has two kind of tails. Yeah, yeah. One like a little tail, and then then another one to maybe nine, one's a uh, nine tail, degrees. and the other one's a dust tail, I suppose. Oh. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm. Excellent. Yeah, so for all of you that did not see K2, uh, uh, here you are with a nice live view. And it is enough you can see, right? Enough you can. Yeah, I, I find it too. All right, guys, I am going to get a cup of coffee and I'll be right back and we'll get started with uh, part two of the 100th Global Star Party. Of course. Let's, let's wait to see in 30 seconds to see how it's going to the comments and also the audience can tell me what object that i can go if you want to see it right now my telescope is yours <laughs> and also uh, everyone here in the in the zoom uh, meeting uh, can ask me anything awesome Okay, let's see in three minutes. And there you go. There you go. Now the tail is, is like there, but you know, it's, it doesn't, it has this coma more besides than this place. It's really, really different from, from another ones, I think. And that's good. So, well, let's stop sharing. Okay. There you go. <laughs> um, I, from my work, and came to my home and I start to grab my equipment outside. I hear you. Quickly. Okay, so. Mm. I do a quick audio check. Can you guys hear me? Oh yeah. Yes. All right, good. Thanks. Hello, everyone. How you doing? Howdy. Hey, Daniel, you want to see Centaurus, eh? Always. <laughs> and here I am just trying to take a picture of the Veil Nebula again. <laughs> and again. And again. <laughs> Too many, too many telescopes, too many cameras, too many webcams, too many star parties. <laughs> oh my goodness, over and over again. The too much space. Picture. It's crazy. You know, I've, I've been taking pictures of the Veil Nebula for 20 years and uh, <laughs> I've yet to be yeah. happy. <laughs> so, you know, but uh, I, was, I, I was able to borrow a, uh, a 2600 from a friend of mine from the show. And, uh -huh. uh, and uh, right now it's sitting on the back of my Esprit and just waiting for the sun to go down, you know? Mm -hmm. but, uh, right. 
but I was just I was able to procure a um, a astrophysics Starfire 130 EDF Gran Turismo. Uh, so, Gran Turismo. It sounds yeah. like a sports car. Uh, that's what they call it. They, they, well, the, the the earlier version was a Gran Turismo, and the newer version is the GTX, the Gran Turismo X. Uh -huh. uh, but um, this scope was sitting literally in its original box, original case, everything for the past three or four years wow. and been used twice. And yeah, unfortunately, there's too many telescopes like that, you know, it's, so it's brand well, well, the re well, there's a reason why it's only been used twice. The gentleman had two of them. So, <laughs> so, so he had the original EDF version of the 130. And then he <laughs> bought and then he went on the he went on the list. He's a personal friend of mine. He went on the list to go on the waiting list before they stopped taking names. Yeah. Um, he went on the waiting list for the next one and totally forgot. They called him up uh, about three, three years ago. So I said, by the way, your scope's ready, maybe four years ago. And he said, your scope's ready. <laughs> and, and he's like, do you want it? He's like, yeah, I want it. And so he put it and he took it and he just loved using the other one. He never used the second one. Hmm. I, a couple of years later, I said, what do you do with that scope, man? What do you, it's literally just sitting there. What do you do? He's like, well, I'm thinking about offloading. I said, good, you can offload it to me. <laughs> and so I, so I can't get on a waiting list. I can't do anything. I can't get a natural physics scope to save your life because then it's just not taking any more names anymore. And uh, so he said, sure. And wow. he, sold, he sold it to me. So I didn't have to wait on a list and I got it within two weeks. Right. <laughs> so Awesome. Better than waiting four years, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> uh, four, almost nine or eight. It was it was, it was oh a long, God. long time. Yeah. And uh, you know, I, you know, I, so I called up, I called up George over at Astrophysics. I was like, George, um, how long for the flattener for the one thirty GT? I'm scared to ask. He's like, <laughs> he's like, he's like the flattener. He's like, oh, oh. it's on the shelf. Yeah. He's like, oh, oh man, it's gonna be a long time. I said, how, how long, oh. George? He's like, ah, oh, like September. I said, really? He's like, yeah. He's like, we're working on it now. I said, good. Put me on the list. Sure. Sure. So, so, so once well, the flattener comes. Good things come to those who wait. Yeah, know? I'm telling you. So September, I'll have the flattener. And then uh, I just picked up uh, what it, the scope comes with the uh, 2.7 inch um, feather touch. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I'm not going to change that out. It's an awesome focuser. So I, I picked up, uh, I called up. Um, 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 Optech, uh, and uh, they they're sending me the motor for the focuser. So great. Okay, I think we're going to play some short video clips here. Oh, we only got two minutes. Woohoo! Yeah, I know. <laughs> here we go. Here's Pekka here. Hello, Scott. Hi, Explorer Pekka. Scientific Explorer Alliances. This is Becca Hautala from Sista Stockholm, Sweden reporting and want to give a big congratulations, gratis, onneksi olkoon for the 100th episode of Global Star Party. It has been really instructive, fun and uh, I hope you will continue forever. It's uh, <laughs> a awesome. never ending story. Okay. Bye. Thanks, Pat. <laughs> Hello, everyone. It's Bob Fugate from Albuquerque, New Mexico. Congratulations to the Global Star Party on achieving 100 exciting episodes. Please keep up the great work. Thank you. Howdy, Scott, Explorer Alliance, Astronomical League, and esteemed Global Star Party friends. This is Cameron from Camp Astronomy, wishing you all a hearty congratulations on our 100th Global Star Party. Keep looking up and enjoy the journey. Cheers. Hi everyone, Dan Higgins here from Astroworld TV. And as one of the newest presenters of GSP, I'd like to send the congratulations to Scott, Explore Alliance, and all the presenters of Global Star Party for 100 episodes of the show.
So, outstanding job. Thank you so much for having perseverance and doing this and relaying all the information that everybody does every week. So, thank you so much. Thank you for allowing me to be a part. And as always, remember to keep imaging, keep educating, and clear skies. And we'll see you soon. I love the fireworks. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs>
Um, we had uh, uh, Lou Mayo uh, on who uh, gave us a fairly technical talk, um, but uh, I think that uh, you know, it's certainly worth a second watch. Uh, Kareen Jaffer from John Abbott College was on, um, and I think he's still in the background here somewhere. Uh, but uh, anyways, uh, Kareen, uh, uh, you know, gave us kind of an overview of what uh, uh, his experiences with the Global Star Party. Uh, he's been on, I think, almost 40 times, something like that. So Charles Ennis, who is the new president of the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada, joined us tonight. Um, uh, he's a uh, you know incredible uh, astronomy author in his own right. Has uh, devoted much of his life to educational outreach and astronomy, and uh, is a force in the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada. Uh, Dr. Marcello Souza was on. He doesn't like to, me to tell people that he's a doctor, but he is a he has a doctorate in cosmology. And uh, Marcello's uh, uh, you know mission in life is to inspire youth uh, through astronomical education and space exploration education. Uh, the things he has done in, uh, in Brazil and throughout South America is really remarkable. And, um, you know, he's, he's just a, and he's just a wonderful friend. So uh, Nico the Hammer, Nicholas Arias was on uh, earlier as well, uh, uh, showing us, um, you know, the things that Jay West is doing for us and uh, talking about his, how he has been inspired from the James Webb Space Telescope, as we all are. We finished the uh, first part with Norman Fulham, who shared a couple of songs with us, shared uh, his uh, uh, some aspects of his life and why he is so inspired to build the telescopes that he does. You know, he, that guy builds telescopes with equipment that he made because, you know, there was no place that made the kind of equipment that he, uh, that he needs for, to make his massive telescopes, which go up to, in production, up to 65 inches. The guy can make 72 inch Newtonian. So uh, if you're looking for a giant telescope, you know where to look. Uh, come to Explore Scientific, we'll help you out for sure. In this program, we're gonna have uh, David, as I mentioned, David Levy joins us once again. Uh, David Eicher from Astronomy Magazine will be with us uh, uh, talking about wall, water soluble. That's a mouthful. That's like, I got like marbles in my mouth trying to say it. Water soluble minerals, okay, which is really cool. Molly Wakeling, uh, Astronomy Molly, will be joining us. Uh, we've got Dan Higgins on, uh, Jason Gonzell, The Vast Reaches, Daniel Barr from How Do You Know. Young Connell Richards will be with us. John Briggs uh, will be sharing an image, I think he did, of Stephen's Quintet. So he, everybody's like comparing that image that Jay West did, you know. So young Navin Sentil Kumar uh, is joining us uh, around 10 o'clock tonight. Um, I'm not sure if he's uh, coming in from India or not. He, I know that his family was vacationing there. Uh, Karina Letelier from um, Chile should be joining us. Deep T. Gautam from Nepal. Adrian Bradley uh, from uh, uh, Michigan. And um, uh, I had Michael Carroll on there. He did, he was backstage with us earlier, but had another uh, commitment tonight. So, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, David, thank you, my friend, for coming on. I think that you are officially at really. 100 global star parties now. Yeah. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks so much, Scott. It is an honor to be here. And as I look over uh, my screen, I'm seeing friends that I've known for years. And I have interesting and maybe not so interesting stories from almost all of you. And I remember, for example, David, the night that I saw him that night in 1984, and we watched them blow up an expressway, which was something <laughs> I will never, ever forget, David. And uh, Kareem, that I know from Montreal, and I'm going to be seeing a lot of my friends from Montreal in a couple of days. And uh, uh, there's Molly and there's Adrian. And Adrian, when I... Thanks. Hi, Molly. And Adrian... 
when I look at his pictures, only one word comes to mind, and it keeps on coming to mind. That word is Mozart. They're that good, his photographs. They are special, they are unique. Adrian, thank you for enriching our lives with your beautiful images. Um, I have here my telescope, Minerva that is with me, and also a new thing that I introduced at the first part of the star party. This is my Jacob staff that I built just yesterday. And last night I took it outside and you know, you hold it, let's see, you hold it like this and you put the, uh, you hold it with the horizon and you bring this back until you get to here. And right up here, last night was where Jupiter was. And then we use the uh, meter markings on the side to give us an idea of how far above the horizon Jupiter was when I did that. That was very special. The uh, Jacob staff was invented by Ursonides in the 14th century. And I think most of you are asking, is he still living and could we get him to come to the- uh, the, the, the star party. Star party. <laughs> Well, we could try, but if I'll we try. get him, then we'd have to get Galileo. Galileo is definitely here. I'll Shakespeare try. is here and Versonides is here in our hearts and uh, in our minds and we're looking at him. And now for the quotation. I've been agonizing for weeks as to what quotation I was gonna use for the 100th Global Star Party. And the one that I chose is from none other than Alfred Noyes, uh, that he wrote this poem specifically for the opening of the 100 inch on Mount Wilson. And uh, George Ellery Hale, when he was arranging the first light for the 100 inch, he was um, hoping that he'd get a poet and he had to get the best of the time. And so he wrote to Alfred Noyes and Noyes said, it's interesting you ask me because I'm working on a poem now, Watchers of the Sky. And uh, I'd be honored to come and read, and read that poem. And here it is on the 100 inch telescopes opening night. Tomorrow night, so wrote their chief. We try our great new telescope, the 100 inch. Your Milton's optic tube has grown in power since Galileo, famous, blind, and old, talked with him in that prison of the sky. We creep to power by inches. Europe trusts her giant 40 still. Even tonight, our own old 60 has his work to do. And now our 100 inch. I hardly dare to think what this new muzzle of ours may find. And what that muzzle of ours has found is now a part of history. Thank you, Scott, and back to you. Oh, thank you so much, David. That was very, uh, I don't know. Uh, I, I, having just gone to the uh, George Ellery Hale family reunion, um, of course, George wasn't there, but uh, he was in spirit, and uh, it was wonderful to see so much of his extended family um, and to uh, make friends with some of them and to hear uh, some of the inspiring talks of their own. Uh, uh, Sam Hale had uh, really fired up the family uh, through uh, by taking them to Caltech, which was, of course, built by... Uh, or helped founded by um, George Ellery Hale and uh, in the city of Pasadena, which was partially built by George Ellery Hale. And, <laughs> and, then, and then he took them up to Mount Wilson, you know, uh, which was, of course, uh, two of the amazing telescopes up there. And so uh, by George Ellery Hale. So just the, the accomplishments of that guy uh, in his short lifespan is just mind blowing to me. Um, but he always seemed to be able to find uh, the most talented and uh, driven people of his time uh, to get to get things done. And um, so uh, I'm not surprised that he got the world's best poet uh, to uh, be there during the uh, first light of the 100 inch. Um, 
I, I also think about how nervous the man must have been uh, before they actually looked at a star. Uh, and from what I understand it, at first it didn't seem to be going so well. Do you, can you tell us that story, David? Yeah, it's, um, they started in the early evening and um, they got a dreadful picture of a bright star that really was all over the place. It was horrible. And uh, Hale was thinking, well, how could this mirror be so awful? We put everything we had into it. George Ritchie is in a loony bin now because of this mirror. And, um, you know, how could, how could it be awful? But then he remembered that the telescope, the dome had been open during the day and that sunlight had hit the mirror. And he thought, why don't we let it cool off for a few hours? So they went back to it around three o'clock in the morning. They turned the telescope towards Vega and boy, was that image heavenly. It was wonderful, absolutely pristine. And uh, then they knew that the 100 inch was going to have a long and illustrious career. One of the best parts of the 100 inch was during the, um, was during the Second World War when Bada got to use it. And to help him get better sky, the city of Los Angeles turned off all their lights. Of course, he just that made wasn't a phone call and just said, could you shut up, shut it down? They shut down the city, <clears throat> all the lights in the city. And they actually didn't do that for the sake of the 100 inch. They did that so that the Japanese wouldn't know where to bomb if they tried to bomb it. But it sure helped the 100 inch. And um, the other thing is, if any of you go to Mount Wilson, you will see this beautiful sight as Scotty has seen and that I have seen, and that I hope to see again, the site where Hale built his 60 inch, his 100 inch, and of course the solar telescopes. But go to the boat of Palomar, which is nearby, and uh, take a look at the 200 inch. And as you go in the lobby of the 200 inch, you will see a magnificent, not that large, Ball relief sculpture, and it says underneath the four letters "Hale" underneath it that they named the 200 inch after him. That is really such a wonderful thing, and such a wonderful way to celebrate our hundredth global global star party. Yes, thank you so much, David. That's great. Okay, well, coming up here in the not too distant future, I'll be heading around the world with one of my great friends, David Eicher. David is, uh, you know, I've, I've, every time that he comes on, I want to say something different about him, but uh, uh, he is, I mean, he's absolutely uh, extremely knowledgeable. Uh, he is absolutely inspiring. Um, you know, he is everything that you would hope that an editor of the leading astronomy magazine in the world would be. But, uh, uh, you know, he doesn't make it a, a secret that he's uh, extremely friendly, uh, extremely down to earth, uh, and uh, has an incredible sense of humor. And so I love that. I love that. And, you know, when you hear that and, and, uh, you know, you get past all the you know, amazing accomplishments of many of these people that are here, but you just learn uh, about who they really are. You know, uh, you'll find it. You'll find them in their humor, in their insights, and in the things, personal things that they share with you. That kind of stuff. You know, and um, so I have. Uh, you know, I'm really looking forward to the trip to Yerevan, where I'll go to my first Starmus event. Uh, David has been, I think, to all of them, and um, uh, uh, he will uh, will be in Yerevan, uh, Armenia, and we are going to um, be at this first century AD uh, pagan temple where we will set up and do a star party with live music under the stars. It's going to be amazing, uh, and the best part is, is that you can go too, and it's not it's not so expensive. So. But I'm going to turn this over to uh, David Eicher. He has been showing us amazing stuff that comes from our own planet, planet Earth, uh, with the minerals and crystals in his private collection. 
Here we go. Thanks, Scott. You know, somehow doing our first star party together in a long, long time at a first century pagan temple <laughs> seems really appropriate, doesn't it? I, I'm not going to say anything more. Yeah, but, right. uh, <laughs> they look, they scoured the planet, the, the earth, for, you know. The... Just if there are stories <laughs> afterward, we'll report on them and maybe we, it just needs to all be forgotten. I don't know. But anyway, we'll see how it turns yeah, out. That's right. So, so thank you, though, Scott, for having me again. And we're working oh, our way through great. the mineral world. And we have not run out of species quite yet. We're getting there. But I will see if I can share my screen and start a slideshow. And can you see a mineral? Yes. OK, that is Smithsonite from the famous uh, sea green uh, variety. Uh, Socorro County, New Mexico, the famous Kelly Mine, which is very, very close to the Very Large Array, one of our favorite uh, radio telescopes left on this planet now. So tonight we're going to talk about an unusual category, but first I'll start off by quoting uh, one of the founders of this country, Thomas Jefferson, I believe in a divinely ordered universe. Even before that time, talking about structure and analysis and understanding empirically how the universe works, uh, Isaac Newton um, said, truth is ever to be found in the simplicity and not in the, multi not in the multiplicity and confusion of things. The universe is ordered and minerals show us this really well, not by supernatural design, but by the principles of physics. They demonstrate this because their atoms are assembled in precise ways by the electrochemical attractions that are inherent uh, in them uh, that make them come together and guide them into assembling into what mineralogists call a crystal lattice. So we don't need magic, as Richard Dawkins like to say, even, likes to say, even when we talk about life. Uh, uh, um, speaking of Starmus speakers, by the way, Scott. Mm -hmm. um, but he will talk about how we simply need to understand the principles of science, which, uh, astonishingly enough, explain the universe. And thankfully, we're getting a better and better, you know, by a factor of seven resolution and just spectacular quality. Uh, we've, as you all know, entered a new era this last week of uh, how we will see the universe, uh, we hope for at least about 30 years to come. So this is, you know, we've talked about how this is an exciting time to be interested in science and in astronomy specifically, and the game has just gotten even more exciting. So this is the, the best time we can remember. So tonight I'm gonna talk a little bit about, uh, for a brief time, about water-soluble minerals um, many types of water-soluble minerals exist, which you need to be careful with in a place like Wisconsin. If you're like my friend David uh, in Tucson, you can be a little more uh, uh, rigorous with them. Uh, they tend to dissolve if you're not careful. Um, a typical and very well-known example of this is halite, which is a mineralogist's term for the crystals that naturally occur of sodium chloride. You're very familiar with it every day. You ingest it every day as table salt, of course. It comes from the Greek word for sea, which comes from the origin as an evaporate from seawater. It's often colorless, white, yellow, red, purple, or even blue with some impurities that color it in various ways. And it's one of the most familiar minerals to us on the dining room table. So we'll look at a few examples of, of halite and, and some other uh, water-soluble minerals tonight. And, and we still are a few uh, rounds away from the end here, Scott, believe it or not, but we're getting wow. there. Okay. Uh, so halite is an isometric, which is a fancy word for cubic uh, crystal system. And it consists, of course, of sodium and chlorine atoms. Uh, of course, some uh, elements are really, really dangerous in certain forms and not others. So we eat chlorine uh, you know, every day as so a solid, um, but chlorine gas, of course, can be very dangerous. So here's an example um, of halite, uh, sodium chloride. This is from a very well-known uh, mine in Poland, and it's a pretty big piece. It's about uh, eight inches across or so, roughly. Mm -hmm. So um, you can see that it crystallizes most ordinarily as a clear um, cubic uh, crystallization. 
However, it comes in other varieties too. And there's a very well-known French site where very uh, striking blue halite forms and is a sort of a fibrous crystallization of imperfect uh, cubes, um, which is an interesting uh, diversionary uh, uh, thing there. And this is a fairly similar mineral uh, to halide in the same uh, group, but it's potassium magnesium chloride hydrate called carnalite. And this is also from that same French deposit in the Alsace region there. And you can see it gets a very uh, orangey color here from magnesium particularly. These are lots of uh, similar, they're not the best looking minerals in the world, a lot of the, a lot of the uh, water soluble evaporites, um, but they are what they are. A lot of them are sort of clear um, or whitish colored. This is sylvite, which is potassium chloride. Uh, and it's from a famous uh, potash mine in New Mexico. Um, and you can see again, it sort of looks at a first approximation fairly similar to, to halite. Not the most uh, incredible uh, looking specimens, but you know, if you want to have a type collection of stuff, you got to have some of these. So this is trona sodium bicarbonate hydrate, and it's from another very well-known, uh, very dry region where lots of these kinds of minerals come from, and that is Inyo County, California. And you can see it's sort of bladed crystals here. Yeah. Epsomite, you've heard of Epsom salts, you know, to in the, you know, 17th century, you put your feet in a soaking bath of, maybe you still do, I don't know, um, to make your feet feel better. Well, th this is Epsomite here, and, and this is the origin of that. Magnesium sulfate hydrate, and, and it's from a very well-known potash mine in Germany. This piece as well, which is a reasonably large crystallized plate. This is a fake. It's really there, it really exists, but it's synthetic. It's lab grown just as you know now, many diamonds uh, as well as being recycled um, from people's diamonds who are no longer around and remounted and sold. Many diamonds now can be grown synthetically very well. So there are lots of synthetic minerals and gems out there. This is a pretty easy one to grow in a lab. It's calcanthite, which is copper sulfate hydrate. Uh, and this is uh, from a lab in Poland. It's pretty fragile, brittle, and, and uh, um, just delicate stuff. But, but it's uh, lots and lots of this stuff is grown and, and sold, you know, as kind of, you know, magical, you know, amazing crystals that will do all sorts of incredible things for you, you know, at rock shows. Um, <laughs> you know, the it, it's pretty, you know, to you yeah. know, sit there and understand, but it ain't going to do any magic, you know, sorry to be a bummer. But uh, this is a very old time specimen now that was recycled. There was a great collection of minerals in the United States for many, many years, it's from parts of it are from the early 19th, very early 19th century at the Academy of Natural Sciences uh, in Philadelphia. And they sold a lot of the no good specimens uh, many years ago now, about a generation ago. So there are lots of these old time specimens that come from a very famous mineralogist, uh, his collection in Philadelphia. This is one of them. It's a pretty ordinary mineral anhydrite. Um, it's from a famous uh, town, uh, infamous town in Germany, Berchtesgaden. Does that ring a bell with anyone? See how many World War II historians are here. Okay. <laughs> there was a really <laughs> oh, bad guy. I was going to raise my hand, but then, no, I don't remember. A really bad guy lived in this town. Well, oh, and all of he? his <laughs> associates as well, you know, but that's oh. okay. They, they, the Wolf we, we, we bombed and then blew up the rest of his house. <laughs> But, but this piece is from the same town as, as that guy who, you know, tried to overthrow the, the world um, 75 years ago. Um, but it's an interesting but fairly ordinary specimen here. Viliumite is sodium fluoride. And again, fluorine um, is, you know, very dangerous as a gas, but it's inert in essence uh, as a solid here. Um, and this is from an interesting locality in Namibia. And this is kind of interesting because you can see it's a little bit gemmy here, which for a water soluble mineral is, 
is a little bit unusual here. This is uh, sometimes called cuprian, although it's really just plain old melanterite. This is super, super fragile and almost crumbly, oh, this yeah. piece, and it gets its uh, peacock blue color from, from copper atoms. Uh, but it's iron copper sulfate hydrate, and it comes from a very well-known region for this stuff in Spain. So again, this is the kind of stuff that's very fragile. And ideally, with these kinds of minerals, you're kind of renting them. Uh, because, you know, about after a generation or so, unless it's really in an airtight compartment that is molecularly sealed, this mm. stuff will essentially degenerate, uh, wow. you know, uh, uh, and decompose uh, over some years. Um, you know, but, David, I, I was yes. reminded when you mentioned fluorine in the yeah. specimen before, I'd read an article about the, uh, that um, team of astronomers had observe that fluorine comes from the explosions from wolf ray at stars. And that's actually kind of rare. Wolf ray stars. Yeah. You know, one of the things when I run out of minerals, that's one of the things that is high on my list of 300 astronomical things to talk about again, mm -hmm. because we know a lot more now, you know, in the last 10 to 15 years about the origins of the elements. That's a very good topic, Scott, you know, and many, many elements, aside from hydrogen and helium big, and Big Bang nucleosynthesis early on, the majority of the heavier elements, you know, owe themselves uh, to the um, deaths either of low mass stars or in many cases, supernovae and, and the end of high mass stars or the collisions of high mass stars like neutron stars as well. So that's a really, you're right about that. And that's an interesting thing to talk about um, that I'll horrify you with in some detail later, I hope, sure. you know, it, when, when I get back to astronomy. But that it's amazing, you know, this era again that we're in, you know, 35 years ago, we really didn't understand the origins of the elements except in a very crude way. So we were sort of spoiled these days, you know, in the in being awash in knowledge that's relatively new. And that's a good one, the origins of the elements. This is cronkite, which is sodium copper sulfate hydride, again, getting this, uh, you know, sky blue color, if you will, from copper atoms that are spread liberally throughout the crystals. This is from a very famous mine. And as you know, and can imagine several regions, you know, including the Atacama as well, of course, are really good for um, really dry minerals in Chile. Um, that's a really rich region for this kind of stuff as well. This is super fragile and uh, very, very uh, almost hair-like needle-like crystals here of calcanthite, which wow. is the same mineral that I showed you the synthetic Polish crystallized uh, version of. And this is a naturally occurring version of this mineral. Very, very fragile stuff from a famous mine called the Planet Mine, of all things, um, in Arizona. And, and so this stuff is really fragile and very, very sensitive to water molecules decomposing it. But it's, it's pretty though, from thanks to copper. This stuff, and that is the colorless, uh, you can see there's some sort of modified dodecahedrons here. It's a little hard to see the way this is photographed, but uh, of this uh, transparent or, or crystal clear, almost looks like rock uh, crystal quartz here. Um, but that's salamoniac, which is an unusual mineral. It's ammonium chloride, relatively rare. And one of the better places to find it is this place in, in area of Bohemia in, in the Czech Republic. So this is a very unusual mineral and very sensitive, again, to hydration. Here's another one that is extremely sensitive and quite rare and is a recent discovery of only about a decade ago. There's a fairly, fairly well-known German mineral dealer, Gunnar Ferber, um, and he's the discoverer of this mineral. And the mineral is not the hunk of stuff, which is halite, the, the clear stuff, but it's this little coppery blue um, contamination on the halite is amininite, and that's copper chloride amine. So that's a very unusual um, chemical here and, and is a mineral that's only about a decade old. 
you know, there are about 5,000 mineral species, as I've mentioned. Believe it or not, you're going to be stunned that we haven't looked at every one of them. This has been going on so long. Now. But, but uh, th there is still quite a number and several dozens, typically at least, of new mineral species that are discovered each year, which is pretty incredible. So the, the number is slowly growing. Here's another one. These are these little uh, bluish and greenish bladed crystals, eucroite, which is a Slov Slovakian uh, specimen here. This is a quite an unusual mineral. Uh, and here's boothite, another California, um, very dry region, uh, San Bernardino County, copper sulfate hydrate. Fairly, you know, not, not very complex, but it forms these fairly fragile little bluish uh, um, uh, balls, if you will, that are a little um, puffy, you know, that, that are quite fragile here, mm -hmm. that stuff. And this is what happens to water soluble minerals when they're not stored in an airtight container. Oh, this no. is from Dave's collection. <laughs> and oh, this, is no. called an, this is now called an X mineral specimen. Okay. <laughs> so this is what I, I meant about renting these water soluble minerals because this is about five years in after having it in what i thought was a fairly tight uh, plastic seal but obviously wasn't so this this is now powdered dust of epsomite so you know um it goes to show you you know you, you kind of live and you learn um what did it look like before? Was it like crystals? Well, it, and... it, it was nice sort of squarish, modified squarish crystals. Yeah. Uh -huh. So now it's a it's a pile of, you know, dust. Um, so, you know, these things, we all have them for a time. Many mineral specimens, you know, are, are and this is another thing that we're on the early, not to belabor this forever, but we're in the early days of understanding the crystallization ages of minerals. So we now know that some localities and some kinds of minerals crystallized, say, about 8 million years ago, let's say. So here's one that didn't make it that far, you know. Right. This, this is probably only decades old of crystals because it's an easy thing to make quickly when the when the evaporation happens and it was killed in my study, you know, so that that didn't make it that far. But some minerals, of course, are, are um, millions or many millions or even, you know, um, a billion years old. Um, so. So this is a contrast. And again, Scott, we're on the cusp now of going, and I can't say anything super specifically, but I can tell you that there will be music now, and we will be in the company of some rock and roll and some famous guitarists who I know will be there now. Oh, really? Um, so okay. we'll have a star party, and we will have uh, astronaut speakers and Nobel Prize winning physicists and oh, chemists man. and so other speakers. Fun. And uh, Seth's boss, Jill Tarter, will be there. Um, so it's a good thing Seth behaved himself today. Um, <laughs> and we're going to have some rock and roll as well. So we're going to have a good time. And we will we awesome. hope we'll report maybe a little bit, Scott. I don't know how much we'll be able to do this. Maybe we'll be able to do a little bit of live reporting from Armenia. We'll see. Yeah, we'll certainly try. Yeah. But if not, we'll have a lot to report on when we get back in September. Sure, sure. Wonderful. Okay. Well, thanks so much, David. I'm super excited about all this, as you well know. So yeah. Yep. Great. It's going to be fun. We're going to have right. a blast. Oh, uh, Daniel Barth <laughs> wanted to ask you a question. Uh, yeah. Go ahead, Daniel. You here. Uh, David, fascinating. I've got a, a really cool big halite that a student brought me from Death Valley, but I wanted to know, have the rovers discovered, you say, six to 10 new minerals a year? Have the rovers discovered Mars unique minerals yet? No, well, no, they're, they're on Earth. The on Earth, oh, yeah, some, no, no. some dozens of minerals, you know, are being discovered. Each year. The, the rovers have discovered uh, some unusual and I think new minerals, a uh, few species that are being investigated. Um, so but cool. they've, they've also discovered, you know, and years ago, some earlier rovers some sulfates that that had that are part of the evidence that there was a you know plentiful liquid uh, flowing water on the surface of mars which of course now we know is 
uh, in aquifer, subsurface aquifers, but there are plentiful sulfates that are analogs to earth sulfates that had to be, you know, no pun intended, swimming in, in flowing water. Um, so, you know, what that, that you know, um, story of why did Mars go dry, you know, and why did the atmosphere globally change still has to be fully answered, even though we basically know uh, the story. And, and I let's just hope thought that maybe the carbon rich atmosphere and the slow drying over billions of years, and then the, the isolation volcanic tubes. I think there's got to be new prizes and new wonderful stuff waiting for us. There's no doubt about wrong, it. A absolutely. And and Mars is it was for a long time in the same boat that, that we're in, uh, unlike Mercury and the moon, you know, without plentiful water. That the If you go back 2.6 billion years on Earth, the great oxygenation event took place when there was suddenly enough free oxygen from an abundance of microbes that oxygen was freely available in Earth's atmosphere. And what does oxygen like to do, of course, but to combine with everything. So that from, from about 1500 mineral species, which dry worlds have, probably like the moon, uh, that tripled or quadrupled the number of mineral species on Earth when there were oxygenated minerals to the 5,000 or so that we know about. So for a long, long time, Mars had that same problem. So there must be many, many minerals we don't know about yet on Mars that are Earth analogs, and maybe others that we don't know of on Earth as well. Mm -hmm. So that's going to be exciting in the future as we also put our dipsticks down into the um, you know, very, very, very clean dipsticks down into the aquifers to see if there are any microbes there. Right. Wonderful. Exciting stuff. Oh, yeah. I have a question as well. Uh, just a quick one. So I'm wondering, how is, how is it that certain um, elements produced in supernovae go from being in, in what I assume to be this kind of uniform concentration to much larger concentrations on the Earth where we can mine down and say, this is where you find gold or zinc or something like that? Well, abundance of, of atoms is the, the, the quick answer and lots of time. You know, if you have 13.8 billion years, that's a lot of supernova production and a lot of collisions of neutron stars. And it takes a long time, you know, to successively see the lifespan of a new star dying and blowing stuff out into the interstellar medium, which then gets accreted onto a planet and ends up in Colorado and gets pushed up into the mountains where it's accessible. Um, and somebody, you know, finds it in the 1870s, you know, by chance. So, uh, you know, a tremendous amount of material being produced by stars over an enormously long time um, produces that. And remember, some things we think of as rare are not really that rare. Diamonds, if we could find things, uh, kimberlite pipes below ground, which we can't easily, would be plentiful. They were one of the first dozen species to exist in the solar system, uh, uh, you know, elemental carbon. Um, and if we could extract gold that's dissolved in seawater, it would be worthless. There's so much of it that is oh dissolved in the oceans, you know, <laughs> but we can't, you know, so, so we have to find it by sheer dumb luck in mountains that, you know, that get pushed up and make Western movies, you know, after a hundred years, you know, right. um, so, so, you know, but a, a, a tremendous amount of material, remember how many stars are in the universe now, we think at least 10,000 billion mm -hmm. billion. And an enormously long time gets enough of that heavy stuff into a planet like Earth that's 4.6 billion years old. Yeah. No, thank you. Right. Mm -hmm. right. Okay. So we are going to transition to Molly Wakeling. But uh, before we do, Maxie's got his telescope aimed at a uh, beautiful nebula. Maxie, you want to give us a peek? Hey, guys, again. Oh. How are you? And yes, I pointed to the Liberty Statue Nebula, but the light pollution is really, really tough. So I pointed now to the Swan Nebula. Let me share my screen. Um, okay, 
this is a uh, of uh, two minutes mm -hmm. and the, this is uh, the, how it looks like you can see here is the shape but when i do auto stretching you have the information wow so here it's only yeah it's it's a really good i only using 100 gain at uh, minus 10 degrees celsius and you can see even because i went outside a, a couple of minutes ago and <laughs> i barely could see almost scorpion the southern cross and maybe arturus that's all the stars that i can see i think we have a wind in the up scales on the sky so we have a lot of dust and this is this is not a really clear night but anyway i can see uh, all these objects so uh, again if you want to see something uh, from the southern skies well this is from the middle you can see it also in the northern but uh, let me know it and i will point my scope for the for the next uh, break okay i guess it's worth mentioning that um in our view if we were to shoot it here in the northern hemisphere that would the swan sort of shape would look upside down so um it's still yeah be the it, thing remember I, uh, you you can change the field of view of the camera so you can rotate and you right can see here the spikes are not precisely um, um, horizontal and vertical they are more inclinated but yeah anyway uh, i'm using a, a newtonian and maybe also the the image is uh, different like when you see it so well, yeah you're using newtonian so they're made so something is flipped so mm -hmm. exactly well thank you maxi thanks for showing us the live view here that's one no thanks to you okay okay so now we're going to go to uh molly wakeling molly has been on many global star parties uh she um uh, is uh I think uh, might have been called an amateur scientist before, uh, but I think that she is uh, getting her uh, PhD and will be a professional scientist here in the not too uh, distant future. Maybe she's I, uh, working I, for money now. I don't know. <laughs> I uh, passed my candidacy exam today. So. Wow. wow. <laughs> Congratulations. Congratulations. Yeah, that's perfect. You're on your way. That's perfect. Yeah, so well, I'm very, very well tired, deserved. But I really want to give this talk. So. <laughs> Excellent. Molly, thanks for coming on to the 100th Global Star Party. Yeah, thanks for having me back on again, Scott. It's been a while since I've been on here. I've been very good this time to come on exam. So um, glad to finally be back on here for a little bit uh, before I dive into writing my practice. Um, but uh, yeah, I really want to come on to the 100th show, and I also really want to come on because, of course, of the incredible release of the James Webb Space Telescope images. And I want to talk about one in particular and about um, what it, like, um, and how, how it's a good example of the kinds of things that we'll be able to learn from James Webb and some cool science that that's a part of Right. Molly, your, your voice sounds a little thin uh, right now. I don't know if there's any. Thing you can change on the microphone. Let me make sure I have the correct microphone selected. Oh. I had the wrong mic selected. How's that? Way better. <laughs> All right. Apologies. <laughs> Way better. Okay. Gotcha. Thank yeah. you. So the, the cooler on my, on my desk, the CPU cooler on my desktop died yesterday. Uh oh. Um, so I've got my laptop hooked up temporarily and I've, so I'm trying to get all my stuff rewired and sure. uh, yeah. So yeah, now I've got it back on my good microphone. <laughs> okay. I'm actually amazed you picked it up at all because the microphone on that computer is about five feet away underneath my desk. <laughs> it sort of sounded like that. It was just kind of, it sounded like you were in a tunnel. So yeah, apologies. No uh, all right. Thanks for, thanks for letting me know. Um, I will share my screen. that and then 
that. Yeah, so I also don't have my normal second screen today. So hopefully, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, how's that look? Does that look okay? Looks great. Looks good. Cool. Um, yeah, so uh, I want to talk about that incredible deep field image, the first one that was released of the few, first few images released from the James Webb Space Telescope that focuses as, as pointed at the uh, galaxy cluster SMAX 073. Uh, astronomers are really good at coming up with really funny shorthand names for things. <laughs> and we really like to <laughs> name things like, uh, oh, I should have had some examples handy, but uh, like like uh, Assassin, for example, is the name of a survey that looks for things okay. like comets. The assassin survey. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Right. So, uh, and sometimes the acronyms are stretched quite thin, um, <laughs> but we're right. really good at that. So, <laughs> yes. um, all right. Uh, so, da, 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 the image, I can't look at it enough. It's one of those ones that you really have to go download the original uh, uncompressed TIFF file, just the biggest size one that you can go download from the NASA website and just like zoom in really far and just start kind of looking around because there's so much detail in here and so many incredible things to look at. So uh, let me point out some of kind of the main features of the things going on in this image. Um, so first we have foreground stars, very much like we were used to seeing in Hubble images. Uh, it, they're obvious by their diffraction spikes. And in the case of the James Webb telescope, it has six diffraction spikes instead of the normal four that we're used to because of the hexagonal shape of the mirror. And then the horizontal uh, 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 diffraction spike in the middle is the one that's actually from the struts. I thought it was the other way around, but I went and looked that up. And yeah, so that horizontal one is, is from the strut that's holding the secondary and then the um, uh, hexagonal spikes are from the hexagonal shape of the primary mirror. So expect, to, expect that to be a, uh, uh, an identifying feature of James Webb images from here on out. Uh, so in addition to the foreground stars, we have lots of background galaxies, everything from ones that are easy to spot with really cool spiral shapes uh, when the image is zoomed out, all the way to really tiny dots and really a lot like, just like the Hubble deep field that that really kind of moved me to get into physics in the first place. Every single dot of light in this image that's not one of the foreground stars is a galaxy. And when you zoom in really far and you see a little fuzzy dot, that's a galaxy that is really far away. <laughs> and so it's really incredible to see just the depth that, that James Webb was able to go to in this one image. Um, now, the target of the image is uh, SMACS, uh, shorthand SMACS uh, 70723, uh, but the full long name is J0723.3-7327. Uh, <laughs> ways of, uh, of cataloging all of these things that there's too many to name. Uh, so um, the light travel time is the, number, is the number that you've been hearing a lot for the distance for this galaxy cluster. Uh, of 4.6 billion light years, its proper distance is 5.12 billion light years. And that has to do with the way that um, space between us and that galaxy cluster has stretched since the light has left. So its proper distance is actually farther away than the light travel time. And I'm gonna dig a little more into that when I talk about cosmological redshift later on. Uh, in addition to that, we have, uh, if you've looked around the galaxies, you might notice that some have very odd shapes, these really stretched out looking galaxies. And those are actually gravitationally lensed galaxies that are being lensed by this heavy galactic cluster in the middle, the SMAX cluster. I'm gonna talk about what that is and actually what that can do for us scientifically as well. So first, um, Babak Tafreshi, uh, the Nightscape Imager, put up this really great video on his Instagram showing where exactly this deep field image is taken. So uh, we have a shot of the southern sky. We can see the large Magellanic Cloud. And briefly, to the left of the Magellanic Cloud, it showed two arrows. Um, so look to the left and zoom in on that little box. That is the area of this deep field. <laughs> it's, it's the equivalent of holding a grain of sand out at arm's length. And that's the area on the sky that this deep field covers. And in that deep field, we can see 
thousands of, of galaxies in just that extremely tiny area of sky. So the really kind of chilling reminder of just how unimaginably enormous the universe is. Yeah. Um, so uh, let's talk about how it compares to the Hubble Space Telescope and how it's uh, a successor uh, to Hubble as opposed to a replacement. So uh, first of all, as, as we all know, it has a much larger mirror than the Hubble, mm -hmm. which has a 2.4 meter mirror with James Webb having six and a half meters. And this larger size allows it to be 270% sharper because that, that larger size allows us to have higher spatial resolution and 730% more light gathering power. And we actually end up being able to get even more light gathering power than that because of the instruments that are on it and, and the quality of those instruments. That's kind of the value from, from the mirror alone. Uh, in terms of that deep field, it would take Hubble weeks to capture that same deep field that James Webb was able to catch in 12 and a half hours of exposure time. If you all remember the, the Hubble deep fields that came out in the 90s and 2000s that got progressively longer exposure times, those were exposure times of weeks. And we were able to probe deeper already with just 12 and a half hours of exposure time on the James Webb telescope. So it's just, just a glimpse at what we're gonna be able to do with it. And it's truly incredible. Um, so uh, here's a, actually uh, a comparison image of Hubble imaging the same field that James Webb imaged. And the Hubble image is a shorter exposure time. It's about three and a half hours total exposure time um, compared to James Webb's 12. But you can see already the difference, uh, not only in, of course, the amount of light gathered, but the quality of the image. We have newer cameras on James Webb with lower noise and we have a lot higher spatial resolution. And so if you were to zoom in on the Hubble image, a lot of the galaxies get kind of fuzzy mm -hmm. where they become sharp in the James Webb image. Um, so in addition to, uh, to those things, it, uh, the James Webb Space Telescope is in a totally different orbit than, than Hubble. So Hubble, Hubble is in an in Earth orbit uh, and that actually limits its exposure time on any particular target because it can only image one spot on the sky 50% of the time, because then it goes around behind the earth and it's blocked from view. And then it has to reorient when it comes back around to look at that target again. But with James Webb, we can sit on the same target for an arbitrary amount of time. And we can see any target in the sky at any time with the exception of things that are right behind the sun and the earth, due to the fact that it's in this Lagrange two point orbit out um, behind the Earth uh, uh, at a further out orbit that gravi because of uh, some nulls in the gravitational field ends up moving at the same speed as Earth. Uh, so it will always be um, roughly that position from us. So that allows us to see a lot more things for longer periods of time without having to go behind the Earth. Uh, the other important key difference and why James Webb is really a successor as opposed to a replacement for Hubble is James Webb is focused on the infrared spectrum. So Hubble was really focused on the optical and the near ultraviolet and the near infrared, whereas James Webb covers a very tiny amount of red, but really kind of starts right in the infrared and goes down into, into the mid infrared. And uh, a part of the reason for that is one of James Webb's main missions is to look at, at the first galaxies, galaxies that are over 13 billion light years away in light travel time. And because of cosmological redshift, which again, I'm gonna talk about in a second, um, that light from those galaxies has actually shifted into the infrared. So we need to be able to use an infrared telescope to be able to see those distant galaxies. Now, having that infrared capability allows us to do some other things, such as seeing through dust that includes both dust in our galaxy to see to the core of our galaxy, as well as dust in other galaxies. So the image I have here at the bottom is a comparison, be, uh, the Hubble image of Stefan's Quintet is on the left and the James Webb infrared image is on the right. And you can see that, that it's the same, that kind of have the same shapes of the galaxies, but you can see much different kinds of detail in the James Webb image, not only because it's a sharper instrument, but because it's looking at a different frequency of light and it's able to, to peer in past that yellow glowing and dark glowing dust and see what's uh, all the star forming activity that's going mm. on inside of it. 
All right, so let's talk about gravitational lensing. So the thing that causes this lensing is when you have a large distribution of matter, in this case, a galaxy cluster, between a distant light source, such as a galaxy, and an observer, which is us, which bends the light from that light source ar around that, that um, source of mass, that galaxy cluster, as it travels towards us. This effect was actually predicted by general relativity before we were able to observe it, um, uh, pr principally with, with, uh, with Einstein really cementing in that theory of general relativity. And one of the outcomes of that light bending around the gravitational field of the, of the galaxy cluster is that it can stretch the image of the galaxy and it can also make multiple images. So um, uh, I think the, the one shown here, the one on the right side of the galaxy cluster um, that I'm not showing is definitely the same galaxy showed twice. I think this one is also where it's a very stretched out image of the galaxy, but uh, I might be wrong about this, but this might be the same galaxy that we're seeing two images of um, because of the way the light bends around it. Crazy. So um, there's a neat little video from ESO that uh, the European Southern Observatory that shows this effect. So um, we have a foreground galaxy and in the blue, the background galaxy in the red, and the image at the back is what it looks like to us. So the light rays coming from that background galaxy get bent around the foreground galaxy, and it makes the image appear to be this ring, uh, or uh, so sometimes a ring, sometimes multiple images around the um, uh, the the galaxy in the center. So. Um, it's similar to optics, but with some different um, characteristics of how the, the light is bent because of the, the fact that there's no focal length of this kind of quote unquote optics system. Um, but uh, yes, yeah, so that's the effect that uh, in a foreground, if you will, still a billion light years away, uh, galaxy cluster with a lot of mass can bend the light from the galaxies behind it. So what can, what can so besides looking really cool what can we learn from gravitational lensing from, from that effect so for one thing we can learn about how the matter is distributed in the lensing object so in that smacks galaxy cluster because that will affect how the light is bent around it and whether you get a ring or multiple images or whether those how those multiple images are distorted um, this is the example i was talking about where this um i don't know if you can see my mouse but the um uh, the lower kind of stretched out galaxy and the upper one are really the same galaxy with the images distorted and, and doubled. It's very cool. <laughs> very um, we can actually learn about the distribution of dark matter from this as well, because we understand the effects of gravity and we can look at the amount of light coming from that, that, uh, that cluster of galaxies. And if the way that the light is bent doesn't match up with the amount of mass, then we can surmise that the mass, that there's the additional mass that is there is from dark matter. And we can probe the, the distribution of the dark matter as well. Lensing also amplifies the light from the distant galaxies that are being lensed, which allows us to see more distant galaxies than we would be able to see without that gravitational lens there. Um, I think there's actually an example of um, an image from Hubble where we were able to see a supernova. So a single star, from a galaxy some billions of light years away that you wouldn't otherwise have been able to see because it, it was it's too dim to have been spotted by Hubble, but because it was gravitationally lens, the light's actually been amplified. We were able to see the light from that distant supernova, uh, which gave us some really cool science on, uh, uh, on those, on those uh, kind of earlier star supernova. Um, and some of the galaxies that are lensed in this image are 13 billion light years away which is just an incredible number and getting back really toward the first galaxies, which is one of the main missions of James Webb. So on the topic of looking back to the first galaxies, let's talk a, a little bit about the timeline of the expansion of the universe. So, um, so Hubble or James Webb is looking, is hoping to be able to look back um, to these first galaxies, if you look in the right image, um, they're hoping to look all the way back to a period of time known as, as hydrogen reionization. Um, so, so kind of the, the order of events here is, uh, so after the Big Bang, after inflation, um, there was uh, 
a soup of hydrogen and helium and a little bit of lithium. And, um, but the universe was, was still quite hot and light was not actually able to really move around it, which is constantly getting absorbed and re-emitted by the, um, uh, by the ionized hydrogen and helium. But as the universe expanded, it also cooled in the same way that uh, expanding gas in, in the same volume of a, of a bottle will make the bottle colder. Um, so about 379,000 years after the Big Bang, we have a, a period called recombination, which uh, the universe had cooled to about 3000 degrees Kelvin, which is about the surface temperature of the sun, which is cool enough where the light's no longer getting absorbed constantly. Um, and the well, it, it was cool enough for those hydrogen and helium atoms to be able to capture electrons because before it was so hot that the electrons, any electrons that got captured were immediately released because they had too much energy to stay bound. But at this point, you were able to capture the electrons, which is what finally allowed the light to start passing through. The universe became transparent. And that is the cosmic microwave background. That's the kind of the, the moment in time when it was produced. This was the last light before um, the universe became transparent. And so at that time, that light, so 3000 degrees Kelvin is approximately um, like, a, like, a, like a red section of, of kind of a red area of light. Um, but as the universe has expanded, that red light has dropped, has been stretched now to be microwave wavelengths. So um, hence the cosmic microwave background. Now, um, there was a, a period, some, there's a period later on, we don't know exactly how much later on, that's one thing that we're hoping to discover, where uh, some, some in the first uh, hundreds of millions of years, when the gas clouds uh, the, of uh, now the, um, the neutral uh, hydrogen and helium, because they all had their electrons, became hot enough that, that they re-ionized. So there was enough energy in these, in these condensing hot clouds of gas to once again release electrons from them to liberate those electrons and start to radiate light again. Uh, just like how in, when we look at, at hydrogen alpha clouds, like, um, uh, like the Lagoon Nebula and the Rosette Nebula, we see that red glowing light that um, is, is, is the light from hydrogen. Um, so that's the period of reionization that James I was hoping to be able to see back to because that's the period of the first of the formation of the first stars. The early stars were about 30 to 300 times more massive than the sun. There was only hydrogen and helium around. There weren't any of the um, of uh, any, anything that was heavier than that, like the oxygen and the carbon, and the nitrogen that makes our red giants these days. And because of that, these stars only lasted uh, a few um, a few million years, and they were also millions of times more luminous than the sun. And then they exploded in massive supernova, which became black holes. And then those black holes began to start merging with each other over time and accreting more material to make eventually make supermassive black holes around mm -hmm. which the first galaxies would have formed. So we're hoping to, to see some of that process with James Webb. Yeah, okay. Um, so, uh, looking at looking at the the most distant galaxies in this image, the I've zoomed in on another portion of of that deep field, where um, and again I want to emphasize these little dots of light here and here and here. Those are a whole galaxy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, galaxies like so the, like the each size. God has billions of stars and trillions of yeah. planets. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And and they just appear as barely discernible dots of light because they're wow. so far away. And they're as old as, as some as some 13 billion years when um uh we were far enough in past the Big Bang for the stars and the black holes to start to form. Um now um the as I mentioned earlier, the light from those earliest, most distant galaxies has been redshifted by the expansion of the universe, moving it into the infrared. Um, so what is, what is that redshift? 
So there's two types of redshift that, that we talk about, and uh, the two are often confused. There is a redshift due to the Doppler effect, and there's cosmological redshift. So redshift due to, to the Doppler effect is caused by the motion of the object. So um, for example, we use, uh, we use Doppler redshift as a way to look at um, uh, like, like a binary star system, for instance, mm. and uh, be able to and see how those two stars are moving around each other, how much they pull on each other so we can estimate their masses. And we also use this technique for observing exoplanets especially the larger ones that, that have larger poles on their stars. So in a very similar way that a, when a train goes by, you, the sound is, is kind of a higher pitch. And as it goes away, it goes and drops in pitch, just like a, like a train or like an ambulance. It's, it's the same effect, but for light. So if the object is moving toward us, that the, the peaks and troughs of the of the light are going to be bunched closer together and will appear slightly shifted blueward. Whereas um, when the star is moving away from us, then that light gets stretched out when it's emitted because of that motion, it becomes a little bit uh, shifted toward the red. And what I, in particular, I mean the emission lines and absorption lines of that star, which are characteristic of particular elements. So for example, hydrogen, has an emission line of 626 nanometers, which is that hydrogen alpha light that we see in all of these gorgeous astronomy images. Um, so those that will that exact wavelength of light will get shifted a bit around that point, depending on whether the object that's emitting it is moving closer or further away from us. Um, so uh, that's Doppler shift. Now, uh, cosmological redshift is due to the actual expansion of space-time, the expansion of the universe. And the light that was originally emitted at a particular wavelength gets stretched by that expansion. And I was trying to find a good GIF for this, and I couldn't really find one that was satisfactory. But then I came across this one here where somebody's stretching some elastic, and it's really oh. just perfect. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Because, like... Um, as as you, when you're when you're stretching the elastic, your um, the the actual space that that um, that that elastic is taking up lengthwise in this case gets stretched out, which causes the wavelength of the light to stretch out. So um, cosmological redshift is due to the expansion of the universe. I have another picture here that kind of using the balloon metaphor, where if you drew some galaxies on the surface of a balloon and then inflated it, they're all moving away from each other. Um, and there's, there's no center that this expansion is happening from. It appears the same from any point in the universe. Hmm. So to a, to a galaxy 13 billion light years away, if they had a James Webb Space Telescope that was looking in our direction, the Milky Way galaxy would appear to be shifted into the infrared. So this, this happens, uh, the, the same, this looks the same from any point in the universe. And uh, the, the equation that I put here, that uh, I think is the only equation I have in this, in this slideshow, is uh, we measure red, we, we kind of categorize redshift in terms of this number Z. That, that you might see occasionally listed with, a, uh, instead of listing a galaxy's distance, we'll list its redshift instead. And that's because um, the, uh, it has to do with a couple of things. So the, so the H naught, the H uh, zero value there is the Hubble constant, which is a measure of the expansion rate of the universe, which is approximately 70 kilometers per second per megaparsec. So, uh, so mega, so parsec being, um, what is it? It's like, um, uh, I'm gonna get this backwards. I think it's four, like 3.7 parsecs in a light year. I, th I think the parsec is the smaller one. <laughs> um, anyway, it's, it's a measure of distance like a light year is. And uh, so the further out you look, the faster that expansion rate appears. Because for every megaparsec, you for, for further out you look, you have an additional 70 kilometers per second of, ex, of apparent expansion speed away from us. Uh, D is the co-moving distance, which is the distance that, that, that the object we're looking at is away from us factoring out the expansion of the universe. 
um, which uh, is equivalent to um, uh, the proper distance at the present moment in time. It, things get a little weird. Um, and, and so that as you look further out, that expansion rate can appear to be faster than the speed of light. But of course, those galaxies aren't actually moving at the speed of light. Uh, so we're not violating any, any laws of physics here. Um, but because things appear to be moving faster, the further away they are, they can appear to moving away faster than the speed of light, um, even though they're not physically moving that fast. So um, that kind of brings us to what, what is the size of the observable universe? How far back can we see? And because of the expansion of the universe, there is actually a limit to how far back it is possible to see. Even if we had a telescope the size of the sun, uh, we would only be able to see so far out from here uh, because of because of light because, because light has a finite travel speed. So if light was emitted from a galaxy in the early universe when it was much smaller, and it was maybe on the other side of this smaller universe than than um, than we are, it's now moving away faster than its light can 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 kind of keep up with. So. Um, the light from that distant galaxy will actually never reach us because where that light is located in the mm -hmm. universe as it makes its way toward us is continually being moved back and expanded by the expansion rate of the universe. So that light will literally never make it to us. Um, so the, the cosmic microwave background is 45 billion light years away, which if you know that the universe is 13.8 billion years old, might not really make sense. <laughs> uh, but you have to remember that because it's expanding at an accelerating rate, um, it will, it, the actual point of recombination when that light was emitted is now 45 billion light years away because the galaxy, the universe was so much smaller when it was emitted. Mm. Um, but it still only occurred 13.4 um, billion years ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, with all of that, all that taken into account, the diameter of the diameter of the observable universe estimated to be about 93 billion light years. Um, so that's the picture that's shown here. The diameter is 93, meaning the radius is 46. And um, but based on characteristics of the cosmic microwave background and what we know about the Big Bang and inflation, uh, we can estimate the size, the actual size of the universe which is unknown and may be infinite, but um, some estimates based on what we know about uh, the early universe could put it at 23 trillion wow. light years. It might as well be infinite. It might as well be infinite, yeah. <laughs> there's actually, there's some really interesting theories that um, are not, they're not fringe theories even. They're, they're um, depending on the geometry of the universe, it's, possible that we're kind of in this in this hyper hyper um what's it called this this hyperbola where if we were able to look back to look far enough out we would actually see ourselves again uh because it wraps around sort of like uh like if you walk around uh, on the 2d surface mm -hmm. imagine you were an ant uh, living on the surface of a sphere and you're imagine you're a two-dimensional ant and so you don't know about up and down you only know about left and right and you uh, are walking around and you, you think you're walking in a straight line. And then after you walk a really long time, you end up back at the point where you started because it, the, the space that you live in is a dimension higher than the space that you experience. Um, so it's kind of this 4D hyperbola idea where um, we might actually be able to see our own Milky Way galaxy billions of years ago if we can look far enough back, which um, is the, the geometry of the universe is something that, it, that is under active research, but it's a cool kind of, it's a cool theory. <laughs> mm. <laughs> um, yeah, so I'm getting toward the end here. Um, what are some questions that the James Webb Space Telescope will be able to answer for us? So we'll be able to see the first galaxies and stars and um, be able to actually measure uh, the conditions uh, of those first galaxies and of those first stars, where we've only been able to conjecture with models before. We'll be able to understand galaxy evolution because we'll be able to see those early galaxies 
and then closer to us galaxies at a later point in evolution, and then closer to us galaxies at an even later point of evolution, we can actually watch the timeline of formation of galaxies uh, from our singular point in time, because we can look back in time by looking further out in space. Uh, because of its infrared capability, we can peer through clouds and watch stars form where we can't look through those clouds with our optical telescopes. So we'll learn more about star formation. And something that I'm really excited about, we'll be able to probe the composition of exoplanet atmospheres. Mm. So we can do infrared spectroscopy on these exoplanet atmospheres where we can look at uh, basically, it's like taking a, a picture, but with every different wavelength of light being its own image. Instead of red, green, and blue, we have for every, um, let's say, uh, every nanometer of wavelength of light, we get a different image. So you can, and you can see where the emission lines and the absorption lines are that are characteristic of elements and gases and compounds. So we can actually look and see what's in the atmospheres of these exoplanets. So. One of, the, uh, one of the first images produced was actually this plot here of uh, WASP, um, I should have wrote down the number, WASP 69B, I think, or something like that, where we were able to observe that there's water in the atmosphere. So uh, where there's water, there's chemistry uh, of the biological type. And um, so there could be interesting things happening on that world and lots of others that we'll be able to probe. So um, yeah, it's going to be an incredible capability. Uh, scientists are already crying about how amazing it is and how it succeeded every expectation that it was designed for and giving us even better views than, than we could have hoped. And um, where, where, we, where we went wrong with Hubble in the optics the first time it was put up, everything just went right with James Webb. The launch was textbook. The orbital insertion was textbook. The unfolding had a few glitches, but we got those worked out and everybody's just like crying happy tears of amazingness. So are there any questions? Uh, I've got one, but if there's someone from the stream, they read that one first. Let's see. And I'll go, I'll go hop on the chat uh, after this and, and go answer some questions in chat too, uh, on the YouTube chat. I am. Not seeing it. Uh, you want to read it off, Adrian? Well, no. I I just had my own question. I wasn't looking. Sure. I wasn't looking at the chat. Okay. No, I, I remember that James Webb did get hit with like a microscopic yes space rock. Um, do you recall how they corrected for that? Because I thought that was really interesting that they they were able to account for the you know the very slight bombardment that it might get being out there in space and still be able to produce the beautiful images. Um, I'm trying to remember what I read about it. Um, I think instead of, um, I think it's something that, that they kind of assessed and realized wasn't going to be a problem as opposed to something that they corrected for, but I might be wrong. Um, uh, yeah, I have to go read about that again because I can't remember what the, what it ended up being. My brain's been flooded with, uh, with this exam so. that's, that's understandable <laughs> you've, you've got something important but this was a great this is a wonderful presentation and yeah, thank yes you. we were There's, very we were all excited about james webb when it when it uh especially when those images uh came up i was yeah. happy just hearing that the every target that it reached it got into its point it made it here there everything was yeah, everything went well and it didn't unfold inside of a rocket that didn't let it go or something tragic yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah exactly. Oh, you know, that's uh, after early it, yeah, that's right. Yeah. And I think these, so like even though um these are infrared images, which I was kind of afraid we're gonna look a bit like the Spitzer images nice. that have really weird color palettes that just don't look good. Like I <laughs> they've it looks like that they're actually choosing color palettes that make it look more like the optical images we're used to seeing out of Hubble, even though these are infrared images. And I'm really glad that they're doing that, uh, at least for the for the images that, that we all get to look at, um, because Hubble 
Hubble did for my generation what the Apollo 11 launch did for, for the generation before That's me. Right. And James Webb is going to do for the current generation what Hubble did for me, which was inspire me to get into physics in the first place. Mm -hmm. So um, those images, like, um, I mean, there's a lot of sci science that's going on in the unprettified version of those images, but the release of those in a kind of a prettified false colored format is so important and uh, for, for that public outreach bit and right. for inspiring both people who might eventually become scientists and just the general public to think about what's out there outside of our little our little home universes so um yeah, yeah. it's we're just it's all I, just we're at the beginning it's all just getting started yeah i think i agree and i think what you just said helps me to realize kind of the outreach of what jwst is doing you do have folks that that are content that are content producers who see the images and then sort of liken it to JWST, a big fat camera in the sky, as if someone shot out a Sony Alpha One on steroids and took pictures of space. But then again, the outreach far, I guess, exceeds the maybe the thought that it's just a camera and it really isn't. It's a science instrument. But that's still reaching a group of people who otherwise may not care about the science that James Webb would do. So yeah, I think you're, I think you're really and, right on about that. Yeah, NASA and ESA understand that really well. And in fact, um, the, the Juno mission to Jupiter, one of its cameras, one of its instruments is solely for public outreach. It has no scientific uh, purpose, although science has been has been done with it, uh, because the images that come from that are are so incredible. But all of those images that you see fr uh, from Juno of Jupiter with its highly detailed clouds and yeah, um, that's from a camera that was designed for public outreach explicitly. Yeah. And so so NASA and ESA deeply understand how important having public facing pretty images is to having people stay interested in in science to, to grow the next generation of scientists, but also to get money so they can keep making Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Our tax dollars fired at work. So that's right. Yeah. 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 I, I, uh, th there was lots of um, controversy and arguments about the billions of dollars that it took to keep uh, Hubble in good working order and to produce the kind of images that it did. But when you, you know, you, you spread that out over uh, the uh, 300 million people that live in the United States, it ended up being something like the cost of a movie ticket or something, oh, you know, <laughs> you couldn't even get popcorn yeah. and a Coke, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and highly worth it, even just for, for keeping the public inspired and inspiring yeah. future scientists. That's um, right. But we got so much science out of Hubble and there's a, there's a lot of things that, that we want to learn for the sake of understanding them. There's also a lot of things that uh, when we look out to these other galaxies and these other and these exoplanets and even within our own our own galaxy and our own solar system, then we can learn about the formation of our own planet. And yes. I think that that's really important for us to to understand and also to look at the evolution of planets that are like ours and kind of get a glimpse of what different possible futures are. Um, and and maybe start to clue in a little bit about how life was able to take root on this planet, which I think is a question that everybody is interested in, in, in one way or another. Um, mm -hmm. So it's not all just kind of pie in the sky, like we want to we want to see that galaxy because it's there, which is part of it. But um, uh, the things that we learn will teach us about ourselves. And in addition, the technology that is used not only for things like James Webb, but for the whole space program percolate down to everyday life. Um, lots of NASA technology used in the, in the Apollo program and all the subsequent programs are now everyday parts of our existence that we take for granted. NASA actually publishes a report every couple of years about how their technology has, has percolated out to the masses. Um, sure. So it, it, really, it really pays dividends. Uh, even if it feels like a big expense for having a big camera in the sky sometimes. <laughs> right. Well, be on the lookout. I, I've heard or read from an astrophysicist from uh, the UK 
um, Dr. Becky Smethers, she shared the next targets that uh, JWST mm-hmm. coming mm-hmm. out. Messier 74 will be one of those targets. So we're getting an open face galaxy as a part of our uh, next uh, science target. So looking forward to that. Excellent. Yeah. Um, and we're just going to be seeing these images for the next 30 years. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's fantastic. Um, right. So yeah, like, you, you can't say enough about James. Webb. <laughs> right. There is a question. Uh, uh, you were talking about an expanding universe. Um, Ansel Puri is watching on Facebook. He says, is the universe always expanding like cookie dough in the oven? <laughs> um, that is an interesting analogy. Um, well, so the cookie dough in the oven, it expands, but it actually like it, it gets faster and then it starts to slow down as you get toward, uh, as it starts to solidify. And there are some models of, of the universe that, that kind of uh, where it's um, a closed universe where we expand for a time, but then eventually we reach a size where gravity and dark energy start to be balanced. And then we start collapsing back in. Um, this has actually been largely not discounted, but it's looking less and less likely uh, the more we, we uh, probe what dark energy is and um, look at how the universe has expanded over the past, how it's expanding now. Um, uh, so sort of, it, it, it's, it's a good model of a closed universe where like uh, we would expand and then kind of s- sort of stop and start to come back a little bit. Um, but uh, as it stands, it looks like we're going to continue to expand. The prevailing idea is that we're kind of in a flat universe where we kind of expand and at some point mm-hmm. they continue to expand, but at, at a less increasing rate. But it's also possible that we live in an open universe where we continue to expand at an increasing rate of expansion. And eventually that expansion becomes so fast and so large that it starts to dissociate atoms and nuclei. And then we just have a a big, dark, empty universe. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, I don't know if we can have that. (laughs) Anyway, Molly, thank you so much. So with that happy thought, I'll let you go. (laughs) That's right. That's right. For that. Okay. All right. So. Up next is uh, Daniel Higgins. Thanks again, Molly. That was awesome. You're welcome. Yeah, Daniel Higgins, uh, Astroworld TV. Um, uh, let's find him here. Where are you, Daniel? There you Hi, are. Dan. Great. <laughs> I'm we go. Good to be on the same stream as you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we'll be on the same stream real yep. soon again. <laughs> yep. Yeah, and, we're uh, we're uh, arch competitors here. We got the Astro Imaging Channel. We got Astro World TV. <laughs> you know. Uh, oh, oh, we have Visible Visible Dark too. There he is. <laughs> How you wow. doing, guys? Excellent. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> hey, all I'm gonna say is we have thirteen thousand subscribers on the Astro Imaging Channel, so just wow. that out there. <laughs> Great. Hey, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm the Fantastic. new guy on the block. I just broke a thousand. I mean, come on, <laughs> <laughs> you know. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, what a day. Wonderful. Yeah. Glad to have you guys on today. Thank you for joining the 100th Global Star Party. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations yeah. on the 100th Global Star Party. That's yeah, fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. And, yeah, and, it's you know, a, it's a it's a milestone but it seemed to actually happen so quickly. So When did the uh the first uh, Global Star Party happen? When when did you actually get this idea? What was the it, what's the background to it? Yeah, I think we're going back about two years. I think it was August 4th uh, is when we did the first event, and it was called Virtual Star Party uh, back then. Uh, I didn't really know quite what to call it at that point. Um, uh, you know, people said, well, is it going to be a real star party? Or is it a virtual one? And I said, okay, you know, virtual, because we can't get together because of COVID, right? So, right. Um, and I really, I... I kept hearing uh, amateur astronomers lamenting about how they couldn't go out, they couldn't do anything, you know, and I said, well, good Lord, we have all the technology right here, you know, amateur astronomers uh, and astronomers in general have been the early adopters of, I think, all the, you know, uh, technologies, I mean, certainly in uh, technical drawings, um, uh, photography, you know, innovators there, 
uh, innovators of digital uh, imaging, um, image processing, uh, you know, the refined precision in mechanics and electronics, you know, so it all uh, went through the crucible of astronomy and trying to you know, uh, as Molly said, you know, it, 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 it's a way for us to know ourselves better, you know, so, uh, Absolutely. or as Carl Sagan said, we're, we're a way to, uh, to, for the universe to know itself. So, <laughs> you know, yeah. being Absolutely. that we're all made out of star, star stuff, as uh, David Eicher is pointing out with all of his minerals and everything, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's, uh, it's amazing just to have eyes and senses and the ability to make the equipment that we do so that we can go and look out through our amazing windows and experience the ride, you know? Yeah, so, absolutely. Yeah. Well, you're doing a fantastic job with this and everybody nice. involved with the global star party is just fantastic. It's uh, amazing. You, and congratulations to you. Yeah. yeah. It's all about, it's all about the presenters though. And all about our audience too, that, that watches mm -hmm. global star party. Yeah. So, absolutely. absolutely. The support yeah. you have out there is 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 amazing. So I mean, keep up the great work. And and this is just uh, yeah. you said before. You just put you know you put the spokes in the wheel kind yeah, of. Yeah, I you, just like you know, assemble you know, this and you, together, know, you know and tighten up the nuts and you know, you know as, as plug it all in there, and bam you know then it happens. So yeah, but as yeah, there was some there, learning curve is, for sure. But sure. Uh, you know, uh, yeah. but I was I'm very thankful to. Uh, you know, the, the guy, the makers of all the software that I use, you know, to, to make it happen. So, Absolutely. uh, and I'm very thankful to all of my audience that said, that said, Hey, Scott, your audio is crap. You know, uh, <laughs> why don't you do this or do that? And so I got a lot of tips and a lot of help along the way. So really appreciate it from all of you. Awesome. That's great. Yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, Dan and I don't really have much of a presentation following Molly, so <laughs> we're yeah, just going to yeah, do our I'm comedy going bit. going on after the Beatles, <laughs> I guess, so, right? So, Scott, you know, I yeah. got to say, you know, when I said, hey, just remember we're on the East Coast and, you know, put us at a decent hour. Yes. I didn't really think you get a, you know, make us try and hit a home run after that grand slam by Molly. Because yeah. <laughs> I mean, I mean, I'm sitting there looking at me and me and yeah, Sean no, are, awesome. are texting each other saying, "Yeah, yeah, yeah." Dan and I are texting and <laughs> we're going, "Oh my God, we got to oh, follow." No, what do we say now? <laughs> Oh, no. I was going to say that. I started pounding back a couple no, drinks. I don't even know how to think to say that. So, no, well, it's great. Me. It's it's Aunt Molly. I don't know if you can feel the love, but uh, you know, we really we really do. Uh, you know, everyone's honored to be on uh, programs uh, with you, and uh, absolutely, I think that yeah, you devote a lot so. of your time to uh, uh, you know the community at large, you know, through all the programs that you do. I'm, I'm really impressed. And uh, I know it's a lot of work and I know how hard you're studying for your PhD and, and, uh, you know, uh, the little bit I know about professional researchers and professional astronomers and physicists, it's kind of a, a sausage factory. I mean, the scientists are really tough on each other, you know, and, uh, you know, you really have to work hard to get the little bit of funds and stuff from, uh, you know, the grants and stuff that are out there and really are expected to uh, produce, you know, in, in this way. So it's, it's uh, my hat's off to you. And, uh, but again, we're in the golden age of astronomy and discovery and exploration. We have this incredible, beautiful J West telescope, you know, without, and still have, you know, the amazing Hubble space telescope that's still generating uh, incredible data and, you know, all the, all the productive telescopes, including some telescopes that somebody told me once about 15 years ago that the 200 inch Palomar was like, uh, an antique, you know, it was, uh, <laughs> you know, and it was somebody at, when I was on Mauna Kea told me that, and I go, I don't think so, you know, because <laughs> like, you know, amateur astronomers, you know, we're always putting better instrumentation on our little telescopes, okay? Yeah. So, you know, uh, those super narrow band filters and and line filters and stuff like that. I mean, my goodness, you know, uh, I would have never expected to see the kind of images that we see coming from the hearts of downtown cities, you know, tons of light pollution and all the rest of it, you know, and, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah. 
you know, yeah. the, the, all three of you know this very well because uh, you you've all been faced with this, and and uh, you're you're living the cutting edge of uh, uh, amateur astrophotography. And you know, if you take, I think if they if professional astronomers take the ideas, the creative ideas that amateurs have, and apply it, you know, can you imagine if they had like giant narrowband filters for the two hundred inch telescope and and uh, <laughs> you know do all the the techniques that amateurs do you know like yeah, 100 hour yeah. exposures with the 200 inch telescope amateurs i wonder still what you would get participate in a lot of a lot of science that is being done even with our pretty modest instruments yeah um, absolutely I've, I've i know i've talked on here before about um and on the astro imaging channel and some other places about a uh, uh, variable star observations and, uh, and also a lot of supernovae and a lot of comets are discovered by amateurs and then reported and then there's follow-up observations on the big telescopes because we have our eyes on the sky on a much larger portion of the sky on our own time schedules whenever we want, as opposed to the big telescopes that have, um, you know, that every, every minute of time is, is, is called, is claimed right. uh, as by people trying to do research on those. So, yeah, we're still discovering things all the time. I was reading a paper recently about um, these uh, hydrogen kind of jets that are coming off of um, uh, the um, uh, of uh, the Centaurus, uh, the Hamburger Galaxy. I think it's Centaurus A. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, that were I think first actually noticed or at least like photographed in narrowband by an amateur astronomer. And there was observations done in, uh, in the paper was mostly about the radio observations done, but they actually included his image in the paper. That's so cool. <laughs> uh, I try to remember who, who it was. Um, uh, I, I can't remember, but uh, yeah. And then one of, one of my other friends, Tay Robeson, actually also imaged those. And they've been imaged by very few people, but it is possible with amateur gear to observe these really dim features um, it was a talk at the 2019 Advanced Imaging Conference about an amateur astronomer who was imaging the uh, tidal streams coming off of galaxies because he had a nice dark spot and a nice big telescope and actually was in a lot of papers uh, contributing to, to that research. So uh, yeah, astronomy is one of those incredible places where amateurs can contribute a huge amount to the science. Uh, alongside the professionals and actually somebody who's a professional astronomer can also be an amateur astronomer so uh yeah it makes it really unique yes yeah, absolutely and you know that, that that's something that i talk about quite a bit on the show with my other co-hosts that you know you don't have to have a 200 inch telescope to do science and to do legitimate stuff with your with your with the stuff that you have um, you know, you could sit there and you could, you could go buy a, a you know, a, a 80 millimeter scope and start doing some variable star observations or, or, yeah. uh, get, get, spend a little extra money and start doing like occultation imaging and all that kind of stuff. You know, all this stuff that we could do, um, because the technology has gotten so much better and the learning curve isn't as frightening i guess is the word that I'm, you know you know it, it used to be frightening that oh my god i can't do this it takes forever i can't do you know it, you know it takes 30 years to learn but you know people are starting to do real science with less time invested now than ever before and, right uh, that's it's, right it's, it's really yeah, and there's more and more pro-am projects going on too absolutely uh, ever before so uh you know we've got um you know, not only uh, seasoned amateur astronomers can get started, but uh, young people like Nicolina, uh, nine years old, you know, who's got all these, um, you know, asteroid candidates uh, from her work, you know, uh, in, in research science. So it's, uh, it's awesome, you know. Um, yeah, it's fantastic. In, yeah, it, it, we're just really in, it, 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 no matter what level you want to get started, no matter how far you want to take it, uh, there's really no barriers, you know? So, yeah, and I think yeah. that's always existed in astronomy, you know? Mm -hmm. Someone um, uh, uh, gave a little prodding uh, uh, to David about um, the fact that he was an amateur astronomer uh, working at Palomar, you know? Uh, but I see David as kind of like, um, you know, um, his, his uh, 
you know, his his distant cousin being, uh, you know, not li literally, but uh, Hummison, you know, Milton Hummison up at, at Mount Wilson, you know, uh, he only had four, you know, at 14 years of age, I think he stopped going to school, okay, and uh, became one of the world's greatest astronomers, you know, so, uh, mm -hmm. yep. you know, working yeah. with yeah, no. Hubble. I, I, I remember, you know, when I was young and how I got started in astronomy and it's just fascinating to me how things have progressed and like we were talking about the, t the technology. Um, I got started, uh, my dad had a little pirate scope. It was, uh, I think it was like a 30 millimeter Tasco or something like that. Yeah, yeah it was, yeah, yeah. And I, I would actually look at the moon um from the kitchen through the window i would look at the moon and it just fascinated me and I, I i started reading about the planets and the moon and uh um they bought me my first real telescope which was a four and a half inch reflector wow. and okay. I, I started building my own telescopes at that point an eight inch and a 14 inch reflector Damn. um i actually imported uh for the 14 inch mount i imported um uh, uh for the the 14 inch reflector i imported a mount from two Tucson, Arizona, um, which I when I was calling, I don't know if anyone remembers. Do you, do you remember the Bigfoot mounts? They were wooden. Yes, I remember. They were wooden. You remember those? I imported wooden, one of those giant, from, from uh, pillar bearings and yeah, yeah, and, yeah, uh, yeah. Huge. I had I one of those two or three inch steel shaft or something. Yeah, like that. it was it was an amazing mount and it carried the it carried the fourteen inch reflector really nicely. Um, sure. I remember calling down this to the states though. I was you know got to remember I was a young you know teenager. And uh -huh. I didn't know Tucson was pronounced Tucson. I was trying to get Tux, through to Tux, someone Tux, in Tucson. <laughs> Oh, God, yeah. But, you know, and, and they had uh, books. I remember I still have a book, actually, from way back in the 80s um, that uh, um, is about micro computer control of telescopes. And it, it gave you little bits of code that you could, you know, I, I can't remember what code it was oh, using. Yeah, back there was then. a book about. Yeah, there was a whole book on how to do there it. There was a whole book about how to do it and stuff. And now Bell maybe published it, something like yeah, that. Yeah, I can't remember who published yeah. it. I'd have to pull yeah. it and, and have a look. But um, I'm just fascinated thinking back to where I started and where we are today and the technology yeah. I have. Now I've got a telescope in the backyard that I control through a computer inside the house yep. and I can pre-program the imaging run for all the targets I want to image for the night, go to bed, wake up and just, you know, there's a, a treasure trove of, uh, of, uh, data yeah. there waiting for me. And it's, yeah. it's fantastic. And I think amateur astronomer is almost becoming, you know, a, a thing of the past in terms of a phrase, because we're, we're getting so advanced. We're, we're rivaling, just not you know, paid some for of the, it, that's all, you know, so yeah, that's yeah, the yeah. difference. Yeah, 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 exactly. That's true. That's true. So it's amazing and stuff. It's, but... it's one of the only, um, you know, I, I constantly remind people it's one of the only sciences that you can actually be working, interacting with professional researchers. You know, mm -hmm. none of us could be amateur. They just won't let us be amateur brain scientists or, you know, we can't be brain surgeons, <laughs> you know. Um, you know, we can't, uh, if you were really into gems, you could never touch or direct, you know, you're, you're, you couldn't find the hope diamond, you know, there's no hope mm -hmm. of hope holding the hope diamond, you know, um, yeah. but we get to look at the same galaxies, do the same research if we want. Okay. And really interact with, uh, with the professional community um, and have our name actually appear on science papers. Yeah, you know, that, so. yeah, yeah, absolutely, and yes. and and interact with the general public too, uh, with right. the outreach, like a show like this does, which is fantastic uh, yeah. to get people interested in astronomy and astrophotography and and you know the space that's out there, the cosmos, and um, you know it puts a different perspective on life. I think uh, if you take the time absolutely. to look up at the stars and and think about what you're looking at, you know the past, and um, that's just fascinating stuff. And I like to convey that to people. I like to talk about it. Um, don't ever get me drunk. I'll never shut up about it. You know? <laughs> I'll yeah, just keep going. You drunk no, okay, and then you can do one of the lectures with me because that's all I talk about is, is how right? uh, astronomy <laughs> reframes your whole view. Of, it does. Absolutely. You know, and uh, and if, if, if you're worried about some crazy, stupid little problem that you got, like, 
okay, maybe you got a, 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 ta a tax issue or somebody said something that yeah. embarrassed you or, you yeah. know, you feel... Or they got your coffee whatever. wrong. I mean, come on. Uh, yeah. That is don't mess like with the coffee. nothing. Yeah, don't mess up the coffee because that's just it. That's the end of the world. <laughs> that's, that's not so <laughs> the universe is over. Yeah, <laughs> Even it. Molly can't save it. No, How do you think Molly I'm surviving it. grad school? It's astrophotography. <laughs> Molly destroys the universe at the end of her yeah. talk. It, 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 the, the snap thing. And, yeah, yeah. All right. <laughs> So, anyways, the show has to keep moving on. We have uh, uh, Jason Gonzalez waiting in the wings okay. for us. Awesome. Here, is there anything else that uh, uh, you guys wanted to? Uh, I just wanted on? to be a part of this. I, yeah, I think it's a, a fantastic, uh, momentous occasion, and I wanted to be Thank a part you. of it and congratulate everyone that's involved and and you know the the viewership as well. Thanks very Absolutely. much. Absolutely, yeah. Thank you so much for uh, inviting the both of us. Thank you so much. Oh, yeah. thanks so much, guys. That's Take great. care. Yep. Thanks. Okay, so let's go ahead and bring on Jason Gonzel. Add you to the spotlight here, and then we are going to say goodbye to Molly. Goodbye, Molly. Look, he's Good taking day. my hair off. Bye bye. <laughs> get some sleep, Molly. Yeah, I think I'm actually uh, going to get off the call. I'm trying to get Sean off that. <laughs> Can't get rid of me. I'm here. I am very tired. It it's the shirt. Everybody. It just draws you in. It, it is <laughs> the shirt. Have a good night. And there's Jason with a beautiful, I know you did that image. So it's a yeah, yeah, it's, shot, Jason. Thank no, you. Wrong way. There we go. Yeah, yeah there you go. <laughs> <laughs> that is the view from the summit of Haleakala in Maui. Wow. Yeah, it's beautiful. You were talking about that earlier, weren't you? Oh, you were on Mauna Kea. You can see Mauna Kea in the distance. Mm hmm. Oh, yeah. right. Yeah. So yeah. I was over there for the 1991 eclipse on, at uh, the oh, that's beautiful. telescope. The thing that was amazing was just how transparent the sky is up there. It's incredible. You know, the full moon can be out and you can still see the Milky Way. Yeah, this oh. image, you can see it was shot at dawn and um, you can see the um, dawn's early light coming up over, over the Big Island of Hawaii. But you can still see the Milky Way pretty clearly. I'm trying to get out of the way here. My yeah, 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 yeah. We can see it. My, yeah. my jealousy grows each time I see that <laughs> image. It's, yeah, it's a beautiful image. That's I've tried to do stuff like that in Michigan, and the Milky Way washes out. The oh, moon yeah. will get yeah. up, you know, a couple degrees above the horizon, and the Milky Way just washes completely out. So um, maybe at Okie yeah. Text this year, I might be able to see something where because it gets dark enough for the milky way to stay in the sky a little longer so i'll have to play around with that uh when i go this year but uh no that what i like about the image is where you're at you see both sides of the bulge you've got crux down there near the corner and that's one of the uh constellations that's on my bucket list to image for myself sure yeah every, unfortunately every astrophotographer has embarrassing moments and mine my one of my crowning achievements was going up here in the middle of the night and my first hour of images when it was really dark out were all out of focus because I bumped the camera at some point and didn't notice oh. it. So yeah. <laughs> finally recognized it by the happens. time the sun was coming up. But happens to all of us. That's right. Maybe next time. Well, the right, view well, that you got, I'm sure, is that's buried in your mind forever. The view that you got oh, yeah. out there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I stayed up there for the sunrise. This was just past February, so not that long ago. But yeah, it's hard to follow. I, I thought Molly did an excellent presentation on the James Webb Space Telescope. I was going to talk Absolutely. a bit about it too. Um, but I haven't been here in a while, so I was just going to show some of uh, my most recent images. And for those that don't know me, I'm deep deep sky astrophotographer mostly, um, but I do get into like nightscape and planetary stuff. So I have some of that stuff to show you here. And we'll flip through that stuff. And then I wanted to talk a little bit about James Webb Space Telescope also. So we'll hop into that. So let me share my screen. Screen one, share. Let me know if this comes through. Yes. Wow. <laughs> yes. All right. So this is, um, I'm going to show some James Webb stuff later, but this is, um, this is an homage to what you can do with a backyard telescope. And um, 
uh, going on a decade of experience now with uh, shooting deep sky objects from my back patio. This is the Cocoon Galaxy, um, which is uh, just setting in the West these days, but um, it's a beautiful galaxy. And what really drew me to it is I had the moon up one night and I decided to shoot some hydrogen alpha subs um, on a galaxy. And this one kind of popped in my head because I'd seen it before and it's got um, quite a bit, as you can see. But the interesting thing with this image is I shot it separately with LRGB, which is, um, you know, vision natural light image, uh, the true color image here that you see. And then I also shot it with a narrow band filter in uh, hydrogen alpha. And that, that right here is the hydrogen alpha data for the galaxy isolated. So these are indications of all the star forming regions within the, the galaxy itself. And you can see that there's almost a bridge forming between these two. And if I turn on now, the uh, natural light image with that hydrogen overlaid, you can really see oh, wow. the, uh, the gas clusters just uh, basically clinging on to the outside of these, these two galaxies, which had just uh, passed through each other in recent history by cosmological standards. <clears throat> but the nice thing about isolating these uh, wavelengths like this is you can kind of turn them on and off at will to really visualize the contribution of the, the um, oh, yeah. hydrogen alpha light to the, really the beauty of the galaxy. I think it looks, it adds so much to aesthetically to, to the image, just to add those pops of color in there. Right. You know, and there's lots of galaxies in the background I can also see. Yeah, it's, it's, pretty well littered with uh, galaxies, none, none very huge in this field, but there is a big cluster. Oh, where is it here? Maybe I'm thinking of a different image, but yeah, most of these fuzzy dots are, are uh, background galaxies and smudges and things like that. But this is shot from the backyard through an eight inch uh, SCT telescope. Amazing. Really and then uh, also working on uh, getting back into planetary imaging for the summer. And this was my best shot at Jupiter this season so far. Wow. And uh, this is through a 12 inch Newtonian telescope. Worlds. And I was pretty pleased with the clarity. Yeah. And planetary is tough, especially from northern latitudes and uh, with smaller telescopes. So this was shot in near infrared, which helps calm down some of the atmospheric turbulence for the luminance layer and then colored in, in RGB shot with a monochrome camera. You can just see the great red spot here peeking around the corner. This That's what I was going to say. That's a, it's a unique view of the great red spot just appearing. Oh, yeah, yeah. right on the edge. That's cool. And it's, uh, it's on its way rotating into view. An interesting thing about viewing Jupiter during this season is we don't see ever see Jupiter in phases, but we do see the shadows creep in um, mm. when we view it from an angle. And so what we're seeing here on the on the right hand side, you get uh, the darkening because of the the uh, sun is illuminating it from the left in this image. So I got a couple other views. Um, I shot on different nights, and these are animations. And uh, this was shot with a one-shot color camera. So the clarity is not as good. And you can see, as I, I shot it, as the dawn was, was uh, brightening. So this is uh, rotation of Jupiter over the span of just over an hour. That uh, gives you an idea how fast Jupiter rotates. And, that's a challenge when you image it because you're trying to, to take um, a lot of frames and the longer uh, you expose for, the more frames you take, the more the rotation becomes a factor. But there's software for everything. So you can, uh, you can correct for this rotation effect um, if you so choose, but sometimes it's fun just to play the- Cool to see it back like moving. This, see the rotation. That's right. I got another one here that I shot into the dawn.
this one was set up as a social media post, so it's got some verbiage on it. But here I time lapsed the um, the image of Jupiter as I shot it and the telescope. So you can see I was shooting this in the middle of broad daylight. Wow. And the interesting thing here is you can really see the quality drop off as the video progresses. And that happens just as the sunlight lands on the telescope tube and starts to expand the tube, pushes the focus out and messes with the oh, collimation. Yeah. That's an issue you don't wow, have to deal lot. with uh, during the nighttime. Yeah. That's the moon IO uh, transiting in front of the planet. All right, so I promised we'd talk a little bit about James Webb Space Telescope. And uh, Molly, I can't really uh, compete with that presentation she gave uh, regarding the telescope, but I've got a little bit of a different angle on it um, because a lot of people in this room are astronomy enthusiasts and or astrophotographers. I wanted to talk a little bit about um, how to get a good look at this data. Um, outside of the mainstream releases that they make to the public because this telescope data as far as i can tell is uh i had thought that it, there was going to be science embargoes on a lot of this data but they're they've released 40 terabytes of raw data now to the general Jeez. public and anybody can go in and access this stuff and i just poked around just a little bit and uh, there's some amazing targets and data out there and uh it really hasn't seen the light of day. I know, Adrian, you mentioned M74. That data is out there right now for anybody to grab. They've already shot it then. Okay. Yeah, it's, um, it hasn't been, there's not been a mainstream release that I saw of the, of the images, but yet you can go in there and, and pick apart the data. So I wanted to show people just how you can go in and look at this stuff. Um, really the home base for everything JWST is the Space Telescope Science Institute. And this website uh, manages data from pretty much the, the telescopes we have in space, but mainly uh, the Hubble data and uh, the James Webb Space Telescope data is all searchable here. So if you go over on the right hand side um, and you click on James Webb Space Telescope, it'll take you to this landing page. It's just got all kinds of information about the James Webb Space Telescope. Uh, press releases, um, user documentation, which I'll show that's pretty interesting. And the data here is mostly stored in, let me see if I can find it now. Where did she go? All right, well, that was a bust. I swear I just looked at it and it was here, but so the, the images are all stored on a, a platform called the MAST portal. And I'll, um, I know that there's a link in this, this, tell, uh, this, oh, here it is, okay. It's short for the Mikulski Archive for Space Telescopes, MAST. So if you click on MAST, you can see here it's got uh, some mission um, highlights. And you can click on each one of these and see a little bit. Um, it's got some high-level science projects, uh, uh, products which are um, more polished material you can look at. But what I'm going to show here is the MAST portal. Okay, now if I click on this, um, if you don't have an account, it will ask you to, uh, it won't show you all the information. So you got to go in and create an account. And if you don't already have an account, it'll be over here uh, where my mouse is hovering um, to create an account. Mm -hmm. well, there's a number of different ways to search through here. Um, and a significant cost for that? For what? The account, or is it a free? free? No, no, it's all free. It's all free. Well, I mean, you pay if you pay taxes. <laughs> Actually, if you don't pay U.S. taxes, you can still get it. Yeah, it's, le it's less than free. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
So there's a number of different ways to go in here and search, okay? And and it can get pretty overwhelming because there's probably millions of uh, database files in here. Um, but one one quick way to go in here and look is the uh, the JWST instrument keywords. That allows you to pick an instrument. The main imaging cameras, on, um, at least for pretty pictures on JWST are this near infrared cam, the near cam, and then the MIRI, which is the mid infrared instrument. Near cam though is, uh, is what most of, the, uh, most of the published images come out of. So if you click on search there, you can um, you get this splash page that pulls up um, and I don't want this to get too complicated, but down here in this target name thing, there's, there's a bunch of ways to search, search for targets, but this just shows a list of 105 targets that JWST has imaged. Um, so I'll just click on one of these. I, and I know from already searching through this, the NGC 7320 is part of Stefan's Quintet. So if we go in there, we'll see the Stefan's Quintet data. So if you click on search, it pulls up. Um, these are basically all the files available for that target. Shows over here on the right, it shows a graphical overlay of each one of the frames that the JWST took and where it sits over top of Stefan's Quintet. You can see the galaxy cluster in the background. So you can see they pretty much carpet on this entire area with pictures. Hmm. But what you really want to see here um, are the fully calibrated images. And those are images you can take and open up in, a, in an image viewer. And they're already fully calibrated. They're already um, basically ready to go, ready to process. And those are product level three. 2B is not a fully ca calibrated image. So you can sort this column here to see the level three images. So that took the list down from Whatever, it's, whatever I said, 105 down to just three, uh, a handful of level three images. Mm -hmm. And these, all these images are shot through different filters, okay? So the number here after F is the filter number. So you can look at each filter that these images were shot through. When I was on this other page and I pointed out that JWST user documentation, I'm going to go in here and show everybody a little bit about that camera so we can get an understanding of what files you may want to pull down. Okay, so now I drilled down into near infrared camera and I'm going to look at filters here. And this is going to show us all the filters that are installed on the JWST near infrared camera. And it's really all shown in this chart here. So the, the, the sensors are divided into two um, separate detectors. There's a short wavelength channel and a long wavelength channel. And you can see all these filter names, um, their name naming convention is based on the wave, the center wavelength of the filter. So this, these are infrared filters in microns. The visual spectrum ends right about 0.7 uh, microns. So right about here. So all these filters to select from are all infrared. But you can see the way they color coded them from the red end of the spectrum, the further infrared end of the spectrum to the closer infrared end of the spectrum. And it shows you basically how they colorize these images essentially is when they select from these filters, um, they map the colors to RGB for a visual presentation that's um, in the same order as they appear in the visual spectrum. That's pretty common, unless there are some narrow band images where they do false colors. But I'm gonna hop back now to this and show you, and I've, already looked into this as far as what these two files mean, you can ignore this SEGM file. The one that has this tail that's I2D is what you want. So this right here is a 4.4 micron image. 
That's what the F44 means. And I'll down, download that. It's a FITS file. Um, if you do astrophotography, you have no problem opening FITS. If you don't, there's um, NASA cells, not cells. <laughs> NASA provides some free yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, converters to go from FITS to like a TIFF file or something you can open. And that's called uh, FITS Liberator <clears throat> for anybody right. who's interested in downloading that. FITS Liberator has been around for a long time. Yeah, yeah, it still still works. Mm -hmm. All right, so for some reason, my download's going real slow. I've got things open here in, uh, <clears throat> inside Fix Insight that we can look at. Since Mr. I was just I, downloading I, that question stuff. question I have, uh, is it better to use a, a, a PC running Windows to get out a bunch of this stuff? And to use a lot of the I don't think it matters. I mean, it's all web based. So I, yeah. I think mm -hmm. as long as you've got a, a viewer capable of looking at FITS files, right? You should be good. So anyway, I've already done the, the slow downward work, download work. And um, these are the files I pulled down from Stefan's Quintet. So this is with the near cam, this image here. This is a 3.56 micron near infrared image. So this gives you a sense of the data that uh, these images were constructed from. And you can see in this large galaxy, it's, if we zoom in, it's resolved individual stars within this galaxy. It's just remarkable. And this is a near infrared camera picture. You can also do the same type of searches for the mid infrared, and these are the mid infrared Im images. This is a smaller detector. So you can see that if you assemble these kind of images, you have to mosaic them together. But they kind of fit right here if I overlay them. So you can see that's Stefan's quintet, and this is 7.7 <clears throat> 7 microns. So this is deep into the mid infrared now. And you can see all the dust within this galaxy. These are kind of oriented the same. I see. Wow. And you can just see all the Crazy. all the dust lanes that pop out in the mid infrared. So now the images were released, and I'm noticing. I think the the whole thing was flipped around. Was that to? <clears throat> Was that so that the view that they presented to the public was matched a direct face on view if you were to if you were to use your Superman eyes and go look at it yourself, the galaxies would appear at a certain place and not not where they appear in these uh, in this data. Well, I mean, there's a couple of things that happen here. I mean, once uh, one one aspect is is the uh, the JWST, like like a lot of reflective telescopes, presents an image, or like a lot of telescopes with complicated optic op optics presents an image that's not upright or image correct. So, I think the JWST raw data needs to be flipped. Looks like it just needs to be flipped horizontally to. Yeah, I think it's. Kind of match. I'll flip, flip vertically like this. Yeah, it was probably presented like this and then rotated one, 180. <laughs> but anyway. Something that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I mean, there's, I, there's a set of transforms you need to go through to get it uh, correct to the appearance in the sky. Yeah. And that, and that makes sense. But I can show you here, then this is... Um, this is that M76 data I just pulled down while we were talking, actually. Um, nice. And this is uh, three color channels overlaid in infrared. Mm -hmm. So you can see, again, individual stars resolved in the galaxy and some nice, I think these are hydrogen regions here out towards the wings. Oh, yeah. Look Looks at like that. you can almost see dust lanes in some of those regions. Yep. So this is just a quick combine on that. Um, yeah, I recognize the, 
there was like one six pointed star somewhere in the middle, and the rest of that was the rest of that was what we're gonna. So, so we're basically we're getting a sneak preview of if they release this image to the public. There's the star that I would I would suspect is in the Milky Way, that six pointed one. Yeah, right and here. These these galaxies <laughs> here. Background this galaxies. Data, this true. data is released to the public. They're, they're oh, releasing the data as soon as they get it. <laughs> true. Yeah. It, yeah. The uh, which the is color amazing, correction, you know, or the the finished processed image like the uh, five that have been shared. Um, I wonder if we're you know we'll see something similar, but just looking at the raw data and uh, seeing you put it together for yourself, um, Jason, it's you know it, it's just really cool to kind of see. We're seeing even more of what JWST is already imaged. So, yeah, like one thing that surprised me, and I, I think anybody who goes in and pokes around at this data, it's not for the faint of heart. Uh, if you look at how actually messy this is from a from an imaging standpoint, um, with this banding and um, you know patchwork quilt of assembling frames, it's it's a challenge to work with. And I have to give a lot of credit, a lot of credit to that science team um, for putting out images as beautiful as they did, because it is a ton of work to get uh, this data into shape that that's uh, presentable in that format. And I don't know if that's more because this, you know, they're these are more designed to be science in, uh, instruments, and uh, these little defects don't matter as much. But I was a little bit surprised at that. The, how rough the calibration looked at on some of this data. Yeah, I, I think that, that might be it. And just coming from an amateur myself who shoots way wide field, but um, I imagine that the data is being poured over, you know, for scientific reasons, but you still have that science team, like you talked about, that cleans that data up for public consumption. Yeah, so it's like you, there's two different two different things that NASA wants to do um, as JWST gets more images is continue to drive the public interest in it, even if the public thinks that it's just a one shot color Sony cam on steroids, it still gets them interested in objects in space and you know, it's uh, it, it's it's an exciting time, and I think someone mentioned it also drives up the uh, willingness to spend money for even more missions like this by seeing the uh, beautiful pictures alone can sometimes do things like that. Yeah, so this is one of those uh, images I pulled down and did a um, just a quick edit on. Um, by edit, I mean take the files. Um, combine the color bands and present a um, you know a full color image, kind of like the the uh, the Smax Galaxy cluster, the, the initial release. This one is Abel two seven four four. It's one that Hubble has imaged before, also, um, but it's just a just basically a deep field. It's there's not many uh, gravitational lensing uh, instances here. It's just galaxies and galaxies on top of galaxies as far as you can see uh, some real beautiful spirals and uh, you know like this one with a nice uh, hydrogen alpha regions highlighted just some twisted messes wow. of galaxies and, uh, but I, I didn't see that this one was even released to the uh, public as a as a finished image so I just kind of grabbed it and did a quick edit on it but I was pretty pleased with the outcome here uh, it looks good. You know, I was looking at the uh, the, the MAST um, website, and it's it is the Barbara A. Mikulski, uh, uh archive, and she was a um, uh, politician, and uh, apparently really championed uh, the Hubble Space Telescope as a politician. So that's the background there. 
So one more cool thing with uh, James Webb Space Telescope is they can do planets too. And um, the image that they released of Jupiter, I thought was stunning. Not, I don't know. It just wasn't uh, wasn't balanced as far as the exposure. Like the the center band of the planet was blown out. And mm. when I when I went in there and looked at the data, I was uh, pretty happy to see that the original image from the telescope was properly exposed. And so I went in there and I grabbed a few of these um, and not all of them were properly exposed, but these two narrow band channels um, were, and this is 2.12 microns and 3.23 microns. So I grabbed both of these. Um, they look dramatically different, these two channels. Mm -hmm. um, the 212 is, super sharp and this other one is just kind of funny looking but the um cool thing about this is you can see the ring of jupiter within these images and i believe this is ganymede here um in front and it's got a mask over it so you can't see the the face of it itself but you can't see its shadow here which is landing next to the great red spot hmm. wow. i think that other that other one showed aurora. Yeah, I don't know if that, is that showing aurora at the poles on Jupiter or is that? I don't know. There's definitely a glow. I don't. I don't know if it's aurora or not. Um, but I took these two color channels and combined them. You know, just using those two channels into into um, color information. So it's kind of a colorized look at. Um, you can see now both channels at once and you get a, a better sense of uh, how they interplay. And I pulled down this other channel, which um, was a, a wide band channel and this. Oh, there are the rings. Yeah, this exposure really showed the rings nicely. Oh, it sure does. But it was taken at a different time, I think even on a different day. So this is a different moon in a different orientation. So I kind of hacked my way through this and I lifted the ring out of that picture and inserted it on this one. So now it's kind of a composite, but now you can see that the color mix and then the... And then the, the ring. The ring also. So I haven't seen the public release of the Jupiter data, but I imagine the uh, if the image of Jupiter with those channels is released they will probably do something similar having showing jupiter with its ring is it's gonna have that would have a pretty big impact on seeing jupiter kind of in a different light yeah and i wouldn't be surprised if what you've already done with the data isn't something that's going to be publicly released if nasa scientists get on it and kind of do their version of what you're doing and then colorize it it's very well the image very well will look something like this yeah i mean it's completely false color image but the the point of doing this is to kind of get that color contrast um so your eyes can see those different uh features yeah. i i mean you know honestly i mean whether you look at it like this or you look at it like this i mean the black and white is a really nice uh, view of it yeah Yeah. Beautiful. I really like the, I like seeing it with the rings. I, mean, I do too. Has do the too. rings, but I think it's been a while since we've looked at it and, you know, with its little thin ring around it. Yeah. Yeah. I thought it's cool. You know, the, the exposure is such with this, you know, you can see how much just to extract that ring out of the glare of the planet is pretty tough because the James Webb Space Telescope has got some crazy diffraction spikes. And then you throw an extended object like Jupiter in the middle and it's just lines going every direction. Yeah. It's really hard to get back to just something clean, but amateur astrophotographers deal with a lot of bad data. So we've got tricks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it, almost, it almost begs the question, um of being hired by nasa to do this for money because you are you already know the tricks to 
get that little ring out of all of that data and then recombine it with other data. So I'm sure. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah uh, I wonder yeah, if they're watching party. the Global Star Party 100. <laughs> yep. Well, Scott, thanks for having me on. I really appreciate Jason. it. Congratulations on making it to 100. And, um, yeah, to thank you so much. Thanks for opening the door for a lot of uh, for our audience who did not know that uh, you could get at this data um, and showing them. Yeah, I mean, I, I hope it wasn't a mind numbing, um, you know, look at the <laughs> the bowels of the, the archive. But really, my main point is you can yeah, anybody who makes an account right now has access to this and yeah. it's really phenomenal to look at and to have such immediate access on it. I mean, the dates on that M74 data, um, I think was just, those observations were very recent. So they're, yeah, they're pretty much handing it right off to the public, which is pretty cool. That is very cool. Yeah, there's hey, gonna be Jason, discoveries. Jason, I, have, I have a question for Jason. Yeah, go ahead. Hi, this is Bob Fugate. Um, Hi. How dark is your backyard? You showed that first picture from your backyard. So I'm just wondering how bright your sky is. Uh, there. Yeah, I'm, mine's Bortle five six. Depends on okay. the season, really. <laughs> but, but yeah, I, I generally pack a ton of exposure uh, on images yeah. like that. The, okay. All right. That, thanks. Yeah, that cocoon galaxy is probably probably got twenty out more than twenty hours of exposure on it. Okay. So that's how I deal with the noise. Excellent. Thank you, Jason. That's great. Yep. That's great. Um, okay, so we are going to uh, bring on uh, Daniel Barth. Daniel uh, is a science educator, has been for decades. Uh, Daniel and I met each other uh, decades ago at, um, at the uh, uh, at Scope City, which was a retailer, uh, I had several shops in in uh, California, one of them in, in uh, Nevada, but uh, Daniel lived in California at that time. Uh, and, uh, and then he went off to become an educator teacher. Uh, and lo and behold, he moved out here to Arkansas uh, and walked into our shop here at Explore Scientific <laughs> and we meet again. So it was so cool. Um, uh, but Daniel has uh, been doing a great program called How Do You Know? Uh, and um, his, uh, his uh, programs uh, teach science you know, to, uh, to anyone that wants to learn it, you know, and, um, uh, you know, I, I think that the premise of the show, you know, we conceptually know a lot of things like the earth is round instead of flat and, uh, you know, that uh, the moon is round instead of flat. Uh, but uh, he gives us kind of the tools and the steps to actually prove it. Okay, so, uh, which is really cool. Uh, he's written some uh, books. Uh, one of them is called Star Mentor, which is a Springer book uh, that you can get right now. It's, it's brand new and has many of the um, hands on projects, which really just cost a few dollars to uh uh you know an expense to demonstrate uh, many of the the concepts of science and astronomy um so i think that's a wonderful thing and uh it's great that you're here daniel to celebrate our 100th global star party thanks thanks scott so uh your 100th star party our uh 30 years or so as uh, as astronomy pounds which is yeah. really astonishing. You know, I, I just want to say, as, as an educator, I love seeing the glee on everyone's face tonight. Everyone showing images from the web, from their backyard, from their, their own telescopes, and everyone else just, the smiles light up. This is what we do as people who reach out. It's part of the nature of discovery. We all want to participate in it. People who weren't there kind of wonder how in the world did they get a billion people to watch uh, Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin step out of the capsule on the limb and walk on the moon? How did they do that? Everybody wants to participate in the discovery. 
we think of discovery, scientific discovery as one person somewhere in a laboratory out in the jungle or out in the dark with a telescope going, aha, Eureka. But it's a much more social process than that. And I see this, I see this with all the people tonight. I heard it when Molly was talking about, and Hubble excited me so much. It, it's changed my life. It's changed the path of my life. I decided to study science and astronomy. This kind of thing, Scott, is true of all of us. And whether we had mechanical mentor like Hubble, or we had an actual person who mentored us, who said, yeah, sure, come have a go at our telescope. What they were doing is they were giving us an opportunity to discover for ourselves. As an educator, as someone who does outreach, and that's really my life, it's what I do. Really what we wanna do, I, I use a fishing metaphor, or we wanna set the hook hard, like we just <laughs> yeah. snagged a trout in the stream with a fly rod. We wanna set the hook. It was, it was done for me, the title of my book, Star Mentor, uh, I got that from my very first star mentor, who was a local village priest. And he had uh, he had a 60 by 900 millimeter Tasco telescope on an equatorial mountain in his office. Mm. I bugged him relentlessly. Can we please, Father, can we please, can we please, can we look at the moon? Can we try the telescope, please, please? I, I, was, I'm, I don't know why he didn't reach for a mallet. I'm sure it was horribly annoying. But when he said sure, and he called all the parents and I uh, said, bring the kids over. We're going to take the telescope out in back of the rectory. And we saw the moon and we saw some different colored stars. And after a while, a lot of people drifted away, but he and I were out there and I said, ooh, what's the yellow one? And he said, okay, go ahead and move it. You know how. And it was Saturn and the rings. Mm. And it was glorious. And awesome. for me, that hour that that man took out of his life with his telescope to say, sure, come on up. Here's the eyepiece, here's the focuser, have a go, discover for yourself. That event changed the course of my life entire. Webb is doing that right now for millions of people. That's right. And I have to, I have to degree, disagree slightly with one of the things Molly said. She said, oh, there's an instrument on the Juno spacecraft. That has no scientific value. It's just there for outreach. God bless you, ma'am, but you're wrong. That camera that's only for outreach, that is maybe not discovering anything new about Jupiter, but that's not what it's for. It's discovering new scientists and astronomers here on Earth from a billion miles away. Mm -hmm. That's pretty awesome. And that's always been my point in astronomy. And we talk about... I, I, my hat's off and I really, I found, and I just, I'm astonished by some of the imagery. Some people, some of the folks here bring to, it just stuns me. Uh, some of you may remember the movie 2010, the year we made contact with Roy Scheider was released in 1984 or five. And it was about going to Jupiter and they had images of Jupiter. If you go look at the movie and you look at the, these images of Jupiter and you go, geez, why do they use such crappy imagery? I could do better than that with my telescope in my backyard and my Sony, my Sony Alpha camera. And yes, we can. The technology, you have to realize, Scott, that the methodology for gathering and focusing light really hasn't changed since Galileo and Newton's day. Well, we've gotten bigger, you know, Newton's reflector was oh about a two and a half or three inch mirror galileo's first refractor the first astronomical telescope had a, had a diameter of less than 30 millimeters it was tiny compared to even the the basic toy stuff we have today for kids mm, right but the fact is tremendous discoveries tremendous discoveries have been made with people at the eyepiece pen and pencil no camera modest telescope, tremendous number of discoveries have been made. And for me as an educator, I see my job, take students out in the dark, introduce them to a telescope and start anew in them, set their hearts afire for astronomy, for the process of discovery. There's nothing like the feeling that you get 
the first time you look through the telescope. And for me, it was Saturn. For many people, it's the moon. I've had students out, oh, have you ever used a telescope before? No, this is my first time. Okay, we're looking at the first quarter moon tonight. And there we go, it's focused for you. Just have a look. I've had, I've had students burst into tears. <laughs> it's just like you see some of these videos on the web where some little kid gets a puppy and just bursts into tears with happiness. I've seen the same thing at the eyepiece of a telescope. Yes, that's right. As marvelous as the discovery process is with web, for me, I'm not out in the dark with a magnificent instrument looking for new things out in space. I'm here out in the dark with modest instruments setting hearts of fire, searching for new astronomers, making new enthusiasts, and, you know, casting the fly, setting the hook. That's, that's what we're doing here. And some of the most marvelous things, and we're starting to see it come out. Somebody talked about, uh, <clears throat> I'm looking for my share button now. Here we go. Somebody was talking about, uh, there we go. Somebody was talking about M74. And here's the web image. Here's the web image of M74. Oh my God. It's I know. It's unrecognizable. Wow. It is. It is. And we take a look and we go, oh, well, that's M74. Well, I'm kind of used to this Hubble image of M74. <laughs> and it's going to be up for us uh, late September and through October and early November. We'll be able to see Pisces and look up with our small telescopes, and we'll be able to see, as Messier did, M74. We're not going to get this view, but it's going to be photons from that galaxy into my eye, and it's going to be setting me just alight with giggles and smiles, and people look in, and we've talked about this, Scott. They come up to the eyepiece. It's a party in a box. You set up your telescope unless you're somewhere really remote. People will find you. They come up and they go, ooh, is that a telescope? Yes. Wow, what are you looking at? Uh, it's M74. What's that? It's a galaxy. And this guy discovered it. And it's not a comet, but it kind of looks like one. Can I have a go? Sure. They step up to the eyepiece. And the first question is, now, what am I looking at? Explain this to me. And now they have their eye on the eyepiece. You can't see what they're seeing. But they're asking you, the experienced astronomer, what am I seeing? Help me interpret this. Help me understand. The knowledge we give them makes the experience richer, yep. deeper, more delightful, more intriguing. And if we do our job right, more they're related. not happy. They're not happy because they want more. <laughs> We're hmm. like, here's a crouton. Would you like a turkey dinner? You know, we, we, we give them a taste. And we go, oh, well, of course there's more. Wow, can I operate a telescope like this? Where can I get one? Can I do it with binoculars? I have some at home in the garage. And you, you start them off. And everyone here tonight, this, this marvelous adventure, the 100th Global Star Party, and I just, that, that makes me smile every time I say it. Everyone here had someone take them out in the dark and say, here, have a go, have a go at the eyepiece. Here's the focuser, turn it this way. Tell me what you see. Now here's what you're looking at. And it's, it's like standing on top of a big hill and throwing rocks and hoping to start an avalanche. And we do, and we do. And Webb is a huge rock rolling downhill and it's going to start its own avalanche. The Apollo moon landings, had an avalanche effect. They brought millions of people into amateur astronomy. The Hubble telescope, Comet Hale-Bob, all of these momentous things that we see in the sky, the Jupiter-Saturn conjunction we had a couple of years ago. Uh, I was trying to go out and watch Hyapetus transit Saturn. It was cloudy here. I couldn't get it. But every time I bring people out and I say, oh, this sky tonight, you won't see this again in your lifetime. Here are some things. Here's what makes it interesting. Here's why this is a snapshot now. If we come out again over the weeks, over the months, people are with me for a semester class or a year class, and the sky changes. And they're like, wow, I never knew. I never knew the sky changed. I thought it was eternal. And in a sense, it is. 
but we view the sky from this lovely rapidly spinning platform called Earth that's orbiting a dwarf star. And the view we have every night is a bit different. And the planets are moving and comets and asteroids pass across our field of view. <clears throat> Was out looking for K2. I won't see that again in my lifetime either. And people say, but you, you can only see it once or twice and then it's gone. Something new is always coming along. This thirst I have, I understand how people like uh, Edmund Hillary climbing to the top of Mount Everest like Scott looking for the pole, <clears throat> like Balboa seeing the Pacific for the first time. I understand their joy and delight because I share in their experience every time I go out at night and look up. And when I have a pair of binoculars or a telescope, my experience is deeper and richer. And every time I get to participate as Galileo did, as Copernicus did, as can you imagine how Newton felt the first time he put his eye to his little reflector and found out that it worked? I mean, for him, that probably wasn't that unusual. Everything he played, it was like the Midas touch. As a scientist, Newton was golden. Everything he touched kind of boom, came out right. And, but all of us going out and seeing these things and discovering for ourselves, and realizing that we participate in a science that is easily 100,000 years old. We've talked on my show, I've talked with Scott many times, how we have these odd terms in like moon and planet. He did a show one time and had a stack of astronomy and physics textbooks about two feet high. And I said, hey, Scott, you know what these all have in common? These go back to like the 1960s. They said none of them have a definition for the words moon or planet. And Scott was like, what, wait, is gullible in the dictionary? That can't be true. Some of these terms we have are so ancient that what we understand about these objects has gone through revolutionary transformations. Hmm. We think about the moon and we thought, oh, we knew the moon in the 50s and 60s. When Scott and I were boys, we were taught, oh, well, the moon was created when one big blob of material that was forming the earth and it spun too fast and a piece of it ripped away the fission theory. And all those craters are volcanic. Continents drift, that's nonsense. What could move a continent? <laughs> oh, and all the volcanic craters on the moon? And then like people like Gene Shoemaker come along and they go, um, they're not. They're impacts. What, rocks from space? How silly. You realize, you realize, <laughs> It was the mid 90s when the idea that a comet or an asteroid impact might have killed off the dinosaurs became commonly accepted. That is our lifetime sort of stuff. That's crazy. <laughs> the people growing up now, the kids growing up now are not going to remember a time before Webb and before Hubble. <clears throat> For them, well, of course you can photograph the rings around Jupiter. And I've taught for decades. Oh, if you want to see the rings around Jupiter, you got to fly there. <laughs> no. The process of collecting, focusing, refracting, reflecting light, gathering it, bringing it to a point, that hasn't changed. What's changed is our ability to interpret that light that we gather. The imaging technology. My eye and a sketching pen. Oh, my eye and a cheap camera just held at the eyepiece. Oh, my eye and oh, wow, a digital camera, really? I don't have to use film and hyper it with chemicals so it's more sensitive? No, I can, well, yeah, sure, I can turn my digital camera up to 16,000 ISO, why not? Um, these things that we take for granted, the, the camera technology that I have in my, my new Galaxy smartphone. Oh my God, you couldn't have bought that for love nor money 10 years ago. And the things we put into the hands of people, how many people really understand how powerful an imaging instrument they have in their pocket that they use to call their friends and fam? They know this is a cool camera. Wow, look, I can get a great picture of my dog. But to say, oh, here, hold it up to the eyepiece of a telescope and take a picture of the moon. Really, I can do that? Oh, yes. 
there's so many things we can do with instruments that are not grand, that are not expensive, that are not uncommon, that are not rare. In my last program, Scott, we talked about the discovery of Neptune. The yep. two principal guys in our story, John Adams, who later became astronomer royal, and Urbain Le Verrier, the French fellow who headed up the Paris Observatory and became their equivalent of an astronomer royal. These two guys, when they figured out where Neptune was, they had no telescopes available. They didn't have anyone where they could say, excuse me, the way Thomas uh, <laughs> Bob did. And oh, can I borrow your telescope? These guys back in that day in the 18, mid 1800s, they didn't have access to a telescope. And they asked people, they worked in observatories. Can you look at this? I think there's a new planet there. Go away, kid, you bother me. This telescope time is rare and expensive. These instruments are rare and expensive. Do you know how much these cost? Are we gonna point this at your crazy idea? Go away, kid. Yeah, they were right. And in Leverrier's case, he got his revenge. He became director of the observatory and fired all his detractors. But today, if somebody has an idea, oh, I'd like to look at, you don't have to go very far to find a telescope or a nice pair of binoculars. There are astronomy clubs all over and we're reinvigorating and meeting in person again <laughs> for the first time in a couple of years post COVID. And people can come out and you can go, oh, can I try this? Can I see the moon? I've heard about this thing called rays and craters. Can we see that? Oh, are there really mountains and craters? Can you see the sunrise? Can you see the sun light up one side of like a range of mountains and it's really the rim of a crater and the other side's in darkness. And I heard Galileo found the height of a mountain looking at, can I do that? And my answer is, sure you can. Step up to the eyepiece. Ready, set, and it's kind of like putting somebody on the very top of one of those crazy Olympic ski jumps. Right. If that was me, you'd have to handcuff me and give me a shove. But these, these Olympic guys, they get up, do, do, ba, and off they go down the hill. And that's what we do, Scott. Yeah. We bring people up to the edge of the hill. Come on, here's the eyepiece. <laughs> and we give them a shove. And we unleash a torrent of emotions and delight and joy. And by helping teach them and train them and helping them to understand what they're seeing. You know how many people saw Neptune, Scott, and didn't know what they saw? Right. So they didn't get any credit. Right back to Galileo. Right. And before that, it's naked eye visible if you've got really good skies. We know that people had been seeing Neptune for centuries before it was discovered. But it's understanding the classic question we get from beginners all the time. Now, what am I looking at? Mm. And when we light that fire, when we say, sure, first one's free. Telescopes, they're not that expensive. Don't worry about that now. Here's the eyepiece. Have a look. It's amazing. And then we see someone go, wow. I did a couple of wows tonight with some of the images. When, when someone bursts into tears, it's so beautiful. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Yeah. It's a grand, glorious adventure. And we give people a shove. We send them off down this accelerating adventure of discovery and delight. We light hearts of fire. And actually, that's the subtitle I wanted for my book. I said, I said, oh, I want to call it Star Mentor, Setting Hearts of Fire for Astronomy. They said, no, 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 that's too obscure. I'm like, you don't know me yet. And they won. They got a different, more prosaic uh, after title, Hands-On Projects and Lessons in Observational Astronomy for Beginners, uh, which I suppose is more descriptive, but a lot less fun. I'm an instigator. I'm an instigator. I'm a subversive. I'm somebody who says, oh, you don't know what excites you. You don't know what delights you. You're not sure what you want to do with your life. Have I got a show for you? No, no, it's right in there. Go ahead and look. Tell me what you see. And this is what we do. And for my money, as an educator, who's someone who is concerned for how the public views our place in space, for someone who's concerned about helping people to understand how science is interpreted, how we know 
what we know. This we will be there, the legacy of Hubble and Webb. Beyond my lifetime, I'm sure. Beyond my lifetime, I'm certain. And the wonderful thing we're starting to see now, people are starting to combine the images. Oh, here's an X-ray image from the Chandra Observatory. Here's a visible light image from Hubble. Here's an infrared image from Webb. Oh, let's mush them all together. And you get this amazing view that has so much more information and detail. It is seeing with new eyes. We've all seen these memes where they show side by side. Uh, here's what the Hubble sees. Here's what the Webb sees. Wow, how much better, gee, that old thing. It's an antique now. Well, maybe, still pretty badass if you ask me, but we are literally looking anew at the universe and creating day by day a new understanding and bringing to the public an amazing appreciation for how we know what we know. When we do that, we help, we help develop interest in science. Somebody said, are you trying to get people to trust the science? I said, no. Science isn't about trust or belief, it's about data. But people have to understand if somebody says, how do you know? The real scientist will give you an answer and the limitations of it. Uh, I know within these parameters, here's what we're seeing. Here's what we don't know. Here's the uncertain part. And some people are, you mean you're not sure? And so we need to help people understand science isn't sure, science isn't done. The science isn't settled. That, that's, that's a bounder, that's a fraud. That's, that's a Nigerian nobleman trying to get you to help him with a financial transaction. The science is settled? No, Webb should tell us all the science is never settled. We could always look a little deeper, find a little more. And we say, oh, what we know all these things so well. Uh, there've been a number of times when people have come out and said, um, physics is finished. All we're going to do is being adding a few decimal places. And you young people in physics, that's, I think it was Hemholtz who said that. Oh man, was he wrong? That was right on the, the dawn of the quantum revolution. Science is always going to be revolutionized because our understanding is, and our understanding is imperfect. Web can be a tool, not just for the scientists, but for the everyday man and woman in the street to come to delight and to understand how we know what we know, what the limitations are, and to learn what real science looks and feels like. If somebody's sure, they're not a scientist. If somebody's certain, they're not really playing fair with the data. If somebody says, oh, absolutely correct, this is the true fact, and you know the uh, contrapositive of that, here's the secret stuff they don't want you to know. Well, you know what? We armor people against that kind of flim flam, pseudo, uh, pseudoscience and you know, phony astronomy. We armor them by delighting them, by engaging them, by helping them improve their understanding. All of us can become better astronomers. All of us can look into the eyepiece and fall in as into a well, and we can dive a little deeper. And I'm sorry if I'm mixing my, my metaphors here. Excuse my joy, glee, and delight, but I am so excited. And you know what? This fall, I start my 46th year in the classroom. I still love my job. And events like this with people like these remind me every time of what kind of experience and delight and joy I'm trying to bring to my students. And uh, I, I think it's just as much of a special talent to be able to take stuff from Webb and Hubble and take it to a brand new astronomer, a brand new citizen scientist and say, here's, what you, here's the essentials to be able to give them an honest and fair introduction without watering down, without distorting, without phonying up what we're absolutely sure of to help whet the appetite. 
this is what I do as an educator, and it's my joy and delight, and I'm not done yet. <laughs> 46 <Hardly>. years in, <laughs> I'm not done yet. So I, I just, my hat's off to everyone here, and by golly, I, I love coming to these things because for me, it's a chance for me to be a student again, and wow, you all rev me up. So I'm going to turn it back over to you, Scott. Thank and you, Daniel. Thank you. Oh. Congratulations on the 100 Star Park. Thank you so much. Well, well, Daniel, I want to rev you up even further because you're going to love Please. to know. You're going to love to know a couple of things, and I'm going to go into it more when I finally close this down. But um, you reminded me of just today the uh, five-year-old Girl Scouts that were among a group of girls between age five and maybe 15. And then all the girl scout mentors as well, that all got to see a, uh, all got to see the sun today from a solar telescope, um, the, uh, a Coronado. And, um, I saw some of that excitement on their faces. Even better is the excitement on the faces when we, uh, the moon was out for a brief period and some of them got to see it through uh, a spotting scope and still others got to ask questions. And I was able to use images that I had taken to explain some of the answers. This is what we know. This is what this image is showing. And I was thinking to myself, how many of us take these beautiful images of the Milky Way or landscape and we post them on social media and we look to see how many likes and, uh, things that we get so how grand does it feel that i'm actually using my images to share astronomy with young girls and try and get them excited about taking the next step and it was a profound moment to realize okay now i'm extending an image beyond just is it a pretty image that i can post online so a lot of what you were saying reminded me of that and and the final part was we have a new older astronomer uh, or a new older member of our astronomy group that instantly wanted to come out and help and so i invited her out so she was there basically newly minted astronomy member older woman who was there with the girl scouts mm -hmm. very first time out doing outreach so it was uh, it was a good day for me, even though my foot, my left foot hurts, but it was all worth it. Uh -huh. to bring the equipment out and share it with those uh, with those Girl Scouts on a on a really beautiful day. And all of them got a chance to see the sun through that telescope. So uh, so your your words resonate with what I was able to do today and then jump right on Global Star. That's where I was, Scott. I jumped on Global Star Party on the yeah. way home from that event. Yeah, yeah. So, right. Um, right. so thank you for, for reinforcing in me and perhaps all of us the uh, real reason much. for it, our enjoyment of astronomy, passing it forward. And I told those little five-year, those five-year-olds, the, the young daisies, I said, you all are going to be the next scientists in oh, line to help that's figure true. things out. And, um, you know, they, of course, they looked around, looked at each other, but and I said, don't worry, you'll get it as you get older. So, yeah. Um, so yeah, thank you for, for that inspiring, uh, straight from the heart. No, it, there was no script. No filter. Was, <laughs> you, you just came from, you came from how you felt. So thank you for that. Right. That's great. Thank you, Daniel. Thanks again. Thanks for your comments there, Adrian. Okay, our next speaker is uh, Connell Richards. Uh, Connell has been, how many Global Star Parties has it been now, Connell? Do you remember? Uh, it's been quite a few. I want to say we're up to maybe 17 or 18 that I've been on. I remember the first one I was on was the 51st. Oh, okay. <laughs> here we are uh, quite a bit later on. And Right. I have to thank you for putting together not just today's program, but uh, the several dozen star parties that have come before this. It's really been a wonderful program. Yeah, it's it's been a lot of fun, and and I I, I really enjoy the uh, the communication that goes on between uh, the the people that participate 
uh, in Global Star Party. A lot of you have become friends and formed bonds and stuff like that, shared a lot of great information with each other, um, you know, uh, just just here on this side of the uh, of the broadcast. So, but uh, uh, everybody is excited that you uh, contribute to Global Star Party, Connell. You have a very polished uh, demeanor and you know your stuff and you are inspired. Uh, so we all get that. And so thanks, thanks again for making Global Star Party what it is. Thank you very much. It's been a great pleasure doing these programs. I hope to do many more. Yeah, we'll be here. All right. All right. It's all yours. I'll get started here. Um, can you see everything okay? Is my audio good? Yep, audio's good. Good yep. to go. Yep, all right. And you're in presentation mode. Looks really yep. nice. Yep. Good. I still have the Zoom window here, and let me minimize that. Uh, all right. Well, I think it's interesting that Dr. Barth brought up just a moment ago um, how so many discoveries have been made through small telescopes and people just scanning the skies in their backyards. Some of those discoveries have been personal milestones. Mm -hmm. They've changed one person's view of things. Uh, some of those have changed the face of astronomy and cosmology. There's really uh, quite a big spectrum there of how influential these, these instruments can be. And when I think of these outreach events, and I, I usually reflect on how I felt about astronomy and what my experience was. And probably the first year or two, I was engaged in the hobby. And I had a lot of questions, of course, as many beginners do, uh, all kinds of things I wanted to know. And I, I tried to think about what some of my, my biggest questions were and what some of the uh, biggest resources I would have wanted to know about there and, and uh, hopefully some answers to some of those questions. Now, as a beginner, a lot of that relates to uh, smaller apertures, binoculars, and small telescopes that so many of us use. Uh, there's a picture of me there observing the uh, total solar eclipse of 2017 with a solar filter on my six inch Newtonian. And that's been the telescope I've used for over six years now for just about everything I've done. And it's been quite a great instrument. And along with using that, my skills have grown. Advance here. Here we go. So I'll bring you back to my first night under the stars, which was April 16th of 2016. And I remember all these things very well. Uh, I was so pumped up for it. I'd just taken my telescope out of the box a couple of days earlier, and I was ready to get it out under the sky and, and see some, some new targets and, and kind of expand my own horizons. So the picture on the right here, um, you can just barely see a first quarter moon Mm -hmm. maybe about 30 or 40 degrees off the horizon there and the telescope ready to go and look at that. Cool. And uh, the night before, I remember I thought I had this black cover on the back and I, I don't remember why, but I thought I needed to take that off. So these three screws here, I turned all of those as much as I could and pulled them in and out. And when I got my telescope under the stars to start using it, I look at the moon and it was impossible to see anything. And of course, I didn't know this then, I know this now, I'd messed up the collimation completely and had wondered how I would get that back into order. So I, I figured something out for the next night and uh, the, the show went on and I was able to see the moon and some of the planets well enough and a couple targets as well. But I really had to set my expectations, that was important. Um, at that time, there were so many beautiful Hubble images out, of course they still are, and now they're being joined by the great infrared images from uh, James Webb, its successor. It's very hard to see those images and anticipate what you're going to see in the telescope. And there are a couple of books and resources that do that well, but I didn't really understand what I would be seeing at the time. I just knew that I could see some things in the telescope and I kind of left the details of that to uh, whatever I might find. I, I kind of made it a discovery, you might say. And uh, after that, I wrote some of my first observing lists. I have one of them on the next slide. And it's, it's kind of interesting to see what I wanted to see, what I was really excited to see, uh, what I thought was the limit of what I could observe. Um, there were some things I was right about, some things I was wrong about. And I think that might be a common theme with many beginners, kind of setting your expectations and knowing what you can look at. And after I looked at this for some time, of course, I remember the date, it was April 16th. I started keeping a journal and it was really, I think it's been a very valuable tool for me to journal and sketch and photograph 
uh, so many of the objects and phenomena that I've seen, they serve as a wonderful record of my observations. And I'm sure everyone else in this program and, and many of the audience members would attest to this, uh, keeping notes of your observations, whatever that might mean. Maybe it's details of the structure you saw, who you were with, uh, what equipment you used. All of those can be very valuable uh, tools in uh, not only documenting your observations, but it's also simply fun to just go back and see what you were doing at the time. And in making this presentation, I was able to do that. And it's, it was certainly a fun exercise. And with keeping my own documentation, I really wanted to share it with others. And astrophotography is, of course, a great way to do that. But it's very challenging to get into uh, when you're new to astronomy. Um, in fact, you can see in the image here, uh, I didn't even have binoculars at that point. Here I was using an equatorial Newtonian telescope, which I now love and, of course, use very frequently. Uh, but it, it kind of steepens the learning curve for new observers. And I would encourage those who were in my position at that time to go back and start with binoculars and work their way up to telescopes. And then once they've mastered the visual side of things, they can work more with cameras and sharing it with others. And that can happen through either photography or outreach events. I'll talk about some of the ones I've been working on later, uh, both with high school outreach and younger people as well. I'm working on our program right now for uh, kids seven to 11. That's been a really fun program to do. And it's kind of fun to uh, really see this, the scope of people's interest in astronomy, what they wanna see, what they wanna do, and being able to guide them into this hobby and helping them enjoy the night sky a little bit more. There was a great tool I came across when I was first starting out. Uh, there's a wonderful book called The Backyard Astronomer's Guide by Terrence Dickinson and Alan Dyer. And I think they just came out with a new edition, but for, for so many years, that's been a great introductory book for this hobby. And I remember I had, it was a 1992 edition, I think, and I read it cover to cover. And it talked a little bit about film cameras in the astrophotography section, but just about everything else was uh, pretty relevant to what I was doing. And in the first chapter, this is the thing I remember the most, they had something called the ah factor that they outlined. And the authors essentially said, when you're going out doing any kind of observing, uh, you might look at the things you see on a scale of one to 10. One being, I suppose, the, the simple pleasures and 10 being the biggest events with the wow factor. So you see one here is a faint meteor. That's an example they gave with 10 being a total solar eclipse. And something in the middle would be something like seeing surface detail on Mars. And I've now had all three of those experiences and many more. And regardless of where they fall on that scale, they are very pleasant experiences. And I fondly remember them. But going back to my first night, this is what I saw. I remember the first object I pointed at in the sky was Jupiter. And that was actually the first thing I'd seen through a telescope a few years ago. I was on this Cub Scouts trip to a local observatory that had a 10 inch Clark refractor. And I'm sure I'd love to look through that instrument now. It has to be a wonderful instrument on the planets. But I remember the view on the left is, is pretty much what I saw. I remember the moons the most, four little dots, two on each side and the, the big disc in the middle of Jupiter. And of course I had to go back to that and see the bands and, and kind of work in some filters and spend some more time with it and develop my skill and equipment to see how much I could pull out of Jupiter. But I think that makes a great first target for many telescopes. Oh yeah. Uh, as well as the moon here on the right, uh, you can see Copernicus, that's just falling on the right side of the Terminator, uh, still a little bit in shadow. There's Clavius down at the bottom, Tycho, a bunch of the really famous craters. And the moon is a really fun tool to, to start to learn uh, one very tiny piece of the sky and get more acquainted with this hobby. Now, I talked a little bit earlier about my observing list. If you remember, April 16th was my first light for that telescope. And about a week later, I was already working up things that I wanted to see. And here is word for word, a list that I had written down of uh, what I thought were some of the best and brightest targets in the night sky. And many of them are, it's, it's, a, it's a great list of highlights. But I thought of many of these as challenging objects, whereas now I see them as more routine objects. Some of the ones in the Messier catalog, uh, maybe like the Ring Nebula. I remember that, the Ring Nebula, M13. I, I had the hardest time finding them. I didn't know the sky very well. I was still trying to learn that. And tracking those objects down proved very satisfying the first time. And now I can go back to them in, in just a matter of minutes and enjoy them all over again. 
On the left here, you see I, I wanted to see the Eagle Nebula. And I actually saw that in my telescope for the first time. Uh, I want to say it was two or three weeks ago, though I'd seen it in binoculars much earlier than that. And I, I wrote on the side there that I wanted to see the pillars of creation, which in a six inch Newtonian telescope from suburban skies visually is a very, very challenging feat. I'm not sure if anyone's done that and I don't know if anyone will. Um, so that was kind of out of bounds for my expectations. But at the same time, I thought it'd be really cool to see Jupiter and its moons and Saturn's rings. And those of course delivered very well and I always go back to them as favorites. And in the middle there, you see a couple deep sky objects. Alberio is a visual double star, the Andromeda galaxy. Uh, little did I know I'd also be able to see the two dwarf galaxies there, uh, which are quite bright. Other things like the Pleiades, uh, M13, they were all some fantastic objects that were challenging for me at first, but I think they made some great targets uh, in the end as I was starting out. And on the right there is a picture of a project I've been working on recently for the Astronomical League. It's one of their observing programs for globular clusters. And the observing list looks completely different. On the left, I have a couple of uh, targets highlighted and scratched out as I selected and observed them according to what my telescope could, uh, could handle. Uh, some, some clusters in the eighth and ninth and maybe even 10th magnitude, those were pretty dim, I recall. But on the left here, I have Messier objects, and then I'm getting into the NGC catalog a little bit more, some of the Herschel objects. And I think it's kind of fun to notice that I was using the same telescope all along, but my skills and experience were developing alongside that. I'll go to the next slide here. And like I said, it's really important to keep a record of your observations, uh, not just for uh, very practical aspects of seeing what you observed and looking at times and dates and what equipment you used for future reference. Uh, but it is really fun to go back and just uh, read documents about what you saw. And on the left, this picture of, uh, of a description I wrote about Saturn was the first written description of, mm -hmm. of any object in the night sky I ever created. And on the on the right in that picture, there's a little sketch of Saturn, uh, no Cassini division in there at all, just the rings and the, mm -hmm. the ball of Saturn. I had a couple reference stars nearby that I must have seen on some astronomy program and Titan as well. That was quite exciting and unexpected. And just a brief note that I saw things were getting a little bit dimmer in the night sky as the moon was rising at that time. And on the right, I have a sketch of Mars. It was the first dedicated sketch of any object in the night sky I made a couple of years later during one of its oppositions. And uh, it's a little bit rough around the edges. It looks kind of like a pen sketch. I was using some pencil kind of scribbling things in to see what surface features I could reference later. Uh, but this sketch I think falls in a really nice um, uh, metaphor for how my um, experience in amateur astronomy has progressed. Uh, because I remember in 2016, I set up my telescope on, on the deck of the house and I was waiting to see that opposition of Mars in, in May of 16. I was really excited for it, but I didn't know what to expect or what I was doing. And I thought, I know, magnification is the key. And it didn't quite work out that way because I got this four millimeter plossal, four millimeters. And the experience of looking at the night sky through that eyepiece is kind of like trying to study the Grand Canyon through a soda straw. It really didn't work out too well. I remember straining my eye and all I could see was this red ball that was floating back and forth in the atmosphere. It wasn't steady, it wasn't very crisp. And later on, I upgraded a couple of eyepieces. I was also a much more skilled observer. And I saw the sketch you see on the right. And then later on in 2020, another two years later, 26 months, I was able to make a series of other sketches, which I've shared in other talks on this program of Mars in much more detail. And here is one of my favorite highlights. I finally hit 10 on that scale that I referenced from the book oh, earlier. Yeah. There you go. Here was uh, a really nice side-by-side -side of the 2017 eclipse. Uh, you can see on the left here, the horizon's all dark. I'm looking at the sun and I don't seem to be complaining too much. So <laughs> it must've been during totality or at least near it before I took that solar filter off. And on the right was a picture I got just through my phone, held it up to the eyepiece and there it was. And I could finally share that experience with people. Uh, I live in Pennsylvania. 
And we took this road trip down to a rural part of Georgia, the band of totality passed right in that Northeast uh, part of the part of the state. And it was, oh, I want to say 21, 22 hours in the car each way. The traffic was ridiculous with that event. I'm sure we all have uh, our own little stories from that eclipse, but it's a memory I'll cherish for a long time. Uh, certainly one of my favorite moments in my developing experience in astronomy. And the reason I share all these is I want other people to understand what they can expect going into things. Uh, there is a certain progression from looking at that first uh, view of Jupiter or the moon, and then going to see an eclipse, then learning how to use a telescope instead of binoculars. There's a nice progression uh, that, that you can lay out for yourself to kind of make that learning curve less frightening and, and really get into the hobby without much trouble and, and enjoy it a lot more, I think. Uh, now, we were talking earlier about how much the, the cosmos is changing, especially our solar system. We see it as a very eternal and static thing, but that's not always the case. And I have a series of images here that uh, certainly represent that. Uh, the top one at the center is, is the most recent lunar eclipse in the clouds. And I remember taking that image, I guess you could say live on a global star party when we did the eclipse special. I was running mm -hmm. in and out of the house and sticking my card in and out of the computer and pulling those images off. And that was the final processed image of uh, the shadow starting to leave the moon as some clouds were coming in. And it adds a lot of drama to that image, I think. And there it is uh, framed by some <clears throat> images of sunspots, a partial solar eclipse, comet EOIs. Uh, on the bottom here is the conjunction of Saturn and Jupiter. And then a meteor I was fortunate enough to catch on the right. So they all highlight how our cosmos and our solar system are changing places. And you can observe these with very modest equipment. Uh, pretty much everything here you can see in binoculars. Uh, of course, I should note with the solar observations, uh, you should use the proper protection and solar filters in those cases, uh, but they're all very uh, visible and, and readily apparent to those who are looking to get out and, and see what the night sky or even daytime sky has to offer. After some experience with my own telescope, I wanted to push those boundaries a little bit I remember my first trip to a dark sky site, which was Cherry Spring State Park. And it's in uh, North Central PA, which is one of the darkest parts of, of the country for sure. Uh, but they say it's the darkest place east of the Mississippi, Bortle Two skies. It's about 2000 feet of elevation. And that night we had some clouds rolling away just in time uh, for a, a night sky to clear up. It was during the Pearson meteor shower in 2018. And that was a very memorable night. And it's a long story, but I wasn't able to bring my telescope that night. So I had some binoculars with me. And I thought, oh, you know, I'm kind of complaining. I can't bring my telescope out to this dark sky site. And it turned out to be one of the best things to ever happen to me because it was one of the best nights of observing I ever had. I saw the Eagle Nebula for the first time, Trifid. Uh, the Lagoon Nebula was stunning. I saw all these meteors from the Pierceids flying overhead. Uh, even though it was August, I was even able to see the zodiacal light with the naked eye. It was just incredible observing with very modest equipment. And it's certainly something I'd suggest to any new observer uh, looking to get into the hobby. And I think it was also fun to look at some of the history of, of astronomy. On the left is a picture of a telescope called the Leviathan of Parsonstown, And I was fortunate enough to, to visit that telescope. That's it's cool. in the middle of Ireland. And as many of us know, it was built by the third Earl of Ross who was trying to figure out the structure of what at that time they called the spiral nebulae in the sky. They were face on spiral galaxies. And he made some very famous sketches of M51 and M101 with the telescope you see there. It looks like this giant barrel cannon kind of thing. And he was able to move it um, in terms of azimuth about 10 degrees. And then of course he had the full span of altitude and all these uh, works and scaffolding on the sides of those stone walls to get up to it. So it kind of shows how far people are willing to go to uh, extend their own experiences of discovery. Uh, but all you need, like the, the picture on the right suggests, is some good dark skies and your naked eye, or maybe even a pair of binoculars. You can see quite a lot with that and have a wonderful night of observing. And what would observing be without sharing it with others? Uh, a couple of years ago, uh, I started this high school astronomy club at my at my school, 
And it was uh, one of the only junior societies within the Astronomical League as, as an astronomy club. So I think high school students are a really important group to reach right now as they're going off to college, they're looking at their futures, they're learning new hobbies, they have this time. It's, it's a great opportunity to share astronomy with people and get them involved. And you can see there's a sky chart in the middle of the projector there and some of the students who were with me who are interested in it. Uh, we really had a great time doing that program. And on the right here is a program for a much younger audience. This is one I started recently at the local library. And there's a chart of what the phases of the moon look like. And you can see it looks a little unconventional for what those charts look like. You might just see a half lit moon orbiting around the earth in different positions. Uh, but the reason I made the chart like this is I first instructed the kids, okay, here's where the new moon happens. Here's where first quarter happens. Here's where waxing gibbous happens and so on. And when I shut off the lights, I held up a flashlight next to that orange cutout for the sun. And I had this uh, rubber model of the moon and I moved it around the earth while shining the flashlight on it. And they were able to see that the moon remained half lit no matter where it was, but it matched the paper cutouts you see on the poster. And that really helped them to understand uh, what the lunar phases look like. And after that program, this girl came up to me and she had a shoe box that she made, this little craft. And inside was a, a, a hanging styrofoam ball of the moon and there were uh, holes cut into the side of this shoe box. And you could look in and shine a light in one end and see what the phases looked like, depending on where in the shoe box you were looking. And she was like, I made this moon box. And she had all these decorations and stars on it. And she was really excited to share that. So I think kids really find an interest in this stuff. Uh, they like the solar system, the moon. They want to know everything about it. And there's a lot of joy in bringing it, not just to adults and high school students, but also younger audiences as well. And there are a number of ways you can do this. On the left here is an article I wrote for the League's Reflector. And that was uh, meant for a lot of people in the amateur astronomy community who were kind of wondering how they could reach high school students and use the new technologies that we have now and use that to their advantage for outreach. And on the right is an Instagram page. It's one of many uh, social media platforms I utilized, uh, especially throughout the pandemic for sharing my outreach in astronomy. I talked about the images from Pluto that came back from New Horizons, anniversaries of certain events like Yuri Gagarin becoming the first person in space. And it also uh, worked out as a good avenue for communicating club information. And finally, I come to a project I'm very excited to share right now, which is a star party at the local library. Uh, they recently acquired a telescope that you see on the left, and I'll be using that for some lunar observing, showing kids craters and rays on the moon and mountains for the first time. And I've actually never been to a star party. I'm looking forward to getting around to some very soon, uh, but I'm looking forward even more to running this and seeing the books on people's faces, especially the kids as they see the moon through the telescope for the first time. I think that'll be a really special experience that they'll remember. And I certainly hope to inspire more of that younger audience and people new to the hobby to continue and keep pushing the boundaries and discovering even more. And as much as I want to encourage the new people in the hobby, I would suggest to the more experienced amateur astronomers uh, that they take these lessons of sharing outreach and sharing that passion for discovery with new people and being able to uh, create a lot of communication in the hobby and a lot of openness that hopefully brings even more of the public um, into some, some uh, scientific interest and, and that really uh, we're able to capture uh, their curiosity for what the world has to offer. And with James Webb going up so recently and coming online, I think that'll provide a lot of that inspiration uh, with the efforts we have here in Global Star Party. I think that'll help a lot as well. But I'd encourage everyone to, to get out under the stars as much as they can, whether uh, that be with outreach events or on their own, uh, there's certainly a lot to be discovered. So thank you for letting me share that tonight. Yeah. Thank you and very I much. I wish you all the best in your discovery. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. That's great. That's great. Well, okay. So um, another great presentation from Connell Richards. Um, uh, we are uh, now... Uh, up to the point where we can uh, bring on John Briggs. John Briggs is currently the uh, acting secretary of the Alliance of Historic Observatories 
Um, but if you've been to any of the, uh, uh, the beautiful old observatories or been in the Antique Telescope Society or just hung around uh, amateur astronomers, uh, when you bring up the name of John Briggs, usually a big smile goes across people's faces because uh, you know, John is uh, uh, definitely someone that is, uh, uh, he, his passion uh, for astronomy and instrumentation and what it does and the people behind it and the history of all that just, you know, comes across so uh, forceful and, uh, um, but in a way that uh, just really inspires you and wants you to learn more, you know, anybody that's hung around John Briggs could easily occupy hours of his time uh, just asking a question after question and, uh, of, you know, how and why it happened and, uh, you know, the virtually the story of the unfolding of the universe itself to uh, humanity. So, John, um, it's great to have you on Global Star Party. Um, my, my thanks for joining Scott. us. I, I hope you, can you hear me okay? I can hear you just fine. Great, yeah, well, what you're saying is another way of, whoops, that's not what I want, Can, uh, cancel. Uh, that I'm getting uh, long in the tooth in this <laughs> interest, and that is true, and I'm proud of it. I'm not the only one, and, um, and I have a lot of fun like everybody else. And it's, a, it's a great pleasure to be a part of your 100th, and Thank you so much, uh, it's John. a lot of fun. Now, I just have uh, something very quick to share here. And uh, because let's see, the theme was seeing beyond. Yes, and um, that uh, uh, and that combined with the fact that we are all uh, celebrating the web uh, images um, uh, and the theme made me think of something I wanted to share very briefly, um, uh, an experience with uh, my backyard observatory, but it was a collaboration with friends. Um, but it really was a representation of seeing beyond uh, just from one's own backyard. Now let's see if I'm gonna do a share screen and let's see if I do this right. Um, that's this I think is the way I want to do it. And um, I'm gonna try to make this small. So can you see the picture there, Scott? Yes, sir. Good. Um, I uh, actually wanted to uh, bring up the, uh, the web um, uh, wide field of the galaxy cluster with the gravitational lens images. And we were fortunate that Molly and Jason uh, both spoke so much about the web and including that particular image, but to the way it's pulled up, I, 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 I'm, I'm not going to get out of this mode to return to it, but what a spectacular image that was, wasn't it? And, and as Molly pointed out, it represented seeing an angular part of the sky that corresponded to not much bigger than a grain of sand at arm's length, okay? Uh, but yet, uh, so many galaxies in that uh, uh, field of view. Well, uh, Bob Fugate and I are lucky to live uh, here in New Mexico where there's a lot of space. There's still a fair bit of dark sky. And as I've shown once or twice before on these events, proudly, this is my backyard. I have a hilltop in the backyard and I call it Fool on a Hill Observatory, FOA Observatory. Um, but I, it's just a picture. I'm just trying to lead up to a picture that I want to show you that we secured with uh, instrumentation here. All the health facilities up here are on wheels. It's hmm. government surplus stuff. Both of the domes were surplus missile cracking domes off nearby White Sands Missile Range here in New Mexico. And it's, see, see the wheels? And um, uh, they're 10-foot domes they're awesome. with very wide slits. They housed Cine Theodolites originally. And that's me on the left and a friend of mine uh, who's passed away, I fear, now named Rick Thurmond. And 
He was a fellow member of the Albuquerque Astronomical Society, but um, uh, Rick uh, was an avid uh, astrophotographer, and um, he had purchased this instrument. It's an Italian wide field astrograph, and um, uh, he had uh, more or less exhausted his his uh, evident possibilities for using this portable astrograph on a tripod up around uh, Albuquerque in the brighter skies, and his health was was fading. He didn't have the strength to move it around. But I, when I heard about this, I said, Rick, I've got a spare dome that even has this white pillar uh, built into it. If you want, move it down here to Magdalena. We could do some stuff together. And the people in the background are mainly of, of mutual friends from Albuquerque Astronomical S Society who helped Rick move this equipment uh, down to this dome in my backyard. And uh, it's, it's, as I said, it's, a, it's about an F3, uh, uh, very wide field astrograph uh, and on an astrophysics wow. mounting. This was Rick's equipment. Uh, but it's still here uh, in Magdalena, New Mexico. And um, it's very good for taking uh, beautiful pictures of the Milky Way. And this is the sort of thing I want to be able to show off because wow. showing the pictures live, I can zoom in on them. And I'm, and it's great because you can see how sharp the, 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 the stars are. That's and so as I've, um, I'm lucky to be uh, so so closely acquainted with Bob Fugate. And one of the things he says, he says, John, you know, I like photo with a lot of stars. And uh, that's what he gets with many of his lenses. But this astrograph is capable of that too. And this is M46 and M47, by the way. And uh, then the, the M46 the open star clusters in the winter sky. There's this beautiful little planetary planetary nebula lined up with that cluster but that is so isn't cool. that cool the field yeah. corresponds to about three and a half degrees in other words that let's see seven times the diameter of the full moon in width and height but anyway i should keep moving on now because this is not really even the picture i want to share now let's see why where's my arrows there should be an arrow to make me oh there it is yeah and so that this here is the picture that Rick really wanted to get with this equipment in dark skies. And so it was the first thing that we worked on together, um, uh, wow. uh, uh, the Spaghetti Nebula. And I think there were maybe five nights of exposure time with different filters, but many, many exposures spread out over at least four and possibly five nights. And Rick, who was expert with the processing, assembled this image, whereas, and, and he was operating the telescope remotely, and I was the, basically the technician on site, because I'm an, an instrument uh, guy, and come on, let's see, how do you advance? How do you advance? There should be an arrow, oh, there it is, there it is. But in any case, the picture that I really wanted to show you with that uh, setup was um, one like this. It, so uh, the first one I got, of this particular field, I took all by myself. And you know, it looks just like a star cluster, doesn't it? Sort of mm -hmm. a boring star cluster. This particular view of it though, was recorded by Bob Fugate using the equipment over the internet with my assistance here in Magdalena. But it, 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 it matches one that I had done myself but when I was telling Bob what I wanted to do tonight, he said, John, don't you remember? We we worked on that same field together. And maybe the shots I've got in the can here are better to illustrate what you want to show. And so everybody in the audience maybe is thinking, well, gee, what is it? Just another star cluster. But if you really go in closely, you could say, wait, there's a galaxy there. And that's a little too fuzzy to be a star. That's too fuzzy to be a star. These are not stars. Oh, those may be. It's a galaxy cluster. It's the coma cluster, okay? But what really um, takes the cake, as far as I'm concerned, is that there is a function in uh, PIX Insight uh, that Rick Thurman 
demonstrated to me on my first version of this image. And Bob was quite familiar with it too. So he took his image here, which he just emailed me tonight so we could show you the best we've got. And with uh, the simple press of one button on that same frame, the software will identify every galaxy in the field of view. But the, the kick is, is this. I think being able to zoom in, because only when you zoom in and you see what's going on, that, for example, let's see, um, a PGC 44533 is that little galaxy right there. And that stands for, what is it? A principal galaxy catalog. The larger and brighter galaxies have NGC numbers or uh, index catalog numbers, but the fainter ones going down to something like magnitude 18 are the million or so uh, galaxies that are in the principal ga galaxy catalog. But man, when you automatically turn on these an these, this annotation for galaxies with the magic of modern software that'll operate upon your own relatively simply recorded backyard image recorded with an eight inch tall scope and you dramatize yeah. how the coma cluster is so uh, detectable uh, from your own backyard. Now this isn't the web telescope, but when we looked at that spectacular web image, of course with gravitational lensing and everything else and all the little faint galaxies in the background, the field of view, that's pretty good, but you'd expect a lot for $10 billion or whatever it cost. This rig did not cost $10 billion. After all, it was only an eight inch aperture, but for heaven's sake, look what you could do if you tune into it uh, from your own backyard. We do have the advantage of New Mexico and all that, but, um, but it's one heck of a lot of fun. I think Bob Fugate is um, online as well. Bob, do you, do you care to add anything since you actually processed this particular image? Uh, John, you've done an incredible job and there's absolutely nothing I can add to your brilliance. Well, there you go. <laughs> I, everybody knows, Bob, that I'm, I'm, I'm nothing but a reflection nebula in your company, man. <laughs> oh, gee. You know, I'll be, I'll be, okay, folks, maybe some people are actually still listening. This is, here's a Bob Fugate story. So Bob, Bob, you know, we were on the phone earlier tonight when I told him what I wanted to share, you know, the annotated shot of the, of the coma cluster. And uh, Bob said, well, wait a second. You know, I think I've got an even better one because he sent me one first about via email while other people were talking. And then suddenly he, he texted me again. And he said, it was actually a phone call. He said, you know, I think it's, I've got an even better one. I'll email it to you and you tell me what you think. Folks, when Bob Fugate tells me he's got an even better image, I, I don't I don't have to look at it to know what he said is true. Uh, anyway, uh, the sun is setting in this shot on um, uh, uh, FOA Observatory. Mm -hmm. And so uh, friends like Bob say that you shouldn't call it fool on a hill now. You should call it friends on a hill. There Whatever you acronym you want to use, I don't care. But we have a lot of fun uh, with this equipment. We miss the late Rick Thurmond. Uh, he has made uh, 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 some so much of this possible for me and Bob and other folks. Uh, so thank you for your attention, folks. I wanted just to share something short and sweet. Thanks very much, John. That's great. I love it. Thank you very much. Okay. You bet, man. Let me try. Oh, there. Stop, share. Do something are. real quick. <laughs> so, John and Bob, I am instantly envious of where you all live. Just wanted so to just come and really visit. dark out there. Just yeah, come I, and visit. I'm that it's on the list along with five other places, thanks to Global Star Party, that I now have to visit. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, that that location looks beautiful. Great. Bob does fantastic, mind-blowing things from his backyard, but as often as he can, 
he is, escapes down in our direction here in Magdalena, including into the Gila National Forest. And uh, we sure have enjoyed uh, seeing his results everywhere. Excellent. Wonderful. Okay, we're going to uh, transition over to uh, Cesar Brollo down in Buenos Aires. But before we do, Maxie's got uh, an image that he'd like to share with us. Maxie, you want to show uh, what you got in the scope? Okay, let's let's share my screen. So, what I got here, this is the forty-seven Tucana. Wow. The globe, the globe that's totally Very lost. Very tight stars, plastic. beautiful. Yeah, it's in the entire field of view, practically. And let me stretch, reset the the histogram. You can see only those stars, but when you out stretch, there's a lot of one. Wow. So this is only a single, stars. a single shot of 60 seconds. And well, I I was I I want to point to this place because Adrian asked, asked me more earlier because now uh, do you see the stellarium? Yeah, I see it, and it's uh, it's finally risen high enough for you to uh, be able to image at it. Yeah, Definitely it's... a beautiful globular cluster. Mm -hmm. it's a really good one and now i think i'm going to some galaxies they are here in sculpture to to find out but uh, i think that's will be all for tonight because it's a, it's a rough night i have some kind of wind and some pictures there struggling with the stars so Thank you for for watching. Thank you. And yeah, I, I will be online, but uh, you're calling it a night. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, I, I think I will be safe. But okay. let's okay. see. Maybe more later. I will if I find something, some some another place. Uh, I, I will show. Oh, but beautiful. I think... So this is forty-seven to Cana as um, uh, a, a globular star cluster. For those of you who don't. Uh, you know, who are just watching and don't know what this kind of object is. This is one of the most massive global globular star clusters in the sky. You have to be in the southern hemisphere to see it, uh, where Maxi is. And um, uh, it, uh, you know, has millions of stars, uh, again, about 15,000 light years away. So thanks very much, Maxi, for showing that. No, you're, you're welcome. And thank you right? to all of you. Okay. So, uh, Cesar Brolo, you are up next. Thank you for coming on to uh, Global Star Party. It's cold uh, down in Argentina, right? Uh, yes, actually, not so cold, not so horrible. Not too cold. Okay. It's uh, 12, 12 uh, degrees uh, centigrade. Uh, centigrade is. Okay. Uh, 12 degrees is for this night is okay, but all time that we talk about um, about astronomers, we are sometimes quiet or stay uh, without movement. And when we remember that we uh, we can when we can remember <laughs> that it's it's late. Is it? Yeah. I froze. <laughs> yes, it is. Yes, this is a typical thing. Yes. Tun um, tonight I have. In my balcony, an entry level optical tube assembly, very, very entry level optical tube assembly, mm -hmm. is the National Geographic, Sprout Scientific National Geographic uh, 114 centi uh, millimeters uh, telescope. Uh, the the yes. focal racer, yes, the focal racer is only. Um, 500 millimeters. Oh, sorry, the focal length. Um, the focal razor is uh, 4.38 uh, uh, the number of focal razor. Mm -hmm. Um, it's very light, it's very, really, very light, very fast. And actually, I use it uh, with a planetary camera, planetary camera, uh, with a 
um, big size pixel is an excellent and it's over the uh, 100 uh, EXOS 100 mount. Um, this is uh, uh, working really nice, and it's a it's a telescope mm -hmm. that a kid can afford and use. And the camera is cheap, the telescope is cheap, the mount is of the cheapest in the in the market uh, because it's it's a mount that actually well you know I am talking about the mount that you create. <laughs> but uh, yes, and um, yeah, one of the mounts that we're giving it, away in the door prize uh, for this uh, global star party. So, yeah, yes. Uh, well, maybe you can you can uh, uh, see that the moon with the, the the telescope. The telescope normally is uh, is uh, over uh, you know over a, a, a very uh, a mount that is only for hand panel and use in, in right, right, left, and up and down, and it's very easy to use. And the same optical tube assembly can be uh, assembly over a, a quadrant mount in, in this in this opportunity is a go to mount. Go to mount is that can can go to the full of the stars and can uh, reach the stars. And rich planets and everything that uh, fine planets, fine galaxies, fine uh, nebulas. But here, I can show you uh, the live image now. First of all, I'm showing you now Antares uh -huh. uh, with a single exposure of. Uh, I think that this uh, uh, five four four. Here you can see the exposure four point uh, sixty nine seconds. In this moment, uh, um, I don't I, I don't have any any cluster. I have a M M four, but uh, but but. Let me stop the. Uh, let me. Mm. Oh, uh, stop sharing here. Well, here was Antares now appointed with the telescope. But I can show you the picture that I took just a minute ago. While Maxi pointed to Parenticide Tucana cluster, I'm pointing, I'm point to the uh, Omega Centauri cluster. Let me show you. He okay. just had the one up here, man, Cesar. <laughs> you get the biggest one. Yes, I choose the big, the biggest one. <laughs> here, this is the picture. 50 pictures with the telescope oh. that... Yeah. <laughs> Full of stars. That's yeah. certainly massive. Yes. Here you can see the, the, the this is from tonight. you can see you can watch different stars. Yes, was was it really magic magical with this telescope? Make this. I use it, I use it uh, 50 takes of five seconds each and the 20 darks, and all with this telescope and the the planetarium camera. Nothing more. That's it. Nothing more. The, the, yes, nothing more. Yes, it's something that that is is a very start starting eleven equipment, and um, I have a really really a lot of of uh, fun uh, this night. I can show you the maybe I can show you the the individual takes. Mm -hmm. Sorry that I, I can't I can show you now the, the a live image of, of uh, Omega Centauri because it's behind the, the buildings. But yeah. in the entire night I had I had the you had it the live <laughs> one. Yes, yeah. I had it, but I took the pictures. Let me show you another one. Okay.
Well, here is. I, I, I took a, a, a very, very fast process without, mm -hmm. you know, without the, the typical things that, that uh, of uh, very, very entry level programs, all, all completely easy to make. And of course that, that, that despite the, the limitation of the equipment and camera, oh, it's, yeah. a great, uh, it, right. it's, a, it's a great it's a great experience, and I think that the, the idea that we we talk every time is uh, in, encouraging to the people, and especially with very very um, uh, starting level entry level telescope. Look that this this telescope. You can see something. Uh, I, I don't know the name of this when you have something. Uh, <laughs> well, th this this optical tube of assembly uh, yeah. had an accident in the in the shipping with the shipping cargo. Oh, it's got a we dent. Found... I can see it. Yeah, I can see it. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Yes, it's yes. mm -hmm. done. Yes, yes. So it's um, got impact damage. Despite uh -huh. this, work properly and. I, of course, that uh, normally the people that saw telescope sometimes it's not a, a, an amateur astronomer, but I mean, I, I am. But <laughs> say, okay, don't worry, this this optical tube assembly is for for home. <laughs> and work really it, very very good. I, I yeah, but uh, I only Caesar, made a little. Did it arrive like that? Collimation. Did it arrive? Did it? Did it arrive damaged to you like this? It was the the only one. Yes, yes. Was uh, we found it in the in the in the box? Uh -huh. um, you know, well, I, I, I in, can in send the quantity you that we import. Yes, we will, yes, yes. I will send you uh, a replacement tube. I can get no, you a tube. No problem. <laughs> no, uh, I can no. repair this, but but it's, it sometimes it's <laughs> Yeah. So, no, the problem is sometimes when when with the customer say why why they send you one free? No, it's no more. It's more problem that say okay, can I can repair? <laughs> no problem. Uh, don't worry. Yeah. Don't worry, Scott. Now, yes, yes, it's, it's for for use and maybe maybe later we we uh, donate this for a school. No problem. I, I yeah. can repair this. It's it's very easy. It's really okay. very easy because okay. it's it's a fiber um, carbon fiber, and mm. with a little of of hot air, um, it it will be a pleasure. Be okay, it, it's something okay. to show is the people some sometimes turn crazy with this kind of things and say, "Don't worry, it's still working," and and uh, of course, if you broke a mirror, is it's a drama because oh, then, it's the hair yeah, of the telescope. Sure. Yes, but but you can I can use the, the with a bump and telescope. That of course that I I'll alignment again and it's it's with a lesser collimation. But despite this, um, the the optics work in the finest way for well uh, work properly. Um, I can uh, in the in the 100 uh, edition of Global Star Party, I like to make something that is encouraging to the people to work yes. and make images like uh, this image of of uh, I show again because I'm proud because it's it's here. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I'm proud again. Yeah, um, you can make this in your home from from your home in the city. Without right. problems, right? This Full is of forty-seven stars. Tucani. Uh, as well. it's, it's so big this cluster. Yes, it's so big this cluster that is considered a galaxy. It's like a proto galaxy. Have oh, wow. a have a, a inside inside the the Omega cluster. Do you have do you have a, a one medium size uh, black hole one or two maybe and um, 
is over, uh, is, uh, uh, I don't know if it's 3 million of stars. It's impossible to determine it, but, but have three, ty three types of, of stars. Maybe this one are the red ones in this area. And you have three types of, of stars. Uh, it's very interesting. It's very, very interesting cluster. Really huge, really huge. And it's in maybe it, it's a nucleus, nucleus, the core of mm -hmm. an old galaxy. Oh, I see. It's, it's incredible. It's incredible. It's they, they say that there's incredible. even a possible yes. it's, it's, central black hole in uh, in this it's, object as well. Yes, yes, uh, mm -hmm. yes. Maybe two, uh, and have uh, it's like a ghost galaxy because um, you can see only the skeleton, only the the core, the center. He lost the arms. It's a small galaxy that lost his uh, the arms. It arms. Oh. It's very interesting. And we can make this with this. No more. Camera, planetary camera with a with a sensor Sony 290. That is very common in, in many brands of cameras for to make planets. Have a, a, a and do you have a very, very uh, uh, very low uh, or very short, sorry, telescope without barlows and this is that is is very interesting to the people that i say all time choose the shorter newtonian without barlow lens hmm. is is this is why in your company you sell the, the most of newtonian without barlow lens without because you are people that know about optics knows about astronomy and very i'm i'm proud of of your yes very interesting because you choose very 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 in very smart in a very smart way uh, your designs this is great it's well, all for for tonight yeah, that's great thank you scott thank you scott for you showed us millions for, of stars in one field of view it's, it's wonderful yeah you know so yes absolutely and I, I i i need to say you thank you very much uh to give me a, a, a opportunity many 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 global third party to, uh, to share with the time. people yes it's was it and, really anyone a that can withstand 100 mile per hour winds doing astrophotography yeah. and take <laughs> yeah. us to an eclipse in in uh patagonia you know so i have, I have a picture of this you. yeah thank you <laughs> yeah thank yeah. you cesar uh really it's a pleasure scott thank okay. you very much thanks very much well patiently in waiting in the wings here is young navin santel kumar and uh Navin, where are you tonight? Currently, I'm in um, India. I'm in Aos. Um, Excellent. So how are your skies out there in India? Not the best. Most of the nights we've had here were overcasts. Um, mm -hmm. But at least one night, we were lucky to capture something. Well, that's good. That's good. Are the sky, is the sky is, uh, relatively dark? Yeah, they're relatively like dark, but I'm in some light motion. It's like a Bortle 4 scale. So well, that's pretty, great. Yeah. So well, I'm thank you for, uh, for uh, going through all this trouble to uh, join us on Global Star Party. What time is it in India right now? It's, um, it's currently about 9.26 in the morning. In the morning. Okay. All right. Hopefully you had some good breakfast and you're all yeah. set to go. That's great. Um, Thanks again. We have we have just 15 minutes different time of than India. <laughs> we have just a uh, 15 minute time difference. Okay. Um, so I'm not, I'm not sure about what I've been up to like this summer in astronomy. Sure. Okay. So let me share my screen. Okay, do you see my screen? Yeah, it's coming up. Okay. 
<clears throat> Give it a moment here. There we go. Okay. So this is this is what I'm, I'm going to share about some of my um cleaner some some what I've been doing in India and then I've also I also went to the UK. So I'm going to share about what I've been doing there too. Okay, so the first thing here is that at, at my hometown we uh, had a like, one good night and at least we were able to. I would, there at the beginning of July we um had six stars lined up, six planets actually, yeah. Six planets lined up and we were only able to capture two, which was Jupiter and Mars. And then the other picture is the same thing, Jupiter and, and Mars down here. And then, okay, yeah. <clears throat> so, um, so this is so I I was all, I was um, showing my grandpa my my um grand, my family here in India some sunspots some sun, sun shots like live through an eyepiece currently like sunspots yeah so this is my grandpa right here and then the next one was my cousin going through <clears throat> okay now I'm gonna show about what I've been doing in the UK so I actually went to Royal the Royal Observatory in London. In Greenwick, so I thought I could sh I could share my experience with you there. So this is William Herschel's telescope. Um, <clears throat> this is the one I'm standing right next to, and then yeah, this is the marker sh showing William Herschel's telescope. Then this is his telescope right here. Okay, so this is the front entrance. There's a statue. There's a statue right here, and then. We're about to enter the Flamsteed House. Oh, that's okay. cool. So this is the Flamsteed House. You can see these were some astronomers and they each had one assistant. And now I'm gonna show you the market. So this was, these were the astronomers at Greenwick. These were all, there were 10 astronomers who in, lived in the Flamsteed House between 1676 to 1948. But before the usually before the 19th century, each astronomer, royal astronomer, worked alone, just a single assistant. But their task was an intense, hard task. And their ta and their task, and they people the people who depended on them were other astronomers, like amateur astronomers and navigators at sea. But as, as time went, the astronomers were. Royal astronomers were supported by a growing team of specialists who were from the local area. Last astronomer to live in, in the Flamsteed House was Harold Spencer Jones, who left in 1948 when the observatory work, his work moved to a different place in, in Sussex. Okay, so we're, let's talk about navigation. If you see right here, this is, this is a so people depended on um, the stars to like navigate and um, orient their way around the world, and it, and that was also the Gilded Age for ex exploration and finding new land and territory and conquests. <clears throat> okay, so this is the Lamsty House that the marker here. Okay, these were five other astronomers. John Pond, William Christie, Harold Spencer Jones, Frank Dyson, George Biddle, Airy. Hmm. And there was, Tom, and then these were also some um, astronomer, like assistants right here. Thomas Earnshaw, Caroline Herschel, Margaret Lafayette, I think, um, William Herschel, of course, and some, I don't know what that, but yeah. Now we're gonna see about their life currently. So they, you see some chinaware right here, and then, yeah. You can see this was this was their menu. Like the this was a traditional dinner planning back then. Okay, let's talk about navigation. 
this was a globe back then, and then these were some models, and then you could see, and then these were like pictures, I think. Yeah. This was a solar system model. This was a book on astronomy called Pleasures of Astronomy. Hmm. Yeah. And this is a closer view of the globe of how uh, the that's hard a rock. Beautiful happened. globe. Look at that. A globe and how like that would be worth a lot of money because that's all high quality quality material. And then this no. Okay, now this is a book, Pleasures of Astronomy. This book was published in the 18th century. It's actually a board game, okay. And, it's a board game, okay. Yeah. In a race to reach the Flamsteed House and become an astronomer royal. From the 18th century. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. So this, these, we're going to talk about clocks now. This was just on the storage bucket, a chest from back then. And then this is a clock. This was George, this was Neville's alarm clock to wake himself up for observing the stars. Wow. He got it from his pre predecessor, James Bradley, who, who bought it from a, a really prestigious London clockmaker called George Graham. This clock is quite ticked that allows a good night's sleep. So this is a special clock. Okay. So this were, these were some homemade remedies or medicines. Tobacco, honey, lemons, rosemary, and ginger, and a lot of other herbs. So now we're going to look at the masculine family bedroom. Okay, so this was the this was the rule in the masculine family bedroom called music of London. This was London's outer back then in 1778. You see St. Alphegis Church in Greenwick and Corcoran Westminster Abbey and St. Paul's Cathedral on the horizon. Okay, so you can see <clears throat> a telescope, um, constellation model, a globe, and, celestial sphere, it looks like. Yeah, celestial sphere, yeah. And then you could see some directions right here. Mm -hmm. This so is a photo taken in the 1860s by that shows the entire Airy family. The eldest surviving daughter gets, sits with their parents on a white bench with Anna, Osmond, Christabel, Hubert, and Wilfred who sit on the grass. So this was a book. With, yeah, it was this was a book on observe, observing records. See right here. And then we move on to this stuff. Okay. <clears throat> so we you see some gifts right here. Mm -hmm. um, pot right here. Um yeah. And then a couple other stuff. And then you see Sir George Biddle Airy, whose statue is right here. So this is the Airy family parlor. <clears throat> so this is George Biddle Airy's wife, R Richard Airy. She waited six years for her father's consent to marry George. Once married, the couple were devoted each other and wrote letters of daily one apart. In 1870, Richard suffered a stroke that made her disabled. George was devastated. Oh. Um, so this was a photo picture in the fit in the parlor. And then okay, so now we're, we're gonna go to the over overall room. You could see this is a telescope right here. And that was this was based, this was made by an unknown maker in 1992. Was, the telescope was from about 1750, but this is a replica. <clears throat> oh yeah, this is the octagon room. 
Astronomers at the time struggled with color distortion and chromatic aberration when using telescopes. One solution was to increase separation between the lenses, but this created long telescope holes, which were awkward to use. Opticians later devised a new type of lens to co correct this problem. So this is a panorama view of the oval room. Of the oval room. Wow. Sorry, the octagon room. Taken on an iPhone. So they were observing through windows, I suppose, huh? This is the top of the octagon room. Mm -hmm. And then the telescope right there again. And then, yeah. Oh yeah, this is a pendulum. This is a pen. This is a clock right here. Pendulum clock. And then this is a quadrant that people use to measure. Yeah. So this is the marker for the pendulum clock. The most accurate pendulum clocks of their time were based on pendulum technology. Thomas Tompion made two clocks that were fitted into, into these panels here in 1676. A huge weight kept the clocks running for a whole year. This 13 feet, this four meter pendulums were suspended above the movement and swung backwards and forwards in the window above the dial. John, John Flamsteed found the clocks so good, so, so he, he called them correspondence in the heaven that he used them to prove the earth rotated at a constant rate. Okay. Now let's talk about the quadrant by John Berg about 1750. This instrument was similar to the one originally situated in this room. Astronomers used quadrants, quarter circles to de determine time by measuring the height of the sun and certain stars above the horizon. The outer scale was originally engraved into 96 units because it was easier to continuously divide it using a pair of compasses. The astronomers then used it, used tables to convert the readings into degrees. Okay. So this is a side view of the pendulum clock and you see the gears and you see the pendulum down there and then you see the quadrant right there. And then now we're going to look at some navigational tools. So this was a, a, a star chart or something like that. And then mm -hmm. this, is a, this was a compass back then. And then this was a map of Patagonia. Cool. And then this was a picture of someone from that time. Yeah. So this is, I don't know whose picture this is, but this is um someone. So let's talk about the shovel disaster. In, on October 1707, four Royal Navy ships struck the treacherous, treacherous gillstone ledges off the Isles of Sicily. Admiral Sir Chap, Cloudsley shovel and 1,300 of his men died. For fleet without ac ac accurate navigational technique, charts, or instruments, the shovel disaster was an incident waiting to happen. Nevertheless, the nation was shocked. So this is what happens when you don't have proper navigational tools. Oh, yeah. And you see a picture of the shovel disaster right here. Yeah, how terrible. Mm-hmm. Let's talk about timekeepers. This timekeeper was good, but not good enough. To work at sea, a longitude timekeeper needed to be both accurate and portable, but in the early 18th century watches were not at all accurate and clocks were not portable. So that was a problem. Okay, so you could see this was like a ship painting back here of the show. Mm -hmm. yeah. So this was something about pendulum clocks at sea. It's just an exhibit, so yeah. So this is a pendulum clock. You see the pendulum right, right here. And then you see some chimes right here. And then so the pendulum swings back and forth with the weight and then the clock's up. So this is just a globe right here about time around the world. Mm -hmm. So where am I? At sea, navigation is a matter of life or death. Out of, out of sea or land, can you tell where you are? By 1700, skilled seamen could find their position north or south for their latitude, but still lacked accurate instruments 
or methods to calculate their east west position were known as longitude. So that was the, gro the growing international trade. It more became more valuable and vulnerable that cargoes and sh lost shipwrecks were solving this longitude problem urgent for all seagoing nations. This gap, it's okay. So yeah, let's talk about star charts. They were accurate, but not accurate enough. By the early 18th century, mapping and measuring stars was an advanced skill. Cultures around the world developed their own astronomical charts and instruments. None, however, was sufficiently accurate to determine longitude at sea. So this was a telescope. And then you could see, and then you could see um, a clock right here. And then you could see like some spears navigational spheres right there. So these were all celestial globes and these were astronomical models. These were Islamic celestial globes mm. from the Islamic world. Yeah, this is a view. These are more Islamic celestial globes and then these were. This was also a celestial globe that helped navigate. Beautiful. Same for this. And these, these globes are so uh, elaborate, you know, beautiful. Mm -hmm. This was like an illustration on practical navigation or introduction that the whole art to that whole art. Let's talk about the navigator's toolkit for a sec. Right. So the, they had a couple of stuff right here, which is a um, a pair of something, and then a, an astrolab, uh, a comp something, um, a knockdown or something, and then a couple. Of so this was something about the longitude problem. A lot of similar disasters happen like that. The 17th century, many ships were wrecked because of the navigational techniques that were inaccurate. So maritime nations like Britain and France and the Netherlands and Spain so were offered rewards to anyone who discovered a successful way of finding longitude at sea. And back then there were dangerous coasts. So that means a lot of ships could get wrecked back then. So this was a ship from England. So now let's talk about time and longitude. This was a similar disaster that happened. And there were a lot of lost lives but thanks to longitude, not proper long, not proper longitude. So now let's talk about this clock, Harrison's first timekeeper. You could see this is the mechanism it works on in this clip. So this timekeeper took about five years to build in 1736. It was tested on the sea voyage to Lisbon and back in Portugal. Harrison was very seasick, but the timekeeper worked. It was the most ac accurate sea stop, sea clock then. So he, he was able to get a 20,000 pound reward. This is Harrison right here in some of his notes, and yeah. And this is just a book. Okay, John Flamsteed. He was by appointed by King Charles II in sixteen in sixteen seventy five. No, wait. yeah. John Flamsteed was the first astronomer royal. His main task was to improve the ac accuracy of the British star charts. The astronomer royal were part of a world of rational science based on an ex measurement, experiment, and explanation. But in the 18th century, older ideas about magic and astrology still existed, and some people thought these little ideas could be used to find longitude. You can find more about these different ideas behind the doors. You could see another pendulum clock right here called George II. 
And you could see it's made of solid gold and you could see it's how it worked. See the back of the clock and the springs and the gears and everything, the whole mechanism. And you could see the side, which had a lot of stuff. And then that was an L. And you could be used to the op. And, that was, and that's an, that looks like an elevator. Something. And this is Harrison's third timekeeper. So this is another pendulum clock right here. This is George Graham right here. Mm -hmm. And then the Royal Observatory and the, chron and the chronometer. So this is the chron chronometer right here, tells the temperature. Um, yeah. And then you could see some notes right here. Yeah, so this was a map used on on chronometers. So you could see these were some chartered some charts on voyages that were made. Oh, this is Thomas Earnshaw. He was a talented watchmaker and a, also a businessman, but he wasn't as successful as his rival John Arnold. His contribution made to the Development of the marine chronometer was to show that the mechanism could be standardized and produced in large numbers. Okay, this is John Arnold. The longitude act of set, making longitude work, longitude act of 1714 inspired makers to come up with new designs and for timekeepers and observing the tournaments. These were both needed for finding longitude at sea. I don't know who she is. This is okay. Let's talk about Harrison's fourth timekeeper. This was his fourth timekeeper. It was a pretty. It was. It was a small pet. It was a small clock, which finally was accurate and portable. Measuring longitude at sea by the late 18th century, determining longitude was practical tax that could be, it was easier now and could be carried out by any well-trained navigator. The availability of astronomical data, observational instruments and reliable timekeeper data made the lunar distance method a viable technique for accurate navigation. You can see a book right here and then you can see some of their instruments they used. And then you can see notes. And then this was a clock or a timer. Hmm. This was a clock. And then this was used to find the lunar distance. So that was an instrument. Clockmakers devised mechanical models for wealthy patrons interested in astronomy. And after Charles Well, fourth Earl of Ore, free. This instrument shows the tilt of the moon's orbit in relation to the Earth and can be used to demonstrate lunar and solar eclipses. Fascinating. Mm -hmm. Evie, what did you think about all of this? I mean, this is, uh, you're seeing all the instruments, the people, uh, the, uh, you know, the effort that it took to determine time and position on earth and how important all of that was what 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 were your what were your over overall thoughts i mean now you have gps on your telephone and and um yeah so this is all impressive that was it was pretty impressive to see but how time went but Sorry, one second. Okay, sorry about that. Um, time no 
This was the Greenwood Meridian line right here that I'm standing on. All right. So This is my okay. Royal Observatory famous for supplying green with mean time. From 1833, astronomers made a daily signal to mariners from the Thames River at 1 p.m., 1,300 hours by racing and dropping the time ball at the on the Flamsteed House. In 1852, electrical technology enabled them to send time to the nation by by telegraph. Visitors to Greenwick Park to, could also get time without disturbing the astronomers outside the observatory. See, this is the middle, and you can see the coordinates right here of each city. This is the meridian line right here. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. So he's Edmund Holly right here. This is a statue of him. Um, this was in one of the, it was an observing instrument right here. And this is Bradley Transit Room. All right here was the dome right here, the observatory dome. And now I'm going to show you the telescope. So this is the observatory telescope right here, a uh, reflector. It's an e equatorial mount. So you could see some views of it. This is the bottom eye, eye piece in the mechanism. So this was a view of London. This was a view of London. This is the Queen's house. From the observatory. That's all. That's all. Thanks for watching. All right, Navin. Thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. How much longer will you be in India? I'll be here until the 11th of August. Okay. All right. Will you enjoy and uh, thank you again for contributing to Global Star Party. Um, we will not have a uh, Global Star Party next week as we'll be uh, broadcasting live from the Astronomical League Convention, but um, really pleased that you were able to make it uh, to, uh, to this event. Up next is Aditi Gautam. Uh, we're going from India to Nepal. And uh, DT, thank you uh, for um, for patiently waiting for us <laughs> here on Global Star oh, hello, Party, our 100th episode. Hello, Scott. Hello, everyone. Well, did you draw this behind you? Is that, a, is that something that you made? <laughs> yes, yes. I, I made it myself. It. Yeah, I love it. That's great. Uh, so what it's is your... kind of give me the, give me the hope and kind of represent my dream. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. So what is your presentation uh, so, tonight? Uh, today I'm talking about the uh, formation of the star. Okay. And different phases of uh, making the star. Uh, so like, uh, as we know, the star is an astronomical object uh, comprising a luminous sephiroid of plasma held together by its gravity. And the nearest star to Earth is Sun. And many other stars are visible to the naked eyes uh, at night, but the immense distance from the Earth uh, makes uh, them appear as fixed point of light, right? And our star life cycle is determined by its mass, and the larger its mass, the total its uh, life cycle. A star mass is determined by the amount of matter that is available in its nebula, and the giant cloud of gas and dust from uh, which it was born. Over time, the hydrogen gas in the nebula is pulled together by gravity and it's begin uh, to spin. As the gas spin faster, uh, it heats up, become a pro star. Eventually, the temperature reaches a very high degree and nuclear fusions occur in the cloud pores. 
and the cloud begin to glow brightly, contract a little, and become stars. Uh, it is now a main sequence star and will remain in this stage, uh, signing for a millions uh, to billion of years to come. And this is the stage our sun is at right now. In as the main sequence star glows, uh, hydrogen in its core is converted uh, into helium by nuclear fusions. Uh, when the hydrogen supply in the core begin to run out and the star is no longer generating heat by nuclear fusions, the uh, core become unstable and contract. The outer cells of the star, which is uh, still mostly hydrogen, start to expand. And as it expands, it cools uh, and glow rates. Uh, the star has now reached the red giant phase and it is um, red because it is cooler than it was in the main sequence star phase. Uh, star stays and it is designed because the outer cell was in the main sequence star stays uh, and it is designed because uh, like was explained in the core of the red giant helium fuses into carbon all star evolve the same way up to the red giant phase and the amount of uh, mass of a star has determined which of the following lifestyle path it has uh, take from there and a star comes in a variety of masses and mass determines how radiantly the star will shine and how it dies like massive star transform into supernova, neutron star, black holes so with average star like the sun. And in life is a white dwarf uh, surrounded by a separate planetary nebula. And all stars in uh, irrespective of the, their size uh, follow the same seven stage cycles. Uh, they start as a gas cloud and end as a star remnant. And like uh, talking about the giant gas cloud, a star originates from a large cloud of gas and the temperature in the cloud is low enough uh, for the synthesis of molecules. And the Orion cloud complex in the Orion system is an example of a star in this stage of life. And talking about the second phase, uh, that is a protostar, uh, when the gas particles in the molecular cloud run into each other, heat energy is produced, and the result in the formation of a warm clump of molecules uh, refer as to the to as a protostar, and the creation of protostars can be seen uh, through infrared visions is the protostars are warmer than other materials in the molecular clouds. And several protostars can be formed in one cloud depending on the size of the molecular clouds. In talking about the T tower phase, that is the T tower star begin when materials stop falling into the protostar and release tremendous amount of energy. And the mean temperature of the tower star isn't enough to support a nuclear fusion and as it's good. And uh, there's another phase that is a main sequence, and uh, was, which was, I was talking about. And the main sequence phase in this stage is the development uh, where the core temperature reaches uh, the point for the fusion to commence. Uh, in this process, the proton of hydrogens uh, are converted into atoms of helium. And the re reaction is exothermic, and it gives uh, of more heat than it requires. And so the core of the main sequence start to release a tremendous amount of energy. And talking about the red giant, uh, red giant is another phase of the formation of the star. And the star converts the hydrogen uh, atom into the helium over its course of its all life its course. Eventually, the hydrogen uh, fuel drain out, uh, run out, and the internal reaction stops. And without the reaction occurring at the core, a uh, star contract uh, inward through a gravity and causing it to the expand. As it expands, uh, the star first becomes a sub giant star and the, then a red giant. And red giant have cooler surface than the main sequence star, and because of this, uh, they appear red than yellow. And uh, talking about the fusions of heavier elements, uh, helium molecules fuses at, at the core, and as the star expands, and the energy of this reaction uh, prevent the core from collapse, collapsing, and the core shrink and begin fusing carbon, fusing carbons. And once the helium fusions are uh, in, and this uh, process repeats until the iron appears at the core. And the iron fusion's reaction absorbs energy, which causes the core to collapse. And the explosion uh, transforms massive star into a supernova, while smaller star like the sun contract into white drop. And as we know, our uh, sun is uh, predicted to be uh, white drops uh, very soon, uh, but not now. Like, and talking about the supernova and planetary nebula, now uh, most of the star materials is blasted away in this space. But the core implodes into a neutron star or a singularity known as the black holes and less massive stars don't explode, their cores contract instead, in, instead into a tiny hot star known as the white drop. And while the outer material um, drift away, star 
tainted the sun, did not enough mass to burn with anything, uh, but a red glow during the main sequence, and these red dots are difficult to spot. And but uh, this may be most common star that can be that can burn for trillions of years. And the above uh, where the fire seven main stages, which are talking about of life cycles, whether big or small or young or old, star one of the beautiful and lyrical objects in all the creation. And next time you look up at the star, remember this: how they were created and how they will die. And uh, today is the twentieth July uh, in Nepal in here, and it's uh, International Moon Day. And uh, uh, personally, uh, Moon is my favorite part of uh, like in you know, interest. Uh, so I have prepared some video. Okay, I would like to okay. show that. Uh, are you able to see? Nice. You can see the moon. Yeah. Okay. So is uh today is the um International Moon Day. Uh, it's twenty July already here, and it's morning time here. And uh, I've made some video of the collection of moon I captured. Very nice. Uh, personally, I like love to capture the moment uh, where I was facing to the moon and uh, uh, take that uh, candid photos and I love that a lot. I like that shot. <laughs> These are real good. And uh, like uh, whenever the uh, weather is uh, bad or something else, but uh, rather I will take my telescope out and just capture the moment with my telescope and looking to the star or just, uh, I love to capture those uh, kind of photos. Uh, like um, whenever I feel uh, like um, it gives me different kind of motivations and it's really, it's really need to motivate ourselves uh, like to be in our dreams and because uh, there's a long way to go, and mm -hmm. not only uh, so uh, this kind of photos uh, makes me feel. And personally, uh, Moon is a favorite to capture it all with my telescope. Uh, so today's a special day. Uh, it's the uh, International Moon Day. So happy International Moon Day to you all. And you. okay, it's it's been 19 July there, but uh, <laughs> um, but I was earlier, uh, because it's already uh, 20 July and morning 10 a.m. here. And yes. uh, just I look back, uh, Scott, and uh, I I realized that uh, I joined the Global Star Party in like uh, it sixteenth Global Star Party. The sixteenth Global Star Party. Yeah, right? I I, I remember I found you on Facebook and you were talking yeah. about some something to do with astronomy and uh, uh, it inspired me to reach out and uh, see if you'd like to present on Global Star Party and. Uh, this uh, just yesterday, okay. Just yesterday, I was looking uh, at the first uh, global star party, the poster of post global star party, and I have uh, keep it uh, very securely. And uh, when I see this, oh, 16 global star party, and uh, tomorrow I'm uh, like, I'm uh, taking 100 global star party. <laughs> wow. And uh, uh, like, I was joining this from the beginning, and it was very good to join with you all, uh, like uh, with you, Adrian, and many more Max players and Cesar Brolo, and um, uh, for motivating me. And also, that I also remember Livy the start, and she was Levy, a really new yeah. person, uh, like, yeah, Livy. And uh, like, I think she's busy this day in her academic or, or anything else. Uh, but um, uh, sometimes uh, I used to talk with her, and I see her post in Facebook too. Like she's doing progress and she's doing good, right. and uh, like uh, realizing everything. Uh, global Star Party has given a lots of things. Uh, like after joining the Global Star Party, like life has been drastically changed, and the way of people perspective looking at us and like are uh, coming with us and saying that like, they have given the uh, Global Star Party so more the identity. Uh, to us uh, through the astronomy and it's feel like I uh, like to give the uh, presentation and it looks great and mm -hmm. let's give this some weightage in the profile too and somewhere uh, group study mainly means to be learning a new things and I have learned a lot of things like um, I was just starting uh, when uh, I joined the global party but uh, I have come 
a lot of way and a lot a lot of things so thanks for everything uh, Thank you. For now and uh, we'll be we'll be joining a lot of global party and uh, eagerly waiting to learn more things yeah we'll be doing all. more dt thank you thank you so much thank you Scott. For, and I, I again i really love your illustration behind you it's really great so thank you you should write you should write a book um uh, a book for young people on how to observe the stars i think that you can for do sure a nice job. I, I was planning for that uh, so i would do this great okay well thank yeah. you so much and you have a good day Take care. Uh, same to you. Bye Good bye. night for you. Yeah, bye-bye. Okay. Uh, so we've had, uh, you know, an incredible um, lineup of speakers today. Uh, a, a couple of them had to drop out, but um, uh, which is okay. We, we've been broadcasting now for over eight hours. Um, but uh, so far, we've had David Levy come on again. David Eicher from Astronomy Magazine. Molly Wakeling with an incredible presentation on the James West Space Telescope. Uh, Daniel Higgins and Simon Lewis, um, astrophotographers from Master World TV. Uh, Jason Gonzel showing us how you can use uh, the data from uh, the MAST um, archive and, uh, uh, you know, to access, directly access James West, James Webb Space Telescope data that probably goes up as soon as they download it. <laughs> it's just really fresh data that you can get get uh, direct access to. Daniel Barth um, from How Do You Know program, uh, you know, educator in science um, here in uh, in Arkansas. Uh, Connell Richards uh, was on. John Briggs uh, sharing uh, his uh, images uh, from. Uh, Magdalena, uh, New Mexico, really dark skies. Cesar Brolo was with us. Naveen Santel Kumar uh, uh, joined us from India. And uh, um, of course, Deep T. Gautam in Nepal. And now we are to Adrian Bradley, uh, who will end the 100th Global Star Party with this incredible nightscape images. Adrian, you've got it all. Thank you for. Well Scott, you saw fine. I put my face into a global star party since it began yesterday at 3.30, <laughs> right after coming from an outreach event. So yeah, I, I was able to get the day off, and today has generally been, I immersed myself in doing the work of amateur astronomy. Yeah, um, that's awesome. That's it's, awesome. Yeah, it, it feels good, which is why the first image that I'm going to share <clears throat> is not so much of a nightscape. It's Girl Scouts. Now, there was a clause that a lot of the Girl Scouts could not be photographed, but I had permission to photograph some of the scout leaders here. Sure. And uh, so I wanted at least one image of them looking through the, uh, the Coronado there. The reason there's two power um, power things is because one of them was actually out, but I had the other one handy. And the tracking on this this mount, Scott, you might recognize that mount. Yes, I recognize that mount. It, uh, I recognize to Adrian. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And it it played a huge part in being able to show all of the Girl Scouts. There were five different troops of about 20 or so uh, Girl Scouts, and they were all able to see the sun. Once I was able to put the sun into the scope, it tracked very well. I used a compass on my Apple Watch to aim the um, scope north, and with only minor corrections for declination, um, it tracked very well, and all the girls got to look through Awesome. And see the um, see the sun through the scope. So it was a uh, wonderful time. I also was able to use images that I had taken as a form of outreach. So questions about the Milky Way came up. Questions about um, the planets. Questions about stars. Um, all sorts of things that the 
girls asked. And I was able to use images to help answer those questions. I had my camera set up there as well. And so it was a, so it was a wonderful day. Um, I did take a picture of the sun and you can see how active it was in the, uh, in that uh, hydrogen alpha scope. Yep. You saw oh, a yeah. little more detail. There was a prominence about here on the sun that was very visible. I didn't uh, hook, I haven't hooked it up, the camera up to that uh, H alpha scope that's on the to-do list. Well, at the same time, the moon was also out. So some of the girls got to see the moon through, I had a spotting scope out there and I also took a picture of that. So here we are at last quarter in a cloudy sky and I took this picture. Some of the girls got to see the moon, although it was a little fainter than this, um, but I was able to track it um, using the other. I, have an, I had another little tracker and a small spotting scope. And so for a while, there were two objects we were able to look at. So, so it was a wonderful time. It was worth it. One of the pictures I shared was this image of the distant aurora that I know I've shared here. Oh yeah. Global Star Party in the past, this beautiful pillars and some of the colors that I think we talked about on Global Star Party, um, Terry Mann, way back in the first, uh, the, the first uh, half of yeah. the nice Global Star Party showed us beautiful Aurora images from where she is. Well, sometimes if you're stuck in Michigan or you're stuck somewhere uh -huh. where you can't quite get all the way to Alaska, but the Aurora Borealis is still big enough to image, even if from a distance. So, so you don't have to miss out, even if uh, space might uh, different different parts of the globe bring their different um, bring different beauty, different perspectives, that's different for perspectives. Sure. So, yeah. so this was the image that I was uh, fortunate enough to be awarded a first place uh, finish in the light pollution, which I think we need more, it needed more entries. I was one, and I'm disclosing this, I was one of five entries for this category. Uh -huh. And um, now I didn't hear the full explanation, but you can see a couple different types of light pollution. You can see it caught by these thin clouds here, mm -hmm. and you can see the difference in the colors. And so you can see above this, you can see a part of the Milky Way below it, you see a couple stars here, but that's it. And all of the detail in the Milky Way gets washed out. I'm not sure what this was, but I had chalked it up to an artifact. Looks like a sprite, but um, you know, it, it could have been a sprite. But it's that would I would be very surprised if if I got lucky enough to catch a sprite and that could explain that could explain why this image won because that is a very rare thing to catch indeed but it's I wonder if it's also just an artifact so so it looking at the image a couple weeks later there are still some things that um you know that are that are interesting in the image and as I was saying before I think more more images that leave light pollution in have a chance to be used um, not just to make a pretty picture but to describe what the effects of light pollution are and i think that's why there are a few contests that are looking that have started a light pollution category for these nightscape images so so it isn't um you know 100 global star party and I've been able to take the images I've been able to capture. And thanks to you, Scott, and everyone that's been a part of it, I've given these talks online and even in person for mm -hmm. a few of my uh, the astronomy groups that I'm a part of. And sure. more talks are planned. My own uh, the Sarnia Center has me planned for October after I come back from Okie Tech. So, um, so you've put me into the high A ball class of, uh, 
you know, traveling you and doing there. presentations. <laughs> yeah, you, you don't get to the majors until you're doing things. You know, and the likes of uh, John Briggs is still here. Um, Daniel H- Daniel Higgins started his um, work. I would say that he's gotten up to about double A ball. Um, he's doing really good work. You know, that if you liken it to baseball. Um, you know, any, and that, that just goes to show you that anyone who dares, you know, take pictures of the night sky or your love of the night sky can be rewarded, um, immensely in astronomy, no matter whether you're a visual astronomer or you like to do images, the community is absolutely outstanding. Hmm. And, um, even if you haven't had sleep, you just, it, it fills you up. This picture, by the way, that you keep seeing, um, and I have it as a background because in the winter, it's my favorite place to image. Um, and you can see older image there. Now this image I used um, with the Girl Scouts. And I said, I've zoomed it all the way in here and on my phone. And I said, see if you can find a butterfly See if you can find a cat's paw. And when we pointed it out, they go, oh, yeah, that's what it looks like. That's what it looks like. Yeah. It's like it does look kind of like a cat's paw. It's like that they most of them instantly pointed out the butterfly cluster over here. And um, to me, that was the ability to use an image of mine and make it kind of a see if you can find this or that on my iPhone was um, I would call it kind of a a testament to what I try to achieve. Um, Taking a runner up in the RASC general landscape astrophotography category means that this composite, which I would say I could have done a little better job of putting the ground together, but the detail that I got in the Milky Way is what they said won or got me up to that round that uh, runners up uh, mode. And the winner was a beautiful Milky Way over a mountainous region, which most of the time that always wins. <laughs> it's uh, <laughs> you, if you're in a beautiful location, as long as you have any kind of detail at all in the Milky Way, you will have a beautiful picture. But I've always been a proponent of detail as opposed to taking images. And you you can take your images, you can post them online. I post mine and um, see how many likes you get, see how many people enjoy seeing the images. But more and more, like I told uh, Dr. Daniel Barth, um, the feeling of actually taking the images and doing outreach with them surpasses the whole internet likes and you know, notoriety Absolutely. and that that really it humbles me and it grounds me which is why yeah. instead of being upset or you know thinking well if i'd have made this cleaner i would have won first place right no they this is what they liked and this is what i like um yeah. Yeah, Adrian. I mean, when I when I think of uh, uh, George Ellery Hale, uh, he understood that uh, astrophotography was what was going to keep uh, funding going and interest going to build big observatories. And so he hired a guy named Pease, uh, who was uh, an expert on the moon and Pease used the hundred inch telescope to photograph the moon with, you know, and so those photographs appeared and uh, were able to be reproduced in uh, newspapers and and that type of thing and and you know this is going back to the 1920s so uh you know astrophotography had come a long ways but still was done on glass plates you know it was a mm-hmm. laborious process still and um yeah and, I know that. Uh, he, he he knew it was overkill to kind of use a hundred inch telescope to photograph the moon with, but but he was right. he was trying to uh, uh, get uh, you know uh, interest and 
you know, in, in his observatories. He was trying to get the 200 inch built. Actually, he had started working, I think, on a 300 inch telescope. There's a model of it at the, at the uh, Mount Wilson yeah. Observatory, but I think they finally settled on a 200 inch at the time. Yeah. 300 was just too much. But uh, yeah. what you're doing with um, your photography and outreach is a, uh, is a, a tradition that goes back quite a ways now. So that's uh, it's good to know because interestingly enough, really just really quickly, I've had people that wanted me to take pay, you know photos for graduation and for other events based on seeing astrophoto work, yeah. and um, I find it interesting because it, you know it's a little different. They're different animals, but it's given me the opportunity to take people pictures, which. Um, before it, I did that the night before, um, and a lot of them would see the portfolio of images like this. I and mean, we were talking about shooting at the moon, and this was the first time I was able to get the Earth shine data, making this look almost like there's a full moon with a bright limb on it, as opposed to just a crescent moon here. But um, but yeah, you the point that you bring up you know sits with me and it says images are more than just a you know a sign of well the photographer must be so great they pulled off the wonderful image and it's something that i've struggled with and global star party helps me realize well there's more your images can do more than just look pretty and you know draw in response um they can inspire others to want to take these types of images and to want to try them for themselves. So, so real briefly, this place here and this when when there's smoke in the atmosphere, as I think there was a threat that that may have happened again, there were some wildfires. But when they really ran out of control the year before, or mm. I think this may have been 2020, I would have to look. But imaging the Milky Way became tough. And yes. um, so it's like you, sometimes you don't even take your skies for granted. Um, another thing, photographers tend to look at little things like these power lines that are going along. And, you know, they would say the power lines, take them out in Photoshop or something like that. To me, this was just, this is what it looks like where I was standing, our observing hill for one of my astronomy groups, lowbrow astronomers, is right behind us up a winding road. I saw this, it looked pretty clear, put the camera to it for 30 seconds and produced this single image and have no problems at all using it to show the effects of light pollution this is a rural town you can get pretty a pretty good image but you see what happens just like the other image that i had submitted for rask this image shows the same thing there's a lot more data that could be here but all of that light and i left it in all of that light pollution just takes out this much more of the Milky Way that could be seen had this had this been a darker site or had there not been the light pollution. So so it gets to where it's an honor to be able to just share images. This is this rough image is where it all started. I happened to catch this bright meteor and that image made a calendar at my job. But oh, more cool. importantly my decision to leave light pollution in came with that image. And um, ever since, even if I've worked on processing techniques, you just you saw that one image that had a whole bunch of detail. It was at this same park that I took that other image. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, this is Jupiter here, Saturn somewhere over here. So a few years ago, um, but this is where I began learning how to process better images. And that's where I started leaving light pollution in. So 
I had been I had been told how to take light pollution out and you know clean up the image, but the decision to leave it in led to the ability to show what's really out there, and that became my purpose. The images are a reflection of what I see in the night sky, and it's what I want to share with others. So, you know, processing gets a little bit better. Look how clear the stars are a little better, but you, you know, the, the following year when Jupiter and Saturn were here, heading for the conjunction. And so now let's move real quickly through these. This image was an older image before that meteor one. Um, the meteor image let me know that you could catch lightning in a bottle. My attempts, my feeble attempts, we've seen so many great planetary images um, on Global Star Party. And this little image was my attempt through, a t through my 11-inch uh, telescope, my attempt to capture a little bit of history for myself. And what I did capture was Jupiter's fifth Galilean moon, as it was referred to. And I don't know, Scott, if you remember the license plate of that star, but um, <laughs> there was the one day when that star was in line visually with Jupiter's moons. Uh-huh. And um, this would have been around the, um, well, I think it was either 20, I think it was 2021. This, it was December 2021 or December 2020, I forget. But um, yeah, I've actually done around 50 global star parties because I, in one of my folders where I look it up, um, I would take the global star parties and I would just name them based on the number. And I've got a global star party folder that shows GSP 45. And I know I didn't, they're not all sequential. I missed a few, but um, the one that I have 97, that was actually the 98th global star party. Oh, okay. And, and, uh, right. Yeah, and the 99th one, I kind of winged it, so there's no folder. <clears throat> <laughs> and so, so here, now we fast forward. You I can, love this one. I yeah, do. this <clears throat> Sky Glow. Yeah. A lot of Sky Glow. Just like, uh, again, Terry Mann saw Sky Glow and saw how beautiful it was. This is in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, and the lighting here is an oncoming car behind me. So after mm -hmm. taking this photo, I made sure to hightail it off of that road. So, um, so real quickly, and, and, you know, Scott, I love sharing these. Um, it, there's a memory behind each one. Sure. David said he really loved the way that this photo was was set up, and although I've taken some slightly clearer pictures of Orion in the past. I was moved by David's words when he, when he sees this picture and it just encouraged me to keep right on doing <clears throat> the type of landscape astrophotography that I do. Now I'm hoping to improve on this image when I get to Okitex and I should see a very similar site because I think when we're going to be there, the, um, Zodiacal light will be present and this part of the Milky Way when Orion rises in the morning. Mm -hmm. um, my plan is to um, do at least one all nighter so I can watch the sky roll ahead, of, roll behind um, me. That would be cool. It'd be neat, and neat to take, see some movies or time lapse stuff. Yeah. Oh, and oh. I do want to yep. do a couple of time lapses. I've, yep. I've been encouraged to do a couple. I'd love to do a shot like this at Okitex where the skies are even darker. See how long I can get a Milky Way shot with this nautical and then civil dawn approaching. Mm -hmm. And um, similar to Jason Quinzel's image, he was able to get, you know, <clears throat> in Hawaii, um, he had such a detailed core of the Milky Way and, you know, he was able to get both bulges. 
um, <clears throat> both sides of the bulge mm -hmm. and the sun was rising. I think he was, I would say he was probably nearing civil dawn and could still see all of that data. So I'm looking forward to taking an image like that as well. Um, <clears throat> this image, <clears throat> sorry about that. I probably should have muted, but um, this image um, is proof that if you just aim north, if you're far enough north to see the northern lights, aim north and see what you'll get. All I was doing was deciding that, okay, it's time to view the Big Dipper. I at least want the big and the little dipper in a photo. And when I looked at it, I realized I had other colors in here. And I this was with one of my cameras and I took the same picture with the unmodded camera to make sure it wasn't just picking up other sky glow. And we looked at it and said, nope, that is Aurora. So the other neat thing is this eagle, which yeah, it's beautiful. I, I was going to use a different bird image to close it out, but the eagle snuck in. Um, oh, he snuck in. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I would have to, what I'll do is I'll just keep going here, but um, let's, we'll go with the slanted Milky Way shots that tended to be my, uh, something that I kept working on. Um, I ended up getting light from M51 in that other photo. And it, mm -hmm. it's amazing to see light from galaxies that far away with a 16 millimeter lens. Sure. And um, so the evolution of the slanted photos We'll, we'll start going, we'll go through that. That was also at a Bortle 2 site. This was at a Bortle 3 slash 4 site. And a lot of Milky Way photos are done, even shooting the other side. And this was an honor, Scott, when mm. Marcello chose one of my images to be the headline. Here's one kind of a cooler version up oh, a yeah, cool lesson very nice the of That's that so image yeah that a was bouquet, an honor a celestial bouquet it's beautiful. yes and so here's this one's a subtle image i wanted to shoot the milky way here and have it come up here in the dark with the uh, waterfall notice it's winter so pretty harsh conditions well, this started to happen when I got right to the spot that I wanted to start shooting and the light changed on me all because I chose to take this shot early as I was traveling. I was 30 minutes away from that site. I got out and I looked around and I was floored by um, what I was seeing. Um, I talked about this, the Barnard's E and the coat hanger are two op two objects that I like to see if I got whenever I do a Milky Way, sure. just to see that do I what kind of precision I actually have. Um, so let's we're getting close to the end of my presentation. We were just showing. I tend to shoot the galactic center and the northern part of the bulge a lot at that angle between April, May, and June. I also, this is the first time I saw the zodiacal light. This yeah. was the spring right. before I went to Okitex where it went the other way. And I noticed that Orion, Taurus, Pleiades, always somewhere, Orion is always somewhere near the zodiacal light, which, well, it makes sense because that's where the ecliptic is. So then, the uh, the angles don't stop. This is a most recent picture, and you may recognize it if you are in the RASC and you saw the talk that I gave for Kareem and the Montreal uh, Center on sleepless summer nights. This was a night. This I imaged this, and later on, I would image this that next that that morning 
no sleep. I was down there earlier imaging that other <laughs> image. Yep. And then the I was up there the up the Beautiful. sun is about to rise. Yeah. And I imaged the planets. There's Mercury. And I, I highlighted them because it was very hard to see. Yeah. But yep, I got them all. And even Saturn over here, and even Fomaloe was bright enough. So this is what I was looking at after a few hours after taking that image. And so that leaves me with the final once again. Now the precision isn't as good, but the goal was to get the light of the full moon and the Milky Way in the same shot. And um, that was more or less accomplished. Later, I was told that there is a beautiful spot along another part of the beach. So last shot I took that evening and I left the moon as just a bright glowing orb. This would be it would be a good place to take a sunrise shot and it would look very similar except you can see kind of the out of focus stars in the sky because I focused on the rocks. Every once in a while, I will do. I like that foreground oh, shot. That's nice. Yep. Yeah, every once in a while, I will take a picture photo that I know is a pretty photo, but it all has to do with, um, let's see what else I have. These are, yeah, there were a couple of others. I, I don't mind showing this one because my goal was how much Milky Way could I get as the moon's rising? Mm -hmm. And this was a little bit cleaner image. And you can see the Milky Way is just disappearing. You can still see some stars here, the glow of the moon. This was more of the, I'll call it the scientific discovery mm. image where you've got the bright moon coming up. And I think, yeah, I wanted to share that. That was my, that's my best composite image of what the moon looks like to the mm. naked eye mm. over as it's rising over the lake. So really like that one. And um, so this is, I'll end with an on the wing of a great blue heron in shadow. And Nice. This is may be considered a good image. You can't always see what's there. I think this is a good analogy for where we've come. Amateur astronomers learning new techniques to see more of what's there, where we've come from Hubble to now James Webb. Um, we start out seeing this and knowing we know it's a heron we know the shape and we know that's a tree but with a little bit better instrumentation you actually see more detail of the heron and the tree now if we if i acquire the data better then then it, then it gets even better than that but um I use those two pictures just to illustrate that this is what astro imaging, what uh, imaging, what science imaging, what all of the things that we do in science are to get at more detail about what's really going on with the objects that we see. And, um, you know, that's got, I'd like to say it's been a wonderful long day of the 100th <laughs> Global Star Party. Those that are still hanging on, thank you all. Yeah, thank you. Out. And uh, yeah. listening in. And um, right. I think that's going to do it, Scott. It's probably time mm -hmm. to <laughs> pack time it to up. Say good night, everyone. Yeah. Uh, Caesar, Daniel, John, I think you're all still. Uh, behind the screen here. So uh, we'll say uh, good night to our audience. Uh, we had a great audience tonight. Um, again, a worldwide audience. And uh, uh, I see Kareem is actually uh, chatting with people uh, in our audience here. 
Uh, I want to thank everyone for tuning in to the 100th Global Star Party. Um, uh, next week, we will be in, Albuquer we'll be in Albuquerque, New Mexico, uh, and doing uh, live interviews with people from the Astronomical League at Alcon. So it's their first time to get back together in years uh, due to the pandemic uh, situation. And um, so I'm really looking forward to that. And um, uh, we'll be back, of course, with more Global Star Parties after after uh, a couple of weeks off. So, but uh, we, um, we want to thank you again. And uh, like uh, our good friend, uh, Jack Horkheimer always used to say, uh, keep looking up and thanks again. Good night, everyone. Hello, everyone. I would like to congratulate Scott Roberts and all the other participants of the Global Star Party on this 300th Global Star Party. I think this is a wonderful achievement and may the next 100 be just as impressive as the first 100 has been. As William Blake, Blake wrote, to see the world in a grain of sand and a heaven in a wildflower, hold infinity in the palm of your hand and eternity in an hour. Thank <laughs> you.